Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see, what if Naruto had the power of Shinigami's bloodline and the Dark Demigod. Here is short summary. Uzumaki Namikaze Kashina is the Shinigami. Naruto is granted a new bloodline and power over darkness to protect himself from Konoha and others who want to harm him full summary is inside prologue tags, powerful, dark, intelligent, and demigod Naruto. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. Prologue in the outskirts of Konohagakure, the village hidden in the leaves. Shiki Fujin. Dead demon consuming seal. After saying their final goodbyes to their son, Minato completed the technique to finally seal the Kaiubi into Naruto. After the successful sealing, Minato allowed himself to be pulled into the Shinigami, Death God's stomach. What he did not expect was his wife getting pulled along as well. It was only Minato, Kashina, and Naruto who were inside the barrier. Those who were outside could not see what was happening. Serutobi Hiruzen, however, knew that his successor performed the Kinjutsu, forbidden technique, to finally stop the nine-tailed demon fox from rampaging. Nobody from the outside knew what exactly happened to the four Hokage's wife. The doctors could only assume that she died from the stress of having the Kaiubi, nine tails, extracted from her just moments after giving birth. Inside Naruto's mindscape, his cries echoed throughout its vast and empty tunnels. A tall woman with orange hair wearing a kimono materialized and walked towards the crying infant. This woman happened to have nine orange tails protruding from her back. The child almost immediately ceased its cries as the woman picked him up and felt her warmth. The nine tails jolted and assumed a protective stance as it sensed another presence inside the mindscape. A powerful entity, something that should not be there. Karama. It called. The woman now known as Karama was quiet for a moment before realization appeared on her face. Shinigami-sama. She inquired. Yes, it is I, the entity responded as it came closer, its face becoming visible. The nine tails could only gasp in surprise as the Shinigami bore her former host's entire appearance. Kashina. The nine-tailed woman trailed off. Forgive me, I did not mean to do any of this. The death god, or the now death goddess, raised a hand. Hush, now. It is all right. I knew that you were not yourself as you were under someone else's control. Tonight's events was caused by a single person. A man, who was supposed to have crossed the other world years ago. I will be preparing a special place for him in my realm. Those who mess around with great demons and forces like you tailed beasts do not go unpunished. Add in the fact that my family was among the victims of his work. Karama nodded and offered her former host to carry the child. Naruto, upon sensing his biological mother's presence, seemed to squirm in delight, snuggling into her warm embrace. His breathing peaceful as sleep claimed him. Kashina shed some tears as she watched her son in her arms. Now that she was the death goddess, her powers allowed her to see her son's future. She did not like what she saw and realized that being the Kyubi's container will not be easy for Naruto, compared to her time as its host. She was contemplative for some time before she had the babe's forehead and murmured words that were not spoken in the land of the living. The child's tiny body became covered by a gray transparent aura as her s touched his skin. It lingered for a few moments and then slowly dissipated. Kashina handed her son to the nine-tailed demoness before giving her parting words. Karama. I bestowed upon my son a new dojutsu, eye technique, and abilities over darkness. Powers that he will awaken when he becomes six of age. As you may have noticed, I have altered your seal thus allowing you free movement. There will be times where you may take over Naruto's body when he is in danger. I have seen the future and saw how Konoha and its residents will be treating him. I could not express the proper words for it for they are absurd. Kashina's face had a look of disgust. Simply unimaginable. Take care of my son, will you? The Kaiubi nodded as the Shinigami's presence left the mindscape, gently rocking the babe as he stirred on his sleep. Sleep well, Naruto. For now, I will be your mother until you are ready to meet her. End of prologue Serutobi Hiruzen anxiously watched as the barrier slowly crumbled away. With several squads of Anbu beside him, they rushed to the spot where Minato and Kashina's bodies were. As he got closer, he saw the child, recalling that his parents wanted to name him Naruto. He was in a deep sleep snuggled between his parents' now cooling embrace. 
The sand dame mourned tonight's losses as he picked up the newly orphaned babe. The boy had blonde spiky hair like his father did, Hirazan noticed. He probably has blue eyes as him. He thought as the infant kept its eyes closed. Aside from the seal that was beginning to fade on the child's stomach, something worth noting about him were the three whisker-like marks on his cheeks. With a commanding tone but soft enough to not wake the child, the Sandame Hokage faced his subordinates. The information regarding that masked man will remain a secret while we undergo investigation. Should word about him comes out, the village will most likely end up in civil strife. And that is something we could no afford to face right now, he finished gravely. Understood, Sandame Sama. The Anbu replied. Satisfied, Hirazan nodded. In the meantime, proceed to the other sections of the village and do a sweep. Pull out bodies, put out fires. Do what you must. I will be meeting with the council, as I am sure they will be now demanding of. A few hours after what they would call the Kayubi's defeat, the clan heads, among with the civilian representatives, the elders, and the Hokage's advisors gathered in a room untouched by the rampage. They were talking amongst themselves and were eyeing the small bundle on the Hokage's arms. I thank you all for coming on short notice. Hirazan started. As we all know, the Kayubi have attacked earlier this evening and destroyed a good portion of the village, killing thousands of people, among them were the Yandaimi Hokage and his wife. He paused as he took a glance at Naruto. The Yandaimi's final wish was for this child to be seen as a hero who defeated the Kayubi. The Yandaimi used a seal, to be more specific, he used the Shiki Fujin to seal the nine-tailed demon inside this child. Naruto here is. Kill that thing. It only took one civilian representative to establish chaos inside the room. There was an uproar as a majority wanted the child dead while the others were screaming for silence, upset that they dared interrupt the Sandame. It was at this point where Naruto woke up crying, having felt the killing intent directed towards him. The Kayubi had to pull his consciousness into his mindscape in order to block sensing what was happening in the outside. Naruto ceased crying upon feeling Kurama's unhostile presence. Anbu stood protectively around their aged leader, weapons out, as two foolish council members openly made an attempt to attack the boy. Hirazan looked on with barely hidden contempt at their lifeless bodies before attempting to regain everyone's attention. Stand down. This is a formal meeting and as such, you must remember your positions and act with proper decorum. Get back to your seats. Inside Naruto, the Kayubi was seething. Foolish old monkey. Why did you have to inform them about Naruto's Jinchuriki status? Kashina's was kept a secret. So why? Minato's last wish will be fulfilled had you worded your thoughts differently. Now Konoha will see the boy as nothing but my reincarnation. Having lived for hundreds of years, Kurama knew that humans were the most intelligent beings among the creations of Kami, God. But while they were clever, they were also the most selfish and narrow-minded, especially when they put their minds into something. Hokage-sama. Ignoring the two corpses being removed from the room, another brave civilian began. You must understand, that thing is a threat. He must be killed before he grows up and kills us all. Silence. Hirazan snapped. This thing, as you call it, is just human like everyone else like in this room. Now, seeing as you are a civilian, I will make you understand. The Hokage continued in a condescending manner as he took out a scroll from one of his robe's inner pockets. This, is a storage scroll. He then laid it on the table and formed a hand seal. There was a puff of smoke and when it cleared, there was now a kanai on top of it. The weapon was inside and while in there, the scroll was still a scroll. It is pretty simple. I hope everyone here understands that Naruto is not the Kayubi but a person acting as the storage scroll. Unfortunately, while some understood, majority of them would still show their displeasure on the child. He will not be their hero. Naruto will be their scapegoat. The Hokage, unimpressed with their expressions, made a decision. This is a direct order from me. From now on, no one is to speak about the Kayubi or anything related to it. You will not tell your children, nor your children's children. Anyone caught disobeying this command shall be punished. I do hope that you understand the severity of this case. The village hidden among the leaves was still recuperating as its inhabitants mourned the deceased. Konoha lost about 30,000 lives during that horrible night, with around 10,000 shinobi as casualties. Those who have retired had no choice but to re-enlist to the active forces due to their low numbers. The Hokage had to recall everyone sent on missions in order to guard the place in case of an invasion. In the Hokage Tower, 
Sarutobi Hirazan was signing papers while Naruto slept in a crib beside him. During the past month, a total of 36 assassination attempts have already occurred and thwarted by the Hokage and the Anbu assigned to protect the boy. Majority of those who tried were under the influence. Somehow, news about Naruto's Jinchuriki status spread to the village like wildfire, despite his orders. Those responsible for the assassination attempts were dumped to the prison cells. The ones who were not drunk were executed. However, people have caught up and drank a bit of alcohol so they could reason they were drunk when investigated. Hiruzen could not simply order for their deaths now as it would cause civil unrest and attract enemy nations attention. He understood their grief, but they were being unreasonable. He too lost loved ones during that night. Hating the boy would do nothing good to him as Naruto was simply a victim like them. As of now, Hiruzen was having trouble looking for a caretaker for the boy. Naruto was still an infant and required nourishment. Problem was, he could not find a willing wet nurse as they were either too afraid of him or they wanted him dead. There had been a willing volunteer to take care of him. A woman who gave birth to a child that very same night. The babe died due to exposure with the Kyubi's potent chakra and killing intent. The woman happily accepted Naruto as her own child and took care of him. Only to find out later that she was sick and dying, due to complications and stress when she gave birth. She died three weeks after. The milk supply she produced for Naruto was enough for two weeks. With her gone, the boy only had a week's worth of nourishment left. Hiruzen intended on informing Konoha of Naruto's parentage. But now, seeing that nearly everyone despised the boy and saw him as the fox's incarnate, his life would have been in greater danger if he did. How would he be able to protect him from potential assassins or kidnappers from other villagers when Konoha also wanted him dead? If he announced that Naruto was Minato's son, Iwagakir would no doubt do everything to kill the boy, while Kumogakir's likely to try to kidnap him. After mulling things over, the third decided to keep Naruto's lineage a secret. Inside Naruto's mindscape, Kurama was pacing in a room while the child slept in his crib. With her seal being altered, she had the power to change the mindscape's scenery and likened it to the Namikaze mansion's image. After the first assassination attempt, she began practicing on manifesting a body in the outside world in order to protect the boy. She was able to hear Serutobi's plan of sending Naruto to the orphanage after two months. This troubled Kurama as she knew that people in the orphanage would not treat the boy fairly. She could already see them neglecting the infant and underfeeding him. It was at this moment where the Shinigami reappeared and informed her that she would be sending help while Kurama perfected manifesting a body. Kashina would send someone back from the dead and make her pose as one of the caretakers in the orphanage until Naruto becomes six and learns the truth about him and his family. A small whiskered boy with blonde hair and crystal blue eyes could be seen walking by Konoha's market district. Everyone who saw him did not hide their glares. Some even threw him insults, calling him a demon and a murderer. Uzumaki Naruto was used to this. Although he did not understand why people hated him, something from his mind told him to ignore the villagers and their glares. Naruto only had five people whom he called family. One was the old man, who happened to be the leader of the village he lived in. The other two were a father and daughter who owned a ramen shop. Ichiraku's was the only restaurant that served him food and treated him like a normal person. His fourth precious person was a young woman named Mai. She was one of the orphanage's caretakers. Mai had been taking care of him ever since he was a baby. What Naruto did not know, she was sent by his biological mother to look after him. His fifth and most precious person was his mother, Kurama. His mother had taught him to read and write, and was always there to comfort him whenever he was sad because of the villagers. Whenever he would sleep, his mother would bring him to their home. She also strictly told him not to mention to the old man anything about her. Kurama had to constantly remind Naruto to stay away from the villagers and remain inside the orphanage. He was only allowed to go outside when Mai would accompany him. Despite her warnings, Naruto was a bit stubborn. He still insisted on going to the marketplace today all by himself. Last time he walked past a shop, a fox mask in display caught his attention. He really wanted this mask. And so there he was walking towards that shop. As he entered the store, the bells of the door ringed informing the shopkeeper of his arrival. Good morning. How may I help? The shopkeeper stopped as she recognized who the visitor was. Naruto happily walked inside the shop and the next thing he knew he was covering his sensitive ears as the owner yelled at him. Get out of my shop. Please. I mean no harm. I just wanted to buy something. Get out. 
Naruto looked teary-eyed but remained on his spot. Just let me buy something, I'm not going to do anything bad. I just want to buy that fox mask, whispered the boy sadly as he pointed at the item. The clerk glared at him and then at the said mask, she took it from the display and threw it at the boy. Naruto yelped in pain as the mask hit him in the face, the impact made him fall on his bottoms, he quickly stood up and took out his purse and began counting. I do not need your money, oh are anything that came from your filthy demon hands. Get out of my shop and if you ever set foot here again, I will kill you. Naruto widened his eyes in fear. He quickly gathered the coins he laid on the counter and hastily stashed them in his pockets. Taking the fox mask with him, he dashed out of the shop and continued running until he was outside the market district. Inside the seal, Kurama sadly watched as Naruto ran tearfully. She could not blame the boy for being too stubborn. He was only three, after all and wanted to explore. But the villagers despised him. No matter how the boy tried to make himself look good for everyone, they would just yell at him throw insults, or sometimes, become physical against him. And there were still assassination attempts. While it only occurred once or twice a week, it was still not a good thing. Occasionally there were mobs chasing after him. Thankfully, they never got to lay harm on him. That's it. Three years. That is long enough to mourn their deceased. They should have gotten over it by now as well as their hate for my son. How could they worship me as their beloved hero and yet treat Naruto as if he was you? an irate voice asked as it materialized. Like I've said before, humans are narrow-minded, Kurama replied pointedly at Minato. The fact that Serutobi mentioned Naruto's Jinchuriki status instead of his lineage still angers me so. Sure, the third did not mean to bring harm to Naruto. He wanted the council to understand that Naruto was their savior for keeping you locked up, but he should have still told Konoha about who his parents were. That would have at least changed Konoha's view on my boy. I really don't know how to respond to that. I'm already annoyed with Konoha and everyone in it, except the Ichirakus. May the creator give me patience, because I'm really starting hate Konoha. Let's just hope now that Naruto finally realizes that Konoha will never accept him. Because I myself am already convinced. The will of fire is extinguished. When the third dies, Konoha will eventually fall. I don't see any good candidates for Godem. Naruto must understand now that Konoha is after his blood. They want him dead for heaven's sake. Even though the Sandame explained what a storage seal was like. Naruto needs to realize how bad Konoha is now. He simply has to, before he becomes forced to. I don't want him getting critically injured before it happens. Don't worry. He'll eventually realize that. Let him keep his innocence for now, anyway. I see he's back inside the orphanage. You should go. He'll be here in a few minutes. Minato nodded and vanished. The same day Mai was sent to look after Naruto, the Shinigami freed Minato from her stomach. Since Naruto's seal had been altered, Minato was, in a sense, sealed inside his son. Although he wasn't really bound, meaning he could return to the world of the dead and back to Naruto's mindscape whenever he wanted. The only thing that kept him from showing himself to his son was the Shinigami's word. Until Naruto becomes six, the both of them cannot present themselves to their son as he could not see them yet. For now he just had to wait. A few moments later, Naruto materialized in front of the estate's gates. Mother, I'm home, he called as he entered the house. Kurama appeared and welcomed him into a hug. After smothering the boy, she began inspecting his face for any injuries, although she was aware it had already healed. Naruto, didn't I tell you not to go outside the orphanage without my... Look what that shopkeeper did to you. I'm fine, though. Look, I got the mask I wanted. The demoness just sighed as she patted the boy's head. Come on, it's time for you to study. But mother, can't we read a book this time with pictures? Too many symbols making me dizzy, ya yeah, no. All right, go put your mask in your room and see me in the library after. One year has passed since that time Naruto went to buy the fox mask. Ever since, he never went out of the orphanage without Mai. Hiruzen had been watching at that time using his crystal ball. After that event, he assigned one more Anbu squad to Naruto's guards, seeing the boy was now growing and will tend to explore. Right now, there were three Anbu squads watching the boy at a distance. For a four-year-old, Naruto was already showing high intellect. He now figured out that Kurama wasn't actually his mother. Kurama knew that he knew about that fact. Although there was an unspoken agreement. 
Naruto still views Kurama as his mother and Kurama still loves Naruto as her own son. Ever since he was three, Kurama had been teaching him things a person should know. Naruto can now properly read and write. He was now learning English as his second language with Nihongo being his first. He also now has knowledge on how the world started. He's read about gods, demigods, humans, and shinobi. Kurama insisted that Naruto memorize everything about the deities. He didn't question his mother as he knew that it will be important for him to know. When Naruto turned four last month, his mother started teaching him the basics of being a shinobi, explaining what they are, what they do, and their purpose. He was currently at the orphanage's huge playground and was doing target practice, throwing kanais and shurikens at three dummies Mai had erected for him. He was too concentrated on his task he did not notice four people watching him. As his last kanai hit the dummy's torso, he heard clapping noises. Naruto turned around and was surprised to see Mai clapping enthusiastically. Beside her was the Hokage along with two other people he did not know. Mai Nei Chan. Gigi. Naruto greeted as he ran to them happily. He shifted nervously as he stared at the other two people and mumbled a hello. Hello, Naruto-kun, how are you doing? asked the Hokage. I'm doing great Gigi. Did you see that? I can hit the targets now. Yes, I did, Naruto-kun. That was very good, Hiruzen said as he patted the boy's head. By the way, there's two people I'd like you to meet. This is Nagi and Emi Lalie. They are friends of mine. They have talked to me and expressed their intentions of adopting you. How does that sound? Naruto's eyes shined in delight as he stared at the couple. Really? You're going to adopt me? Asked the hopeful boy. This was very important to him as nobody wanted to adopt him. The other kids he knew at the orphanage have already found families. New kids were brought to the orphanage and got adopted, while he remained. Yes, Naruto-kun, we're going to adopt you. You will become a part of our family now, said Emi. Naruto squealed in delight as he began bouncing happily. Now, Naru-chan, let us pack your things. Mai said as he took the boy's hand and led him inside the orphanage. Nay chan what about you? What about me, Naru-chan? I, I won't see you again, Naruto whispered sadly. They stopped walking as Mai kneeled in front of the boy and looked him in the eye. Naru-chan, even if you get adopted, you'll still be seeing me. I'm going to visit you once a week, okay? This made the boy cheer up. Naruto nodded as they entered his room. One year and eleven months later, one week before Naruto's sixth birthday. Word about the demon brat getting adopted spread to the village two days after Naruto officially took the name Lalie. Nagi and Emi Lalie were veteran shinobi and were among those who have lost family members during the Kyubi's attack. They have lost their two sons who were both Junins, from fighting the beast. The whole village knew this and believed that the only reason why the couple adopted the little demon, was to kill him and avenge their deceased sons. Serutobi was also aware of this and ordered Naruto's Anbu guards to keep an eye out. However, it was now almost two years since they have adopted Naruto. The village and the Hokage's suspicion of the two killing Naruto was gone, seeing the boy healthy and well. Lalie Naruto was currently at the Lalie residence's training yard doing chakra exercises. Since his adoptive parents were veteran shinobi and fought during the Third War, they have started giving him shinobi training. Even though he's only five, he was now at academy level to low genin. After keeping four spinning leaves on his forehead for an hour, he stopped and sat down tiredly. Naruto-kun, Emi called from the kitchen. Dinner is ready, come on, time to eat. I'm sure you're tired and hungry. Naruto happily ran inside the house and sat down at the dinner table. What are we having for tonight, Ka-san? Emi smiled sweetly at him. Too sweetly. This made Kurama nervous. Tonight, we're having dead demon, Naru-chan watch out. Naruto heard her but wasn't fast enough as Nagi appeared behind him and slapped something on his back. Why well, what's going on? Naruto asked. Don't feign ignorance, you little demon. You killed our sons, screamed Emi as she took out a kitchen knife. But I didn't kill anyone, replied the boy. He tried gathering chakra to his legs so he could jump at any moment's notice but found that he could not. You're a demon, you're a murderer and don't even think about escaping. I've sealed away your chakra. Tonight, is the night you die, Kayubi," said Nagi as he unsheathed his katana. Inside Naruto's mindscape, 
Kurama was calling out his name in panic. She could still hear and see everything what's going on outside. She can feel her heart breaking as she felt Naruto's increasing fear. However, there was no response from Naruto as she continued trying to contact him. For years, we have waited for the opportunity to kill you. When we adopted you, we could not kill you yet and we had to wait until the Hokages no longer suspected us of harming you. And now, he's finally entrusted you to us. Emmy said as she began walking towards the boy. But, but you're not going to kill me, are you? You said many times that you loved me, sniffled Naruto. Love? Nagi scoffed. We never loved you. We only loved our real sons, the ones that you killed. But, ha, huh, that was called acting. Now, die demon. Naruto screamed as he felt Naji's katana pierce his stomach. Ah. Please, stop. Emmy felt pleasure as the boy's screams penetrated her ear. She raised her knife and stabbed Naruto at the shoulder. No, please, stop. Nagi unstuck the katana and once again stabbed the boy, this time at the lung area. Somebody, please help. Naruto cried as his breathing became difficult. Nobody's going to help you, demon. We have memorized the time of your Anbu guard's shift patterns. We still have three minutes left before they arrive. Even if they catch us, you would be dead then. The village will recognize us as heroes. We will be the ones who finally killed the Kyubi. The words did not register to Naruto's mind as he was too consumed by pain. It felt like an eternity as he continued to get stabbed. He fell to the floor and curled into a position to protect his face. Ah, Naruto managed to scream out loud before he finally lost consciousness. Nagi was about to deliver a killing blow when he and Emi were lifted off from their positions and were thrown towards the opposite wall. An Anbu wearing a weasel mask immediately appeared in front of the couple. Nagi and Emi screamed in terror as their eyes met the ANBUs and slumped to the floor unconscious. An Anbu wearing a dog mask approached the bleeding Naruto and gently lifted him up. The Anbu left the house and rushed the boy to the hospital. Naruto's Mindscape Kurama was already working on repairing Naruto's body while he was rushed to hospital. As Naruto appeared in the mindscape, she immediately enveloped him into a hug. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, Kurama repeated as she gently stroked the boy's head while she cried. Naruto clung to Kurama tightly as he felt her embrace. He buried his face in her s as he cried his heart out. Kashina and Minato watched at a distance while they too had tears falling down their eyes. Kashina watched sadly as Naruto cried himself to sleep and before she left the mindscape. Minato remained and kept watch as Kurama carried Naruto to his room. Yomi no Kuni, World of Darkness, Land of the Dead. Kagatsuchi. The Shinigami called. Yes, my lady? Bring me Lalie Nagi and Lalie Emi's souls. Now. Will do, Shinigami sama. Back to the human realm. Lalie residence weasel and another Anbu wearing a cat mask just finished tying the criminals and were about to bring them to Ibiki. They did not notice nor feel when a black portal appeared in the middle of the dining area, a young woman stepping out of it. The figure tapped Weasel and Cat's shoulders to call their attention. The two Anbu quickly jumped in action and drew their swords, also alerting the other Anbu who were outside, securing the perimeter. The newcomer's face remained impassive as she summoned a sword from the shadows. Time seemed to slow. She immediately pierced Naji's before the Anbu could react. She had already pierced Emmy's heart by the time the Anbu realized what was happening. The shadowy figure unsummoned the sword that now contained its two new victim's souls, sending it back to Yomi. The intruder was now surrounded by eleven Anbu but looked unfazed. She raised her arms and summoned another portal. The Anbu made an attempt to subdue her but only phased through as they made contact with her body. She was gone by the time the Anbu recovered from their shock. Konoha Hospital, how is he? Asked the worried Hokage. The patient is now stable. We have managed to heal his vital organs and stop the bleeding. The Kayubi is helping with his recovery replied a doctor. We may now transfer him to a private room. It would be best if we leave him unbothered for a day. The boy needs his rest, said another one. The Sandame sighed in relief. He nodded and walked beside the nurses as they transferred Naruto to a secure room. Hiruzen assigned three Anbu squads to guard the boy. Two will be standing guard outside the room while the third team hid inside. Konoha Torture and Interrogation Building, Inoichi, Report. Hokage-sama. I have managed to extract their memories. At exactly seven in the evening, 
Lalie Emi called Naruto to dinner. Naruto just finished training as he sat down at the dining table. The Yamanaka head reported everything that happened during that night, exactly saying what the criminals told Naruto. I see. Thank you, Inoichi. Weasel, report. My squad just switched with the other squad when we felt Naruto's chakra spike and then weaken. We rushed and arrived at the house to find the boy at the floor already unconscious, while the couple were too busy attacking him. Inu Taiko attacked Mr. and Mrs. Lalie and sent them flying to a wall. I put them under a genjutsu, immediately disabling them. As Taiko rushed Naruto to the hospital, me and Kat secured the offenders and prepared to bring them to Ibiki-san for interrogation. However, a woman, whom we did not notice arrive, tapped our shoulders to call our attention. Me and Kat jumped into a distance and prepared for a fight. The woman ignored us and summoned a sword from the shadows, using it to kill the two. We were not able to apprehend her as she was intangible. She left by summoning what appeared to be a portal right after killing the Lollies. Can you describe this woman? Did you recognize her? Hi. The woman was none other than Naruto's personal caretaker, Mai. The Hokage's eyes narrowed when he heard the mysterious attacker's name. After a few moments of silence, he puffed smoke from his pipe. Search the whole village for her. We already did, Hokage-sama. But we found no traces of her. We informed the Barrier Corps but they informed us that they haven't seen anyone enter or exit the village at that time up until now. Naruto's Mindscape. Why? The boy asked as he stared at the mirror in his room. Why me? He asked again. Naruto looked up as Kurama entered and sat at the bed, asking him to sit as well. Naru-chan. Come here. Kurama beckoned. It is time for you to know why Konoha wants you dead. Naruto sadly stared at the demoness as he sat beside her. And so Kurama began telling him about the night he was born, while also keeping his parents' identities. She promised him that Naruto will learn about his parents on his sixth birthday. She explained what tailed beasts and jinchurikis are, also informing the boy that his mother was her previous host. As Kurama finished explaining, Naruto kept silent for a long time. She was glad when the boy suddenly tackled her into a hug. It is not your fault, right, Ka-chan. It is the masked man's fault. If it wasn't for him my parents would be alive now. I'm innocent, yes, I was also a victim during that night. But the people of Konoha will never believe that story. They will continue to see you as me even if you were only the container. Now, come with me outside. I'm going to enhance your senses even further. From now on you will be able to sense negative emotions and feelings. You will be able to identify those who are hostile to you. Konoha Hospital Naruto remained unconscious for two days, only waking on the third day. He heard beeping sounds as he opened his eyes. He looked around and found himself in a white room. An IV was connected to his left arm while a breathing mask covered his nose and. He gasped loudly and sat up. He yanked out the IV cord and threw away the mask that was helping him breathe. Remembering what happened before he lost consciousness, panic rose to his as he felt four other presents in the room but could not see them. Naruto's eyes darted from the room's windows to the door and back. Gathering chakra to his legs, he bolted towards the door but found it locked. He tried forcing it open but heard movement on the other side, forcing him to scurry away from the door and ran towards the windows. The door made a clicking noise and opened, revealing the Sandame Hokage. Hiruzen was surprised when he entered the room and saw Naruto desperately trying to open the windows. Naruto-kun. He called out. The boy only yelped in fright, not recognizing the old man. Naruto was now crying as he ran to a far corner and curled into a ball, screaming for help. Naruto. The Hokage shouted as he tried to reach for the boy. Naruto-kun, it's me. Please calm down, no one's going to hurt you. You're safe now. Ah. Naruto. Calm down. The Hokage's pleas fell into deaf ears as the boy continued to scream hysterically. Naruto. Frustrated, Hiruzen slapped the boy's face, snapping him back to reality. The Hokage breathed a sigh of relief as the boy finally calmed down. Not realizing the side effect of slapping the boy, he never took into consideration Naruto's already fragile state. Naruto was brokenhearted. His watery eyes stared at the Hokage's face. His beloved Gigi, one of his five only trusted people, just slapped him. He slapped me, he, he hurt me. Just like the others, yes, that's right, he was the one who gave me to them, so they could kill me, but they failed, and so he hurt me, 
But, he cares about me, right? Or was everything an act? Does, does he want to kill me too? Gigi. Why does the village hate me? What did I ever do to make them hate me? Naruto asked. Of course he already knew, Kurama already told him. But Naruto wanted to confirm his suspicions about the old man. If he answered him honestly, he will still see him as one of his precious people. If he does not tell him about the Kyubi, then it will be right for him to suspect that the Hokage wanted him dead as well like the whole village. The Hokage looked at him for a moment before he responded. I'm sorry Naruto-kun, I do not know. Do you know my parents? Can you tell me about them? Naruto asked again. He frequently asked the Hokage about his parents. Even though he already knew what the old man would say no, Naruto still hoped that the answer would change. Naruto-kun. How many times do I have to tell you? I do not know who your parents are. Hiruzen replied as he sighed, looking sadly and guiltily at the child in front of him. Naruto saw the guilt in the Hokage's eyes. Deep inside, the boy felt disappointed. His remaining trust towards his Gigi was rapidly vanishing. For the last time, he tried again. But you're the Hokage. You're supposed to know. Hiruzen simply stared at the boy with guilt. He could not bring himself to tell the boy, so he remained silent. Naruto sighed in defeat as his shoulders slumped. All right. I'm sorry for my outburst and for bothering you. I'll be going. Before Hiruzen could respond, Naruto hurriedly walked towards the exit. The boy ran away from the Hokage Tower, with no actual direction. Naruto just wanted to stay away from the old man, no, the Hokage. He's no longer Naruto's, Gigi, or, old man. For the boy, Hiruzen was the, Hokage, who wanted him dead. Seeing he was far enough from the tower, Naruto slowed down to a walk as he began to recover his breath. Unfortunately for him, his running caught the attention of the villagers. Naruto did realize just now that he was at the market district, where there were many people. Hey, it's the demon. Someone shouted. Naruto gasped in fear and bolted into a run. It's getting away. Die. Kill the demon. And so the chase began. Thanks to his shinobi training, Naruto was able to lose the civilian mob on his tail, losing half the number of his pursuers. Now there were only shinobi pursuing him, consisted of genins, chunins, and some janins. Naru chan, in here, quick. A voice whispered as Naruto ran past an alleyway. Thanks to his heightened senses, he was able to hear and recognize the voice and quickly made a turn. He was startled as an arm grabbed him into a black vortex. Naruto was gone just as his pursuers arrived. Damn it, where did the demon go? Namikaze estate. Naruto was expecting to be hurt when the arm grabbed him. He was surprised when no pain came but instead a warm, comforting hug. Are you okay? His rescuer asked as he was released. Why yeah. Naruto replied as he looked at his rescuer. Recognizing his caretaker from the orphanage, he tackled her into a hug. Nay Chan, it's you. You saved me. Mai smiled as she hugged the boy tight. I'm sorry I was late. It's okay, Nay Chan. They didn't land a hit on me this time. No, I meant those two who adopted you and tried to kill you. Forgive me. I was assigned by your mother to look after you but I failed my duty. I trusted the Lollies wouldn't harm you. I was wrong. You almost died. Wait, my mother? Yes, Naru Chan. I was sent by your biological mother. But, I thought she's dead. She is. But how? Were you working for her even before I was born? No, I only met her when she died. Oh okay, Naruto replied, totally confused. Mai simply smiled and ruffled the boy's hair. You will understand on your birthday. Everything about your family will be explained, I promise. Okay Nei Chan, I trust you. Also, don't punish yourself about those two. They're dead anyway. How did you know? I overheard the people talking about them. They were killed the same night they tried to kill me. I don't know who did it though, but if I knew who did, I'm going to thank that person and probably give a if she's a girl. Mai smirked and pinched the boy's cheeks. You're welcome, Naru Chan. Wait, what? Now where's Mai? Asked an amused Mai. You're the one who did it. Yes. Wow. The boy said, awestruck. He smirked as he once again tackled the girl to a hug and ed her cheeks. Thanks, Nei Chan. You're welcome, Naru Chan. Where are we anyway? Whose home is this? We're currently inside your house, your supposed true home. 
My real home. This is where your parents lived. Don't worry. This house is placed with seals. Nobody knows we're here. Now, enough questions. They will be answered on your birthday. Let's have some ramen, shall we? I'm sure you're hungry. Time skip. 10th of October's Eve. Namikaze Estate. Naruto remained inside the mansion while Mai used a henge to go outside and acquire the necessary supplies for the house. During their two-day stay, Mai let Naruto have some private time while she kept guard and listened to what's happening outside, watching out for threats. Unknown to the boy, Mai was adding layers upon layers of seals around the house. This was to keep outsiders from feeling three strong presences radiating from the mansion that will appear later. Naruto was currently waiting at the living hall, dressed in a formal light blue kimono that Mai prepared for him. Naruto checked the time, it was now 10 minutes before October the 10th. 10 minutes before he turned 6. Just then, he heard Kurama's voice from his head. Naru chan, please create a shadow clone. Naruto was confused at his adoptive mother's sudden request but complied. Forming his hands into a cross seal, he murmured as he called the name of his technique. There was a puff of smoke in front of Naruto and on it appeared Kurama's human form instead of a shadow clone. She was also wearing a kimono but hers were red-orange. Ka-chan. What's going on, Naru Chan? It's time for you to meet your biological parents. It was at that moment a black vortex appeared. From it, black and white mist emanated, filling the living room. The temperature in the house dropped. The mist slowly formed into a spectral image of a cloaked figure wielding a scythe. Naruto was staring at the figure with wide eyes. Shi Shinigami, is this how I'm going to meet my parents? By me having to die? Naruto thought. However, he became more puzzled when the Shinigami changed form and took the appearance of a beautiful woman with flowing red hair, wearing a red kimono. The woman held out her hand as a yellow orb appeared. The yellow orb began glowing and later on took the form of a man with blonde hair, dressed in a blue kimono. Naruto immediately recognized him as the Yandaimi Hokage. Hello, Naru-chan. The woman greeted with a warm and loving smile. Shinigami-sama, a confused Naruto replied making her and the man chuckle. You have grown well. Happy birthday son. The two chorused. Naruto suddenly found himself engulfed into a hug. Son. Yes, Naru-chan. You are our son. The woman said, as if reading his thoughts. I, I, I'm the son of the Yandaimi Hokage and the Shinigami. That makes me a demigod. Naruto half shouted. We know that, Naruto-kun. That's a lot to take in. The Yandaimi joked. Let's have our seats, shall we? Your father and I will explain things to you. All right, Ka-chan, Naruto nervously said. The woman smiled at Naruto for calling her his mother. For the following two hours, Minato and Kashina told their son about themselves. Starting with their names and their identities, they told Naruto about their life. How they met and how they eventually fell in love. Resulting them getting married and him getting born into this world. Kashina also explained to Naruto about her being the former Kyubi Jinchuriki and it being a secret. Later on, they came to the topic about the night he was born, eventually explaining to Naruto how Kashina became the Shinigami and Minato's soul being freed from her stomach. They showed the memory from Naruto's birth up to the part where Serutobi took him from his dead parents' embrace. At this point, Naruto began to tremble with rage. He knew, he knew my parents, he knew about the Kyubi. I asked him many times, and he didn't tell me. Naruto-kun, we're so sorry for having to put you through this kind of life. But know that you are our son and we love you. I no longer consider myself a Konoha's Hokage. I've made the mistake of choosing the village first instead of my own family. The village I willingly died for betrayed me. Minato started. Know this, Naru-chan. Whatever you do, we will support you. So, if you want to lay waste upon Konoha, we'll gladly help you. Kashina finished with an evil smirk. Naruto was surprised at his parents' declaration. He suspected them to tell him to forgive the villagers and be a good boy and all that. He smiled deviously as he nodded to his parents, happy that they too hated the village. Another thing. It's time for you to formally meet your spirit guardian. Kashina said as she motioned to Mai, who was sitting beside Kurama. Mai nodded as her body began to glow and transform. A few moments later there was a black claymore on the spot where the girl was earlier. Kurama stood up and took the weapon, giving it to Naruto. Naru-chan, 
This is Kagatsuchi. You already knew her as my. She was the one I sent to look after you ever since that old fool Serutobi sent you to the orphanage. As you have studied the deities before, know that she is indeed the real Kagatsuchi. The beginning of death. Kashina stated as Naruto took the sword from Kurama and began inspecting it. The sword was elegant black that looked like obsidian. However, it was not brittle like most glass but was stronger than any mortal blade. From the pommel and up to the guard, it had red intricate markings and symbols from the world of the dead. The front guard had the kanji for, beginning, while the back guard had the kanji for the word, death. The fuller also had intricate markings but was gold instead of red. Finally, the blade, radiated a black glow and looked very sharp. At the tip were red glaring eyes on both sides. The blade started to glow as Naruto finished inspecting it. Upon instinct, he gently laid it on the floor. The sword once again transformed and took on the form of Mai. It is a pleasure to finally introduce myself to you, Naruto-sama. As your spirit guardian, I will be your partner in battle and in other things. The sword is my original form, while this is my human form. I can also morph into different kinds of other weapons. I can be only wielded by you. Those who will wield me without your consent will immediately die. Their souls will be ed by me. As of this moment, I already contain two souls, the Lalies. Shinigami Sama shall be the one to explain about the soul capturing and your powers as well. My powers. Yes, Naru chan. When I became the Shinigami, I was able to see your future while I held you as a baby. I gave you powers for you to use. I saw how Konoha treated you for keeping them safe. And that vision I saw was true. Many times, there were attempts on your life, with the latest one almost succeeding. Started Kashina. As the son of the Shinigami, I have given you powers to back your title. Your main power will be control over darkness. You will be able to control shadows and mold it to solid objects of your liking. You will also be able to cast darkness even at the brightest of places. Another thing is you will be able to see clearly in the darkness, with your other senses also heightening while in it. Like my, you will also be able to shadow travel. Your powers over darkness and shadows will make the strongest Naru look weak compared to you. But of course, you will still have to train using these. My will be there to assist you. My second gift to you is another bloodline. This one is a dojutsu. Like the Sharingan Eye of the Uchiha, it has certain levels to unlock. Yours have already awakened two hours ago, as I have willed for you to unlock your powers once you turn six. I have no name for your dojutsu yet as I saw fit for you to be the one to name it. Your dojutsu has six levels. The first one, that you have already unlocked, allows you to see and communicate with the souls of the dead. Aside from that, you can also detect life forces. The more you train with it, the farther the distance you could detect. The second level allows you to command souls to do tasks that do not require physical contact. The second level also allows you to identify exactly whose life forces it is that you see. The third level allows you to command souls to do tasks that require physical contact. It will also allow you to tell of a certain life force whether if it's dying, sick, or healthy. The fourth level, in exchange of six human lives, your dojutsu allows you to revive the dead for an amount of time. The length of time depends on your mastery with the technique, with the maximum time limit being 60 years. This doesn't necessarily mean they could complete the 60-year time limit, as they could still die by other causes. Be it sickness, old age, or getting killed. Once they die for the second time, you won't be able to revive them again. Lastly, the fourth level finally allows you to see the exact date and time of a living being's death. The fifth level, also in exchange of six souls, allows you to permanently bring back someone from the dead. Take note that this has a limit of six. Once you revive a seventh, one of the six has to return to the world of the dead. Like the temporary ones, they can be also killed or die of natural cause. You can't also revive them for the second time once they die. Remember this, Naru chan There are certain souls that cannot be revived. There are also souls that will require my approval for revival. You can't just bring back anyone from the dead. Sadly, your father is one of the souls that cannot be revived. The sixth and the last level allows you to use the techniques life drain and soul drain. In order to use both techniques, you have to be in physical contact with the victim. 
Once you have unlocked the sixth level of your dojutsu, the souls you have captured and contained inside Kagutsuchi will be now usable. They will follow your every command and protect you from any kind of harm, regardless of their relationship with you before being sealed. You will also be able to give them back their physical bodies. Like the fifth level, you are only allowed to give physical bodies up to six souls. And lastly, you have the power to finally send their soul to the land of the dead should you wish to. Wow, was the only thing Naruto could say. Wow indeed. But it's not just that. You'll learn more interesting things Shinobi cannot do. Mai will teach it to you. Since I am the Shinigami, that makes me a god. And there are certain laws about gods and mortals, one them is where we can't interact with mortals frequently. But don't worry, Naru-chan, your dad and I will still be guiding you. Kashina reassured. Now, is there anything you'd like? A special request perhaps, since it is your birthday. Unfortunately it can't be a staying with you for long. We can only stay with you from 3 to 4 in the morning. Today was earlier and longer since it is your 6th birthday. I suppose we could watch a movie together. Naruto said. What movie, dear? Naruto had an evil glint in his eye that made the Shinigami's side in Kashina proud. Kanahagakur. October 10. 3 a.m. As a member of the task force, Uchiha Rito with his partner Nagi were doing the patrols in the village. Rito had been working in the task force for 10 years now while his partner, Nagi was doing his first ever patrol as he was a new recruit. As they walked past the walls and neared a forest area, they heard noises. Nagi, being the first timer he was, immediately became scared and thought of ghosts. Pull yourself together, kid. It can't be ghosts. I've been patrolling this area for 10 years now. What we heard could be intruders or something, said Rito as he began walking. They followed the source and went through the forest and were eventually led into a clearing. There they saw a girl that looked like no more than five years old. The girl had her back turned to them. She seemed to be cuddling a teddy bear and was humming to it. What on earth is that kid doing here at this time in the morning? Nagi thought. Who's the irresponsible parent that left this child here? Rito thought as he walked towards the girl. The girl stopped her humming as she sensed their approach. Are you my mummy and daddy? The girl asked, still not showing her face. No, kid, we're members of the police task force. Don't worry though, we will help you find your parents. Replied Rito. What are you doing here, by the way? Asked Nagi as he too approached the girl. If you're not my mum and dad, go away screamed the girl now kid that's not a good thing to say we just want to help an annoyed nagi said as he grabbed the girl's shoulder and forced her to face them the two uchihas froze as they saw the girl's face or rather her missing face the girl had no face nagi immediately let go of the girl as he let out a loud gasp the girl vanished into thin air then getting over from his shock rito activated his sharingan and muttered kai while also sending Chakra to his partner to get rid of the supposed Genjutsu. Just then, they heard the humming of the girl again. Only this time it was coming from six directions. Line. In another part of the village, Azumo let out a bored yawn as he stared at the dark forest outside the main gate. His partner Kotetsu did the same as he finished his crossword puzzle. Man, this is so boring. Come on, it's three in the morning and we're stuck here. Who on earth would come visit at this time of hour anyway? Complained Kotetsu. Be careful what you ask for, as the saying goes. Azumo narrowed his eyes as he saw six white hooded figures coming near the gate. He nudged his partner to inform about their arrival. Halt, what business do you have here? Said Azumo. Instead of hearing them respond in their language, the immortal Chunins heard high-pitched gibberish sounds. What country are you from? Can you please remove your hoods for identification? Asked Kotetsu, hoping they'd understand. The cloaked figures appeared to understand him as they removed their hoods. Azumo and Kotetsu gaped in shock as the figures had no heads. Line. Serutobi Hiruzen slept soundly in his desk, his head not visible due to the high stacks of papers around him. For the past three days, he had been receiving increasing amounts of demands from the whole village. Since October the 10th was approaching, they were demanding for Naruto's execution. Speaking of the boy, Hiruzen haven't seen him since their last meeting. Even with his crystal ball, he could not find the boy. 
The Hokage supposed that Naruto was hiding from the villagers. He could not blame the child since he knew about the mobs. He felt sad because of it and moreover, he felt Naruto became distant towards him ever since the Lalie incident. And so there he was, fast asleep due to the stress. He was awoken from his slumber when he felt the room's temperature drop. Shivering, he checked the thermometer's number going from zero to negative and was still dropping. Hiruzen, a soft, yet very chilling voice whispered in the room. The Hokage tried to cast a fire jutsu to warm himself but found that he could not. Hiruzen, the voice repeated. This time, it was louder and colder, as if promising death. The temperature went back to normal when an Anbu barged into his office. Hokage-sama, Hiruzen narrowed his eyes as he read his ANBU's body language. He could see that the Anbu was bothered about something. Normally an Anbu wouldn't show that much emotion unless something big has happened. H. Hokage-sama, there had been some disturbing reports from the whole village. Patrols have reported spotting individuals and groups of people with no heads, faces, or limbs. They are wandering around the village but don't appear to be attacking. Just then, another Anbu appeared in front of him via Shunshin. The Anbu was about to give a report when they heard the secretary outside screaming. A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-
Another thing that mystified them was that nobody died during the mass panic. There have been multiple reports about people being seen getting trapped inside burning buildings or getting trampled by the stampede. They didn't receive any wounds either. Only the buildings seemed to have been affected by the incident. However, while the people of Kanahagakur remained physically unscathed, they were mentally scarred by the things they have seen earlier that morning. What the Konoha villagers did not know, those who were supposed to have died actually died but were prevented by the Shinigami to go to the afterlife. They were simply sent back. The Sandame Hokage have ordered the village to be put on a tight lockdown. Nobody was going in or out the place. Everywhere, Anbu and Junin could be seen patrolling the streets or interviewing villagers. The Chunins were putting out the fires while the Genins were helping out distribute supplies. Back inside the Namikaze estate. All right, starting today we will begin training with your dark release. Began Mai, or Kaguchi, now that her true identity has been revealed. Harnessing darkness around you is just the same as connecting to your inner self to unlock your chakra. However, your darkness element is not connected with your chakra pathways. Rather, it has another system. Simply put, you have another source of power. When you were born, you originally had one but acquired another one when the Kyubi was sealed into you. You got your third when Shinigami-sama blessed you with her powers. One is your main chakra system, that we will refer to as your human chakra, the second is the one you got from Kyubi, the one that we will refer to as your demonic chakra, thus giving you a second chakra system that is darker than your original. Your third system is made up of your darkness element, it is completely dark and more potent compared to your first and second chakra systems combined. That one we will refer to as your dark chakra or dark element. Now, before we begin, I want you to create a cage bunshin, pour half of your human and demon chakra to it. Kurama-san will train you with your original chakra while I train you with your darkness element. Naruto nodded and then did as he was told. The bunshin went off to the second training ground and created another bunshin for Kurama to take form. Kagutsuchi then waved her hand and suddenly the training ground became surrounded with darkness. Good. Now, in order to unlock your dark chakra pathways, you will have to meditate. Concentrate on your dark emotions, feel the darkness around you. If you're having problems grasping it, just remember your parents. Remember how the villagers treated you. Remember how the Sandame lied to you. Remember how you almost got killed by the Laliers. Remember last night when you finally met your parents and knew the truth. Remember how you had fun watching the villagers run around in panic. Let the shadows embrace you. Let the darkness consume you. Naruto closed his eyes and recalled all the memories he can remember since his birth. Every glare he had to endure, the insults, the isolation he received, the Sandame's filthy lies. Slowly, he began to feel the void around him. Next he remembered every good memory. My being there for him, Kurama watching out for him as a mother, and then him finally meeting his parents. That good feeling when he found out about his powers. The swirling darkness around him embraced him and Naruto welcomed it with open arms. Kagutsuchi watched as the training grounds went back to its normal state. The surrounding darkness went to Naruto and made him look like godly, his body emitting a dark glowing aura. Naruto opened his eyes and stood up. He raised his left arm and closed his hand into a fist. A tendril of shadow appeared in front him and also formed into a fist. Well done, Naruto-sama. You have unlocked your dark prowess and have a good grasp of it. Before we train with the rest of your darkness abilities, I will train you first in mastering the art of shadow traveling. Time skip. One week later, Naruto was currently meditating, trying to get a stronger feel with his dark element. He was currently having problems grasping more of it. You lack darkness. Naruto opened his eyes and found a red-haired girl staring at him. She was also sitting in a meditative position. What? I said, you lack darkness. In order to increase your grasp, you need to experience and feel more negative emotions. There is something that prevents you from gathering dark chakra with no limits. You must visit your homeland first. Naruto stared at the ghost blankly. He couldn't understand a thing she was saying. The girl slapped her forehead as she remembered something. I'm sorry, I forgot. You do not speak our language. Language, yes. Like you, I'm an Uzumaki. Our clan has its own language. Naruto looked at the girl excitedly. So you're an Uzumaki, 
Are there any others here? The ghost stared at him for a long time, unnerving the boy. That, I cannot tell you. You will have to figure it out yourself. But here are two hints. 1. Learn our language. 2. Visit the ruins of our home village, Uzushiogakur. Who are you anyway? I apologize, I forgot to introduce myself first. I'm Uzumaki Kasumi. I was a genin about to become chunin when I died. I was 14. That's all I can tell you for now. Also, I can only teach you the basics to our language. You will have to ask Shinigami Sama, your mother, to teach it to you. It will be faster. Time skip. Seven weeks later. Naruto can now do shadow traveling but still had a limit. He can only travel a maximum of 600 meters. During his training, he also made friends with some ghosts. Three days after Kasumi introduced herself, Naruto asked his mother about their clan. He was then told about Uzushiogakur and the Uzumaki clan. Naruto found out that he also inherited the Uzumaki chakra chains. Although unlike the normal golden color, his chains were obsidian black. He didn't mind though, his mind was set on visiting the ruins of Uzushiogakur. He was curious about his ancestry. And so Naruto was packing things for a one-week stay at Uzu. Kagutsuchi will be helping him with the shadow traveling. Before he left, he decided to at least make himself seen by the Sandame. Naruto would eat at Ichiraku's before he went to Uzu. Hokage's office. Hiruzen was worried. Normally the boy would come visit his office every weekend, but it had been two months since the last time he saw Naruto. Today was another normal day for him. He was taking a break after doing a lot of paperwork. For the past two months he spent his break time gazing the crystal ball, while also looking for Naruto. He was hoping that he would find the boy today. The Sandame soon found his wish granted. He found the boy eating at Ichiraku's. Immediately, he called for his Anbu and tasked them to invite the boy to his office once he was finished with his meal. Ichiraku's. Naruto was fully aware about the Hokage sending Anbu to fetch him. He didn't show it but instead kept his focus to his food. Your ramen's delicious as always, old man. Here, keep the change. Stay beautiful, Ayame-chan. I'll be going. You're always welcome here, Naruto-kun. Please visit more often. I will, when I'm strong enough to defend myself. You know how Konoha loves me. I have to stay low for now. Chuki nodded sadly and gave him a package. Here, for your training, it's on the house. Thanks, I'll be leaving now. It was at this moment the Anbu chose to appear at the stand. Naruto-san, you have been invited to the Hokage's office. All right, bring me to him. The Anbu nodded and put his hand on the boy's shoulder and shun Shin to the Hokage's office. Hokage's office Serutobi smiled as the Anbu returned with the boy. Naruto have changed since the last time he met him. The boy have grown a few inches. He was also looking more athletic despite his young age. His clothing was all black. On his back was a sword he's never seen before. Naruto, my boy. How are you? It's been so long. Come, sit. Naruto nodded and sat opposite the Hokage's desk. Hokage-sama. Hokage-sama. What happened to Gigi? The Sandame and the Anbu in the room thought. He's changed. Thought Hiruzen. What happened to you? Where have you been this past two months? I'm doing well, Hokage-sama. I was in my parents' house. I hid there for two months while also training. I used a random henge whenever I went outside to get some supplies. Of course. Why didn't I think of that? Serutobi nodded, thinking of the lollies. I see. You may go now, Naruto-kun. If you need anything, I'll be here in my office, all right? Thank you, Hokage-sama. I'll go now. Naruto bowed and left the building. He walked towards an isolated street and looked for a shadow. He was about to shadow travel to Uzushio when he heard voices. You were sent by the Azukage, said a voice. Naruto looked and saw four masked people and recognized it as Anbu, however their masks were different. With them was an old man in bandages. Naruto at first thought he was glaring at him when another voice behind him spoke. Yes, Kasumi's voice replied, what's going on here? Naruto wondered. Konoha will not aid your village. Your mission is a failure. I have already presented the scroll to the Sandame. He will send help. Whirlpool or allies with the leaf. You have no authority to interfere. I am Shimura Danzo. I am the founder of Root. I have authority. 
Your clan has been doomed the moment the Alliance decided to destroy your clan. I'm going to make sure Konoha doesn't send help. We cannot waste leaf lives for your village. And you, girl, will not even return to see your beloved village for the last time. You will die here. Danzo roared as he walked away. The four root Anbu unsheathed their tantus and prepared to attack. Golden chains shot out of Kasumi's body as she defended herself. She was able to kill one and disable another but was defeated when she felt her body controlled by another mind. One of the root Anbu removed his gloves and touched the now paralyzed girl. Kasumi realized that the touch contained lethal tiny bugs that quickly multiplied on her body. Within a minute the Uzumaki Chunin was dead. Naruto blinked his eyes as the scene disappeared and the place returned to normal. There wasn't anybody with him. What? The boy was lost in his thoughts as he tried to understand why he just saw Kasumi's death, and what were that old man Danzo was talking about. His thoughts eventually brought him back to Uzushiogakur. He remembered he was supposed to go there. Clearing his mind for the moment, he walked towards the shadows. Before he could pour it out, Kurama stopped him. Naruto-kun, wait, mother, what is it? The Sandame will assume you've been staying inside the Lalites. Go back to the Namikaze mansion first and we'll create a clone so it could stay here while you're away. Just in case the monkey decides to check on you. All right, Namikaze estate, the clone we will be creating is special. It will be able to cast jutsus and replenish its chakra. Also, my consciousness will be present to it as well. It will not be dispelled unless it runs out of chakra which is impossible, or when you will it too. It was a good thing the estate was placed with a lot of seals. If it weren't, the people outside would have sensed the Kyubi's chakra. The process took about 5 minutes. Kurama poured 50% of her chakra to the clone. Why does it look tired? Asked Naruto as he observed the clone. It still has to recover your human chakra. The clone only has mine as of this moment. Don't worry about it now, it's time for you to go to your home village. Uzushiogakur ruins. Uzushiogakur became famous due to its structure. The whirlpools that surrounded the island served as its natural defenses and kept the village safe from navy invasions. However, the whirlpools that used to swirl were no longer there. The water surrounding the island was calm. Behind the half-ruined gate's shadows, a blonde boy wielding a black sword appeared and walked out of the shadows. Naruto looked inside the gates towards the village. He was expecting to meet the souls of his deceased kin, instead, he saw a fully intact village, with children running around. The civilians were peacefully doing their business while the shinobi watched in their stations. This confused the boy as he entered past the gates. Naruto noticed that their language was different. He later realized that they were talking in their native Uzumaki language. He was glad he met Kasumi. He unconsciously walked towards a certain building. It was the tallest and the biggest among other buildings and can be easily noticed. On the roof were two red banners with the whirlpool insignia emblazoned in gold. Naruto recognized it as the Uzukage's building. He entered the building and headed straight to what he thought was the Uzukage's office. When he came in, he saw an old man with streaks of red hair adorning his white hair. He looked up as the door of the office opened and a familiar-looking girl entered. Uzukage sama greeted the girl. Ah, Kasumi, you've finally come, said the Uzukage. I have a mission for you. Since you are one of the few here who can speak the universal language, I am assigning you to go to Kanahagakur to request for help. What help? Uzukage sama We have received intelligence about a possible invasion. From what country? How is that possible? We've been living in peace and haven't done anything to make the other nations angry. I know that, Kasumi. But they're scared of us. Who? Why? Kumo, Kiri, and Iwa are scared of us. Our village may be small compared to others but our strength in battle can equally match two whole armies of a great shinobi nation. So they want to destroy us. Yes, I need you to leave in an hour and deliver this scroll to the Sandame Hokage. We do not know when exactly the attack will happen. We'll make an estimate of three days. Now go. The scene shifted into another. Naruto guessed three days have passed. He could hear bells ringing all over the village. He went outside the Uzukage building and checked the village. Hushed screams could be heard from parents and panicked screams from children. The Genin were ushering them to the safe bunkers while the Chunin were running around gathering supplies. Some higher-ranking Chunin were preparing their own Genin squads. 
The Anbu and the Junin were already forming columns to intercept the incoming enemy army. Naruto could see in the shores huge ships that had the Kumo and Kiri flags on it. However there were three armies. Kumo, Iwa, and Kiri have allied to destroy the Uzumaki. What happened to Kasumi? Naruto wondered. He stopped in his tracks as he remembered the scene he watched just before he traveled to the island. He was interrupted from his thoughts when he heard children screaming. Naruto watched helplessly as a Kumo nin mercilessly butchered the children. He wondered how the army got in quickly. He looked to the gates and found it already broken. Dead bodies of both attackers and defenders littered the streets. He now realized that the scene have skipped. Naruto closed his eyes and opened them when he finally heard an eerie silence. He looked around and found the now destroyed village. He looked at the shore and found the invading army's ships gone. The battle was over. Naruto ran around the village to look for survivors. After a few minutes, the scene shifted back to normal. You won't find survivors. There are none. A voice spoke. Naruto turned and finally saw his now dead clan. A thousand souls surrounded him. He recognized the soul of the Uzukage who was a few steps in front of the others. Beside him were five other people who he recognized as the past Uzukages. Among them was the first Jinchuriki of the Kayubi, Uzumaki Mito, who walked towards him and spoke. Naruto, the last and heir to our clan. You have finally come. We've been waiting for you. One week later, Uzushiogakur. Naruto was immediately taken into apprenticeship by the past Uzukages. For the past week, he was taught with the introduction and basics to Fuenjutsu. He will be staying there for more than two years, while the clone remained in Konoha. Aside from sealing, he will be trained to properly use his chakra chains. Mito was also training him use Kurama's chakra properly. While he cannot fuse with the tailed beast yet until he reaches the age of 13, there were other things Naruto can do with the Kyubi's chakra. Naruto heaved a sigh of relief as he finished training for today. Naruto, it's time for you to synchronize with your clone in Konoha. What? Everything you've learned and experienced here the clone will also know, and vice versa. All right, what do I do? Just sit on a meditative stance. I'll contact my other half and we'll do the rest. Ten minutes later, I see. The Sandame hasn't gone looking for me yet. He will soon, said Mito. Kurama, can you contact the clone again and tell him? Kanahagakur, I see. Naruto muttered as he lazily walked the streets. Receiving the original's orders, he went to the Hokage's mansion. When he arrived at the building, he was immediately ushered to the office. Turns out the Sandame was watching him on his crystal ball. No, not watching, he's spying on me, thought Naruto as he entered the office. Naruto, my boy, how are you? What brings you here? asked Hiruzen. He was surprised with the boy's sudden visit. Perhaps he hasn't changed and just needed time after the incident. Hokage-sama, greeted Naruto, or not, he's really changed. I would like to make a request, continued the boy. What is it? I would like to live in an apartment. The place I'm staying at is not giving me a pleasant stay. It brings me bad memories. The Hokage nodded sadly. Very well, Naruto-kun. There is a place just for you. Please come with me. Followed by the hidden Anbu, the Hokage led Naruto to an apartment. It looked to be empty. Of course, I'll be living alone in this whole apartment. He doesn't want the demon brat living with the humans. Thought Naruto with disdain. Here's the key to your room, Naruto-kun. Room 401, I'll be back in my office. Just come visit me if you need something. Will do, Hokage-sama. Thank you said Naruto as he bowed and went upstairs searching for his room. As he went to find his room, he extended his senses and searched the building for other inhabitants. There were none. Kasumi-chan, I would like you to do something for me, said Naruto aloud. There was a shimmer in the air and the ghost of Kasumi appeared. What is it? Make an investigation about this building. Find its owner if there is any, and the inhabitants before it got abandoned. Will do. I'll be back in the evening. Thank you. I'll be at my parents' house. Said Naruto as he walked towards a shadowed corner and traveled. Later evening, at the Namikaze estate, Naruto was meditating when he felt Kasumi's presence. Good evening, Kasumi-chan. Good evening, Naruto-kun. The building the Hokage gave you was new. Nobody has lived at it yet. 
You'll be the first if you decide to stay there. The building was supposed to be bought by a wealthy businessman. The buyer died last week. Got ambushed by bandits on his way back. I see. And what of the owner? He's decided to make it an apartment for rent instead. Although I believe you won't be having neighbors, as news about the demon brat living in that building have already spread. News travels fast, said Naruto, an idea forming to his mind. Indeed, I would like you to bring me to the owner's place. I'll meet you at your apartment room. The owner's house is only three blocks away. Naruto nodded and Shadow traveled to his apartment. He hanged himself to a rich businessman and made two clones, having them take the appearance of a bodyguard. He nodded and followed the ghost, his clones behind him. When they arrived at the porch, they were greeted by a servant and were led inside. A fat man wearing a lot of jewelry welcomed them as they reached the living room. Welcome, sir, how may I be of service? The fat man said, whom he assumed was the owner. Good evening, Dodo-san. I'm Menma Kays, Naruto said as he shook hands with him. Of course, Menma-san. Business talk, I presume. Straight to the point, huh? Fine, yes. I believe you were selling an apartment. Ah, yes, but I have put it open for rent and someone already occupies one of the rooms. I'm surprised he said that. I was expecting he'll say it's empty. Commented Kasumi. It's no problem. I came here to buy the whole building for him. Why would you do such thing for that thing? That thing, Dodo-san, is a person. It appears that you're just the same like the rest of the villagers. I came here in hopes of making a deal. I was going to offer thrice the price to buy the building, but with that attitude of yours, Naruto said, a glint of anger visible in his eyes. F forgive me, Menma-san. I misspoke. The fat man stuttered as he tried to stop Naruto, who was now at the doorway. Naruto smirked inwardly as he faced the owner again. Very well, I'm buying that building twice the price. Dodo's face fell. Naruto and Kasumi of course noticed this. Naruto continued. You don't like my offer. And no. I mean, yes, of course. Twice the price is really good. Good. Come to the apartment tomorrow with the papers. You'll name it to Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. Naruto said as he subtly cast a genjutsu. Dodo nodded with a huge smile on his face as he shook hands with Naruto, unaware of the genjutsu cast upon him. Naruto's level at genjutsu was only at an adept level, since he just started learning it. But with a little help from Kurama, the Genjutsu should last 36 hours on a civilian. Naruto and his clones exited the house and decided to check on the apartment, still with their hinges on. When they arrived at the building, Naruto sensed three other presents upstairs. He and his clones melded with the shadows and headed to the fourth floor, to where his room was. Shish, the demon is asleep, said a voice. Let's kill it now, said another. Yeah, no one will know said a third i'll break in the door one of you act as lookout one will guard the window to make sure it doesn't escape said the first hidden in the shadows naruto listened to their conversation and watched his supposed to be assassins were carrying knives civilians huh naruto thought as he melded and went inside his room the leader's silhouette was visible by the moonlight coming in by the window the wannabe assassin sneaked his way to the bedroom as he raised his knife for a stabbing motion, a chain appeared from the shadows and held the man's wrist. Another chain appeared and served as a gag. Naruto appeared from the shadows and hit the intruder's head, making him drop to the ground unconscious. Outside the room, the leader's accomplices grew impatient and weary. They decided to enter the room as well to check. As they stepped inside, black chains held them as well as their s to keep them from shouting. They felt something hit their necks and fell to the floor unconscious moments later. Naruto flicked open the lights and finally saw his room's layout for the first time. It was pretty decent. It had four divisions. One was the bedroom, the other the bathroom, the third was the kitchen, and the fourth was the living room. What do you plan to do with them? Kasumi asked as she appeared on top of the three unconscious bodies. Nothing for now. When I unlock my eyes fifth power. I'm going to use their souls as exchange for the people I'm going to resurrect. I see. Mother, can you contact my original and ask him for a seal? A preservation seal perhaps, something that works for these, heathens. Kurama chuckled at the word Naruto used. I'll let the original know. 
For now just keep them unconscious. I'll teach you the areas you can hit so they'd go into a state of comatose. Next day, Naruto decided to spend the night on his new apartment. During the night, three more people decided to pay him a visit. A pair of civilians broke in around one in the morning. The last was a shinobi. A chunin. He arrived at three. There were now six people he has for sacrifice. Six souls. That's one soul I can revive now, thought Naruto as he got up from bed and started the day. Hmm, I guess living here isn't bad after all. People will come here and try to kill me, while they'll only be used later as sacrifices. How many are you planning to, um, keep? Kasumi asked as she appeared. That depends on how many will try to kill me. I've already decided to use Dodo, soul as sacrifice as well. Later, when he gives me the papers and the deed of ownership for this building, I'm keeping him as well. I'll have it look like he's gone off for a vacation and never returned, killed by bandits on the road. The original asked me to ask the Hokage for an apartment so he won't find out that I didn't really stay at the Lalites. Who knew things will end this way? It's a win-win situation, you know. You get sacrifices while you keep your knowledge of your heritage a secret. Said Kasumi. I know. While the original trains to become stronger and is safe from the Hokage, I get voluntary sacrifices here laughed naruto as he prepared breakfast he had a clone henge into a random civilian last night and bought food of course he used genjutsu on the store owners so he wouldn't have to pay as he was having his breakfast he sensed five chakra signatures one of them he recognized was the sandames the other four were probably his anbu guard he finished his meal as the hokage made his way upstairs to his room naruto immediately opened the door when he heard him knock Hokage-sama, greeted Naruto with a blank face. Good morning, Naruto-kun. May I come in? asked Hiruzen. Of course, said Naruto as he led the old man to the living room. Would you like some tea? Yes, please, smiled Hiruzen. Naruto nodded and went to the kitchen. The clone he made just finished making tea. He took the pot and poured its contents on a cup and returned to the living room. What can I help you with, Hokage-sama? Naruto asked as he served tea. I came here for two reasons. The Hokage decided to get on with what he came for as he realized Naruto doesn't want him there. One is to ask you about this apartment. How is it? Do you like it? Or would you like to transfer? I like it here, Hokage-sama. I'm the only one residing here and I like it. Nobody will bother with the demon brat. Naruto said in a calm tone. The Hokage winced but didn't say anything about it. I see. That's good then. The other reason why I came here is to inform you that the academy will be starting in four months. No, interrupted Naruto. What? I said no, I'm not going to the academy to become a shinobi of the leaf. Sarutobi was shocked. He wasn't expecting the boy's response. But why? I thought you said you wanted to become Hokage. Not anymore. Why would I want to protect a village that hates me? Retorted Naruto. Sarutobi was speechless. He felt the coldness radiating from the boy. He felt his hate. I, the Hokage didn't know what to say. I'm so sorry Naruto-kun. Are you really? Hiruzen flinched and bowed his head in shame. He could feel the boy's cold stare. I might change my mind. Hiruzen looked at the boy hopefully. If the villagers' views change. The boy finished. I know everything, Hokage-sama. I know about that law you made. But you never enforced it. You should have done more than prevent them from talking about my status. If you're really sorry then you'll do something about the villagers. Naruto picked up his teacup and went to the kitchen. The Hokage took this as his cue to leave. I'm sorry, Naruto-kun, Minato, Kashina, Hiruzen murmured as he left. From the kitchen, Naruto heard the old man murmur his apologies. It only made him angrier. Later afternoon, Naruto was meditating when he heard a knock on the door. He created three clones and hanged them into Menma and his two bodyguards. Then he opened the door. Dodo was standing on his doorway with a big smile on his face. He was clutching a brown envelope. Good afternoon, Dodo-san. Greeted Menma. Good afternoon, Menma-sama. Here are the papers. The land and the building is now owned by Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. Good, said Naruto. Here's your payment. The boy cast a new genjutsu. This one was stronger and will last for a week. 
You will sell all your properties and give the money to me. Naruto ordered. Yes, Menma-sama. Dodo replied with a smile. He bowed and then left. What do you plan to do with the money? Asked Kasumi as Naruto dispelled the clones. Nothing for now. I just know that I'll need lots of money, not counting in my heritage. Right now I have the Lalites, then next week I'll have Dodos as well. Two weeks later, Naruto happily slurped his ramen. He now had Dodo's money from selling all his properties. He had made a clone and hanged it into him. He had the clone announce to Dodo's household that he was moving to Sunagakar, hence why he sold all his properties. Today the news of Dodo's caravan getting ambushed by bandits reached Kanahagakar. Since Dodo's cancelled his leaf citizenship to migrate to Suna, Naruto wouldn't have to worry about the Hokage making an investigation about the businessman. When the weekly synchronization occurred, Kurama let him know that the original was pleased with his work. The original was also approving of taking his supposed to be assassin's captive. During the past two weeks, there had been 49 attempts on his life. Now he had 84 souls waiting to be sacrificed. On his third synchronization with the original, he finally learned how to seal away bodies. It was a good thing too since he had two other apartment rooms filled with the bodies of his captured supposed to be killers. Now he had the bodies placed on a storage scroll. He was waiting for the original to learn sealing storage scrolls onto another storage scroll, to save space. One year later, Hokage office, Hokage-sama, after making an investigation, we have finally concluded that Taro's missing. Here is uncursed. For the past year, groups, pairs, or individuals were reported missing. As of now there were a number of 834 people confirmed missing. Taro was the newest, 563 of them were civilians, while the remaining 271 were shinobi, 46 anbu, 86 junin, 116 chunin, and 23 genin. Add him to the list. Call my secretary as you go out. The junin bowed and left. Moments later, the Sandame's secretary entered. You called, Hokage-sama. Yes, I'm going out for a while. I'm leaving my clone here. Outside the Hokage mansion, here is inside. The mysterious disappearances gave him a lot of things to think of. If it was an opposing nation behind it, then why would they also take civilians? So far there hasn't been a mob rallying about the disappearances, but he knew it would happen soon. The only suspect he has in mind was Orochimaru. The snake Sanin was the one responsible for the disappearances before the Kayubi incident. Does he know about Naruto-kun? Whether Orochimaru knows about the boy's heritage or not, the Sandame worried that the boy might be taken as well. And so he made his decision. Hiruzen began walking towards the direction of Naruto's apartment. Even though the boys expressed his distaste towards becoming a leaf shinobi, the Hokage has to try convincing Naruto to attend the academy, even if he doesn't have to graduate. As long as the Sandame's sure about the boy's safety, if he attends the academy, he will be under constant watch of the proctors. Hiruzen will be at ease. Naruto's apartment. For the past year, Naruto and the original Naruto in Uzushiogakure have been training and studying constantly. Naruto can now shadow travel on longer distances as well as control his chains better. He was now also better at understanding emotions under Kurama's teachings. His knowledge in Fuinjutsu was starting to grow. He has mastered doing the strokes for sealing and was now working on expanding his arsenal. His power over darkness also grew, making him unlock his dojutsu's second level. For his seventh birthday, Minato taught him the Rasengan. Naruto mastered it three months after. His father then insisted he learn the Horishin before he left Whirlpool. And so he and the original have started working on it. Naruto was once again meditating on his dark release. He opened his eyes when he sensed a strong chakra signature coming towards his apartment. Every month, the Hokage would visit him and talk with him about random things. Sometimes they went outside to eat. Naruto opened the door when he heard the old man knock. Hokage-sama. He greeted with his usual blank tone he used when talking to the Hokage. Hiruzen felt another pang in his heart. He was still hoping that Naruto would one day begin calling him, old man, again. Good afternoon, Naruto-kun. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, Hokage-sama. Please come in and have a seat. I'll prepare some food. The Hokage nodded gratefully and sat on the couch. 
Naruto returned from the kitchen carrying a tray with two steaming cups of ramen and two glasses of orange juice. Thank you, the Hokage said as he took a cup. They talked about random things for some time before Hiruzen decided to bring up the topic he came for. Naruto-kun, I would like to ask you again if you'd like to attend the academy. The boy didn't reply but stared at him. It made the Sandame feel uneasy. You see, even if you don't want to become Hokage, you're going to have to learn about being a shinobi. Having teachers guiding you is better than you self-studying. Why? Naruto inquired. What do you mean, why? Why tell me this now? You already know what my answer would be. There must be a reason, be honest. Tell me what made you ask me again to attend the academy. The Hokage sighed. I'm not sure if you're aware, but you see, a huge number of villagers have gone missing, disappearing without any trace. I'm worried that these mysterious kidnappers might take you too. If you attend the academy, I will be at ease knowing that you're at school from morning until afternoon. Lessening the chances of you being taken. Hum, just so you know, I can take care of myself. Setting aside this issue about people disappearing, I'm going to the academy. I have a feeling now that the proctors won't sabotage my growth and progress at learning. Naruto of course, knew why the proctors at the academy won't sabotage him. Five months after he began sealing away his supposed to be killers, the villagers have begun to notice people vanishing. They suspected it was him behind it. They figured that the demon brat was now fighting back. After that the assassination attempt's frequency lessened. Naruto just had to say something else to keep the Hokage from suspecting him. What he said was also true. Most of the shinobi he had taken were chunin, and most of them were teaching at the academy. And so he knew that the teachers at the academy this coming school year will be new and not hostile to him. However, I have a condition if I'm attending the academy. What is it? I want to be placed with last year's batch. That way my classmates will be in my age group. Your classmates will surely be jealous, Hiruzen chuckled. Then let's have a demon sealed inside them. Naruto retorted. And no, I didn't mean, sigh, I'm sorry. I was just saying they'll be jealous you didn't attend grade 1 while they did. I know that, if they're jealous, I'll find a demon for them and seal it in their gut. That way they wouldn't have to be jealous, so, do we have a deal? Yes, you'll be placed with last year's batch. I'm confident you'll be able to catch up easily. Good, we have a deal then. I'll visit you again next week while I have the papers ready. I'll be with you when you enroll. Very well, thank you. Hokage-sama. Have a great day, Naruto-kun. Hiruzen said as he left. I'm sorry. Please let me g-wark. Splat. Naruto felt awakened as the smell of blood invaded his nostrils. He just killed a group of thugs. At first, they were only trying to mug him but decided to kill him when they recognized him as the demon brat. There were five of them. Using his chains, he held them as he killed them off one by one. Releasing the first, he used his shadow manipulation and snapped his neck. Naruto killed the second by possessing his shadow and bending his body in fatal angles. The third was killed after getting impaled by multiple shadow spikes. The fourth died by having his limbs pulled simultaneously by Naruto's chains. Ignoring the last thug's pleas, Naruto forced a chain inside his victims and divided it into smaller chains, distributing to the whole body. Applying untamed wind chakra, the cells were cut by tiny wind blades until the body exploded. You're getting good with your chakra chain elemental manipulation, commented Kasumi as she appeared beside Naruto. It's only raw chakra, Naruto replied a bit sadly. I know, but what you did was like the Rasengan. Your attack used only pure raw chakra. Soon you'll be able to add nature manipulation to your chakra chains properly, just like what you're doing with the Rasengan to add your wind element. You're right. Thanks Kasumi-chan, let's go home. Which one? My parents' house, of course. One week later. Good morning Naruto-kun, are you ready? Asked the Hokage as he appeared on Naruto's apartment doorway. You're only enrolling me to the academy. There's nothing to prepare about it. Unless I'm going to take an entrance exam. Naruto deadpanned. Normally you'd have to take it, yes. But since we already know you wish to be with those of your age, you don't have to take an exam to know which level you'll be placed at. And besides, you've had home study. That's right, 
I have no intention being with kids not around my age, especially those who are older than me. They'll surely know about the demon brat. Hiruzen winced at how Naruto said the term. He could not help but look guiltily at the boy. Naruto of course noticed this and scoffed. Let's just get this over with, said the blonde. The Sandame nodded and led the seven-year-old to the academy to enroll him. As they walked past the streets, some people openly glared at the boy while others looked away in fear of getting abducted by him. The moment Naruto saw the first villager glare at him, he emanated a dark aura. Unlike the normal ki, his was cold and radiated scenes of death. Those with the weakest resolve, especially civilians, froze in fear as they saw themselves die in various, horrifying ways. Even the Hokage, the strongest in the village, felt cold and had goosebumps as he looked at the boy with worry. Just ignore them, Naruto-kun. They can only glare at you. Like hell I will. I'm not the weak boy you used to know, Hokage-sama. If they glare at me, I'll return it ten times worse with killing intent. Should they harm me physically, I'll defend myself. I'm telling you this now, Hokage-sama, I will not hesitate to kill those who will attack me. I've been reading laws and I know that people are allowed to kill in self-defense. The Hokage stopped walking, shocked at the boy's response. Would he really kill someone at his young age? Naruto noticed this but kept walking. They were near the academy now. What happened to him after that night? Has my been seeing him in secret? Is she teaching him? Thought Serutobi as he stared at the boy. He continued walking and went after the blonde. It's not impossible. He's only seven yet he already knows how to properly leak key. I would know if he's in contact with the Kyubi, his key would have leaked a malicious intent instead of cold death. We're here, Hokage-sama. Naruto interrupted him from his thoughts. Ah, right. Follow me to the office, Naruto-kun. As he followed the Sandame to the main office, Naruto noticed the proctors were looking at him neutrally except one. The man's silvery white hair was enough for the boy to remember him. That proctor was the only one with the kind of hair color, as Naruto noticed. He will have to deal with that chunin before he started the academy. They stopped walking and stopped at what Naruto assumed was the main office. After filling up some forms, the Hokage led the boy to another room. Hello, Uruka-kun, greeted the Sandame as they entered. Uruka was startled and hastily stood up, bowing. Good morning, Hokage-sama. How may I help you? Oh. I'm just introducing you to a new student who'll be with the last year's batch. Replied Hiruzen as he motioned to Naruto. Uruka frowned a bit as he recognized the boy. This of course didn't go unnoticed by his guests. Naruto stared at Uruka and returned the glare, adding some of his dark aura, making the instructor feel uncomfortable. Ehim, this is Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto, this is Uruka Yumino. He will be your class advisor. Interrupted Hiruzen. The boy stopped glaring and muttered, Nice to meet you, Uruka-sensei. Air, er, nice to meet you too, Naruto. I hope I'll be a good teacher for you. The Chunin replied awkwardly. The Hokage noticed this and dismissed Naruto. The boy shrugged and stared at a corner in the room before leaving. Hiruzen and Uruka wondered what the boy was staring at. Sensing the boy was away from the room, the Hokage began his talk with Uruka. Namikaze home, so... What did they talk about? Naruto asked aloud. Moments later, there was a shimmer as the ghost of Kasumi appeared. The Hokage just explained to Uruka that you're not the Kyubi but just its container. He also told him that you're an orphan like him. After some convincing, the Chunin finally agreed that you're innocent. Naruto laughed aloud while Kurama, who was also listening, snorted. Innocent, ha, huh? innocent my ass. I'm a seven year old and I've killed and abducted people. Yes, I'm innocent, Naruto sighed. Anyway, I would like you to go to the academy and tail that white-haired proctor to wherever the hell he lives. The ghost nodded and left to do Naruto's bidding. Three months later, Hokage's office, is it true? Asked the Sandame. A raven-masked Anbu was kneeling in front of him. Yes, Hokage-sama, my clan is feeling more and more secluded from the village due to the treatment the villagers are giving them. Some members of the police force have already considered resigning as they no longer wish to protect the village that blames them for the Kyubi attack. I see. Inform Fugaku that I'll be meeting with him. I'll be visiting the compound after my work. We'll work things out and I'll try my best to stop things before it escalates. 
Yes, Hokage-sama, Naruto's apartment. Ah, today's the day, muttered Naruto as he got out of bed. You sound excited, remarked Kurama. I am. I'll be looking for someone I can manipulate from my class. I see. You better get going then. Naruto nodded and prepared for school. Today will be his first day at the academy. He was looking forward to meet his classmates. Not that he really cared about them, but he was looking for a possible ally or asset that he could use in case he decided to leave or destroy the village. Or both. Naruto had to be careful now. Kasumi informed him that the Hokages finally suspected him, after the numerous and obvious proof that he was connected somehow with the mysterious kidnappings. Word about the demon brat, enrolling to the academy immediately spread that day. With that news, the assassination attempts on him stopped. The people who hated Naruto shifted on planning to sabotage his learning. While the Hokage was correct on having suspicions on him, Naruto knew Hiruzen was too guilty of the way he lived, hated by the whole village. And so, the old man could not just bring himself to confront the boy about the kidnappings. Like many ghosts have told him, the Sandame was too soft and no longer had the backbone for such confrontations. Back during the war, he was someone people could depend on. Now, he was letting himself get stepped on and bullied by his fellow teammates as well as other council members. Some time later, Konoha Academy, Baruka's class. All right, class, before we begin, I would like to introduce to you your new classmate. The students who were chatting with each other went silent as they watched the newcomer enter the room. This is Naruto, Baruka said as he presented the boy to the class. The students stared at the blonde. Ah sensei, is he a transferee? Asked by someone. Uh, no, he was born and grew up here. Then why didn't attend first year? demanded a boy who had a puppy on his head. Naruto has, erm, a special condition, and so he couldn't join you on the first year. He was homeschooled, Uruka replied, feeling a bit uncomfortable. Was he sick? asked another one. Uruka was about to respond when Naruto interrupted him and answered the question. No, I wasn't sick. To answer your question, I had to hide for almost two years from assassins. There were people who wanted me dead. It was only three months ago the assassinations finally stopped. Everyone stared at him in shock. Even Uruka was speechless. He didn't know about the assassinations. Hmm, Hokage-sama didn't tell me of this. I guess he wanted Naruto to be the one to tell us. I didn't expect he allowed Naruto to inform the whole class as well. Oh well, if that's what the Sandame wanted, then I shall not question him. Uruka cleared his throat to call the attention of everyone. Er. Right, anyway, Naruto, before you find yourself a seat, will you tell us your whole name, likes, dislikes, hobbies, and dreams for the future? Naruto stared at the Chunin blankly for a while, making him feel more uncomfortable. Seeing his teacher sweat bullets, he stared at the class and finally spoke. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. You'll know what I like when you get to know me, I dislike, a lot of things, my hobbies, you'll also find out eventually and as for my dream, it is to restore my clan. If you're that interested about me, do some research about the Uzumaki clan. In that way, you'll have an idea why assassins were after me, and just so you know, my mother's an Uzumaki while my father wasn't. I can't use his surname as it will double the potential of me dying from assassins. My father was the last of his clan before he died. Naruto decided that he'll tell his classmates this information, as he was sure Uruka will assume that the Hokage have already told him about his family. The Sandame will only then find out that Naruto already knew about his heritage when it was too late. When the boy's classmates figure it out and eventually spread it to the village. Deciding he had said enough, he picked the seat that was at the back, allowing him to observe his classmates. One month later, as it turned out, nobody was curious enough to do some research about the Uzumaki clan. Naruto assumed that maybe because he was still a nobody to the class. He didn't mind though, things are going to change after the first semester. After observing his classmates for a month, only two from his class piqued Naruto's interest. The first one was the class genius, Neji Hayuga, a member of the Hayuga branch family that rivaled the heiress when it came to talent. It wasn't the boy being a genius that caught Naruto's attention, however, it was the hatred and coldness radiating from him. 
The second one that caught his interest was the class clown, Sasuke Uchiha. Unlike the rest of his clan, Sasuke was loud enough to always draw attention to himself. He always shouted that he will be the first Uchiha and the best Hokage Konoha ever had. He also had the habit of cranking the villagers and getting into trouble. While Sasuke was a troublemaker, he was tied with Neji for the top student in ranking. Five months later, it was now the second term. Some of his classmates were beginning to become interested about him. Naruto was now the top of the class while Neji and Sasuke tied for second. After keeping a close eye to his two classmates, Naruto learned more about them. Now he knew the reason why Neji was hateful and cold towards everyone and especially to his cousin Hinata. Naruto personally talked with the ghost of Hizashi after seeing him occasionally inside the classroom, hovering or standing near his son. Neji simply blamed Hinata for his father's death. Aside that, he hated the main house for using the caged bird seal to enslave the branch members. As for Sasuke being different from the rest of his clan, the boy simply wanted the villagers' acknowledgement. Sasuke noticed how the villagers were cold towards his clan, but didn't know why. He was only aware that most of his kin acted arrogant and mighty. Sasuke wanted the villagers' view to their clan change, and so if he became Hokage, he thought the village will learn to accept his clan. Poor Sasuke, so naive and innocent, Naruto thought as he stared at the boy. Naruto was aware of the village's treatment towards boy's clan. He was also aware of the incoming revolt. He's heard from some of the ghosts whispering about the Uchiha planning a coup and the Hokage trying to defuse the situation. Five months later, Hokage office, it will happen tomorrow night. They've finally decided, said the raven Anbu. I see, peace talks is out of the option then. Are you sure you want to carry out plan B yourself? Asked Hiruzen. I've made my decision Hokage-sama. My loyalty is with the village, not to my clan. If I sided with them, Konoha will be in a civil war, eventually becoming weak and giving the opposing villages an opportunity to completely destroy the leaf. I cannot allow that to happen. I wish for peace, even if that peace requires me to annihilate my clan. You know what happens next. I do, Hokage-sama. My only request once I'm declared missing Nin is for you to take care of my brother Sasuke. I love him too much. I cannot bring myself to kill him. That is all Hokage-sama, I want him spared. Very well. Here is your mission scroll to make it official. You'll do it tonight. Rest assured Sasuke will be taken care of. Itachi nodded as he took the scroll then left the office to prepare for his last mission as a Konoha shinobi. Namikaze home. Afternoon time. Naruto was currently relaxing after training. He unlocked his dojutsu's third level only a week ago. Now he can command souls to do tasks that require physical contact. He was just thinking of ordering ghosts to possess people when the ghost of Kasumi appeared before him. I bring news from the Hokage's office. Itachi Uchiha has been ordered to annihilate his clan tonight. The only survivor will be his little brother, Sasuke. After she said it, a new ghost appeared. The ghost was wearing a traditional yukata with the senju symbol on the back. It will happen tonight. The third clan massacre is going to happen tonight. Kona has finally decided its third victim will be the Uchiha clan. And the massacre's going to be done by another Uchiha no less. Shouted the ghost. Naturally, this got Naruto, Kasumi, and Kurama intrigued. Explain. Ordered Naruto. The first clan massacre happened after the second war, when Kumo, Iwa, and Kiri attacked Uzushiogakur and killed everyone. Konoha was to blame for this happening, as you already know that they didn't send help. The second clan massacre happened months after the Uzumaki clan's demise. The Senju clan became angry with the current leaders for allowing it to happen. After all, the Senju had very close ties with the Uzumaki since Hashirama was married to Mito. Eventually, the higher-ups ordered the Senju clan to be massacred. The third, as you're already aware, is going to happen tonight. The Uchiha clan will be the third to fall victim to Konoha. Naruto was silent as he took in the information. He could not believe it. Konoha's higher-ups ordered for the annihilation of the three clans. If you want more detailed information, there are the scrolls regarding this hidden inside the Hokage's vault. Very well. The official report will be written tomorrow or the next day. In three days, I want you to possess the Hokage's secretary. Bring these scrolls to me. Leave the copies. 
I want the original scrolls. As you wish, Naruto-sama, replied the ghost. Before you go, tell me, who is the person tasked to do this? Itachi Uchiha, one of Konoha's elite Anbu. He wears the raven mask. However, he won't be wearing his Anbu mask on this mission. Naruto nodded as the Senju left. If Itachi's going to massacre his clan tonight, I've got to do something. Besides, it was an Uchiha that caused my parents' deaths. What do you plan to do? Asked Kasumi. Naruto simply gave her an evil smirk. You'll see, I want you beside me when the massacre happens. The boy walked to the training area and closed his eyes before calling aloud. Heed my call, souls of the departed, for I require your services. A few moments later there were shimmers around Naruto as a hundred ghosts appeared. One of them who was wearing an Anbu uniform bowed and asked, What would you like us do, Naruto-sama? The Uchiha clan will be massacred tonight. I want you all to scatter around their compound. You will be relaying messages and act as sentries. Warn me if other people aside the Uchiha are at the area. We will do as you command, Naruto-sama, replied the ghost before they shimmered out of sight. Naruto sat down and meditated. Mother, I'd like you to contact the original. I'll be needing Kagutsuchi's help. Inform them of what's going to happen tonight. Later, night time, Uchiha compound, literally blending in with the shadows, Naruto hid at the centermost part of the compound, which also happened to where the tallest building was. This allowed him to easily see what's going to happen. He still had no idea how this Itachi Uchiha looked like. He was wielding Kagutsuchi using both hands, as she was on her death scythe form. Naruto will be following Itachi's trail and collect the souls of his victims. This was to prevent the Uchihas from coming back to life in case someone uses a jutsu that can revive the dead. Only him, the son of the Shinigami, and the Shinigami herself were the only ones who can summon souls that won't receive divine punishment, as there were laws. As the hour struck exactly nine, two figures appeared. One was wearing the traditional Uchiha robes while the other was wearing complete Anbu uniform. Naruto assumed the latter was Itachi. The two began to talk. Naruto, growled Kurama. That's him. Who? That bastard's the reason why you have no parents. Naruto squinted as he stared at the man. Damn it. He cursed as he recognized Obito. I'm not yet strong enough to kill him even with you and Kagutsuchi's help. What do I do? Naruto-sama. I have a suggestion, said Kagutsuchi. What is it? Since you cannot engage him yet, you can at least place a ghost tracking seal on him for now. When you're strong enough to easily crush him, you'll be able to find him fast. A great idea, thanks, Kagutsuchi, replied Naruto as a plan immediately formed on his head. Kasumi, whispered Naruto, I want you to follow that man wearing robes. Possess one of his victims and place a tracking seal on him discreetly. Just as Naruto gave his orders, the two Uchiha jumped off opposite directions. Kasumi followed Obito while Naruto followed Itachi. Jumping into action, Naruto silently prayed to his mother to keep the Uchihas from dying and put them into a state of comatose instead. In that way he will be able to collect their souls later, as there were now two Uchiha assassins instead of one. He would be only able to collect the souls of Itachi's victims then. But with the Shinigami keeping the victims from dying, it will allow Naruto to collect their souls later. Disappearing and reappearing within the shadows, Naruto reaped Itachi's victims with Kagutsuchi, effectively binding their souls to his weapon. The silent slaughter continued for almost 30 minutes before a ghost appeared before him. It was the ghost of an Uchiha. Excuse me, Naruto-sama. I am Shisui. I came here to inform you that Danzo and 30 Root Anbu are headed towards the compound. Danzo intends to harvest all Sharingan eyes and use it for himself. Naruto nodded and noticed the ghost's eyes. They were closed and bleeding. What happened to your eyes? Danzo took them. I see. What would you like me do? You may keep them or destroy them. Very well. As much as I hate the Uchiha, stealing bloodlines is just unethical. I cannot allow that bastard take what isn't his. I'll be destroying the Uchiha eyes and recover yours. Thank you. Naruto-sama. It will take a whole day for a non-Uchiha's body to adapt with a transplanted Sharingan. Since he took both mine and were not ordinary Sharingan, it will take Danzo a full week before he could properly use the Mangekyu. Shisui said as he disappeared. Hear me and obey, 
Naruto murmured in a different language. It was the language of Yomi. Beowulf. Thirty-one creatures rose from the shadows. They looked like werewolves but were more muscular and had white spikes poking out from their bodies. The creatures were as dark as night and were only visible due to their glowing eyes. They all looked at Naruto with rapt attention. Find the root Anbu. They wear blank masks. Destroy them. Devour them. I want no evidence of their existence. The biggest one, the Alpha Beowulf, howled in a way only its kind could hear it. The other thirty howled in response and followed after their leader as it melded with the shadows to hunt for their prey. Burial, Ursa Major, Nevermore, a gorilla-like creature rose and with him were two bear-like creatures. Like the Beowulves, they were pitch black. Their armors were white and had red markings on it. Their eyes were also hollow and glowed red. Lastly, a huge demonic crow screeched as it appeared on a roof. The four creatures stared at Naruto as they awaited orders. You four will attack the man named Danzo. He has bandages on his whole upper body. Beat the man to death but keep him alive. Nevermore, make sure you pluck out his eyes and return them to me undamaged. The four creatures went off to do their task while Naruto went back to delivering the final blows to the fallen Uchiha and harvesting their souls with Kagutsuchi. Uchiha compound backside. Perfect. The slaughter has begun. Root. Take the eyes from the corpses and bring them to me. All of them. The root nodded in response as they went inside the compound, oblivious of the creatures waiting for them. Danzo greedily smiled as he approached the nearest house. He was about to crouch down and pluck out the fallen Uchiha's eyes when a large black creature appeared beside him and sent him flying towards an alley wall. The old warhawk narrowed his eyes as he looked at the gorilla-like creature. He activated his stolen Sharingan and was surprised when he found no chakra pathways or any chakra at all from his attacker. He blew out a wind jutsu as the creature charged at him. He was surprised when his attack had no effect and had to jump away to avoid getting rammed. What is this? A guardian of the Uchiha clan. Danzo thought as he noticed the creature's eyes. They were glowing red but didn't have the three tomos of the Sharingan. Is that a summoning creature with a Mangekyu? But why doesn't it have chakra? He was interrupted from his musings when he felt something approach from behind. He jumped away and found another black creature that looked like a bear. He had to jump again to avoid being clawed as another bear appeared. Airborne, he was caught off guard as he was pelted by projectiles that looked like hardened quills. Before he could land, Two sets of claws caught him and pierced his, injured, arm. He was able to look up and recognized his new attacker as a giant crow before it dived down and released him, causing him to crash to a roof and down the house. I see, so you creatures are indeed protectors of the Uchiha. Danzo said aloud as he removed the bandages on his right arm and performed hand seals for a strong wind jutsu. He was now convinced the creatures that were attacking him were keeping him from stealing the Sharingan. The Sharingan are mine, he screamed as he unleashed a wind vortex. An hour later, it was over. From a distance, Naruto was watching Itachi who was watching his little brother, who have just entered the compound. Obito have already fled the place and had no idea about the ghost tracking seal placed on him. Naruto had Shisui's eyes sealed on a special storage scroll. The root Anbu were devoured by the pack of Beowulfs. Danzo was unable to escape after sustaining heavy injuries. He was able to defeat the Burningal and two Ursa Majors creatures using Mokudan, but at the cost of his arms. The right arm that contained Hashirama's cells perished as he was unable to control its powers. His other arm on the other hand, had been torn off by the demon bear. The eyes he stole had been taken by Nevermore. Armless and blind, he had no choice but to flee, but was unable to when the Alpha Beowulf found him. He was beaten close to death's doors. Kasumi. Follow Itachi and see what he'll do to his brother. I'll see you later at my parents' house. Naruto ordered the ghost as he shadow traveled to the Namikaze house. Later, Namikaze home, Naruto sat comfortably as he stared at the eyes at the jar. Kasumi have returned a while ago and informed Naruto about the torture Itachi gave to Sasuke. Shisui just finished explaining what the Mangekyu was all about and his eyes own unique ability, the Kotoamatsukami. The Uchiha clan are now at my disposal, said Naruto as he held the Kagutsuchi scythe fondly. The one that killed my parents will be dealt when the time comes. The last one in Konoha, Uchiha Sasuke, he will be my loyal puppet. 
It has been two weeks now since the Uchiha massacre. Word have already traveled and gotten even to the farthest and isolated villages. Nobody knew why Itachi did it. The official story released by Konoha's higher-ups was that Itachi did it only to test his strength and also because he hated his clan. Kanahagakur Academy Naruto as usual was sitting at the back of the classroom, observing his classmates. It has been a week now since the so-called last Uchiha was released from the hospital. Contrary to what the village believed, Sasuke remained cheerful and was more enthusiastic learning, instead of being grumpy and broody all the time. At least, that's what Naruto thought Sasuke wanted the village to believe. After observing Sasuke for a week, he noticed that the boy was simply wearing a mask. Inside, he was still grieving and was actually angry at everyone who pitied him. Sasuke hated how the village ed up to him now that his clan was gone. He was smart. He knew they were only flocking to him because of his wealth. With him still being underage, the higher-ups were scrambling to get to the Uchiha fortune by forcing their daughters to him. Sasuke's mask sped for a moment one time when their classmate Kiba made a comment on how weak and pathetic the Uchiha clan was for being slaughtered by a single person in one night. Aside Naruto, nobody saw Sasuke's eyes morph into a fully matured Sharingan for a moment and ball his fists in anger. Back to the present time, Naruto straightened from his seat as the bell rang. He watched his classmates leave the room in groups or pairs until it was empty. Sasuke was obviously heading straight home and wasn't interested mingling with their peers. With the day being a Friday, meaning there will be no classes on the next day, Naruto melded with the shadows of the classroom to enact his plan. Later that night, Uchiha compound, Sasuke sat in the living room, sipping tea. He just come out of the bathroom after training himself to exhaustion. There was a knock on the door as he set down his cup. With caution, he walked towards the door. He had no clue who it might be, as the whole compound was rigged with traps. The compound's defensive seals were active and allowed no one without Uchiha blood to get in. Sasuke activated that seal specifically after the Danzo incident. He was surprised when he opened the door and stood face to face with the top one student in his class. Naruto was holding a scroll. Good evening Sasuke. May I enter? Asked the blonde. Befuddled, he nodded blankly and invited him inside. Have a seat. T. Naruto nodded in thanks as he accepted a cup. How are you doing? Began Naruto. Fine. You. Honestly. I'm angry towards the village. What do you mean? Why? Sasuke. Before I begin explaining, I'd like to ask you a favor. All right. As long as I can do it, then yeah, I'll agree. What is it? Asked Sasuke cheerfully. It's simple. Really. When it's only the two of us, I want you to drop the mask said Naruto as he put down his cup and stared at Sasuke, who frowned. I don't know what you're talking about. Listen, I know you hate the village. I've witnessed how they seemed to up to you after the incident. Back when your clan still lived, the whole village ignored you. They hated you for your pranks. They hated you for proclaiming that you want to become Hokage, you hate them. You hate Kiba for insulting your family. You hate Itachi for killing your family. We're not so different. After all, we're both the last survivors of our clan. Naruto then laid the scroll on the table and unsealed it. Five folders appeared. He picked the one on top and handed it to Sasuke. What's this? Open it. Find out. Still confused, Sasuke opened the folder and began to read. Name. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. Status. Kayubi Jinchiriki. Grade 2 Academy Student. Parents. Minato Namikaze, Konoha's Yellow Flash, Yandaimi Hokage, deceased. Kashina Uzumaki Namikaze, Whirlpool Princess, former Kayubi Jinchiriki, deceased. Godparents. Makoto Uchiha and Jiraiya of the Sanin. Assigned Guardians. Makoto and Fugaku Uchiha, deceased. Age. 8. Height. 3 feet 7 inches. Eye color. Light blue. Hair color. Blonde. Unique features description has three whisker marks on each cheek, a birthmark that he got from his mother for being a Kayubi Jinchiriki. Abilities. Uzumaki Quick Healing. To be found out. Uzumaki Longevity. To be found out. Jinchiriki Powers Currently Dormant. Rating. Currently at low genin. Sasuke was silent for a few minutes as he finished reading. He stared at Naruto and then at the folder. And then at Naruto again. 
You, back when you introduced yourself in class, you said that your father was also the last of his clan, and that you had to use your mother's surname for your safety, because your father was the Yandaimi Hokage. Sasuke felt like hitting himself. Of course, he exactly looks like his father. Why didn't I see it before? He stopped when he remembered some of the important details in the folder and decided to ask the blonde. Naruto, it says here that your mother was a former and you're the current Kayubi Jinchuriki. What exactly is a Kayubi Jinchuriki? Jinchuriki, it literally means power of human sacrifice. Jinchuriki are humans who have tailed beasts inside them. There is a total of nine Jinchuriki, as there are nine tailed beasts. You have a demon sealed inside you. Sasuke almost shouted. Yes, oh, Sasuke was again silent for a minute before he spoke again. It also says here that Ka Chan was your godmother, but why didn't you live with us? Why didn't my parents adopt you? They were your assigned guardians. What do you know about the Jinchuriki and the Mangeku Sharingan? Naruto asked. I just found out about Jinchuriki now. I do not know anything about the Mangeku Sharingan, I only know that it's a next stage after the normal Sharingan's three tomo. Itachi had it, I didn't know the two were connected. I won't be explaining everything about the Mangeku to you, since I'm not an Uchiha. You'll be the one to learn about it. What I know is it can control tailed beasts. Eight years ago, on October the 10th, my mother, who was currently the Kayubi Jinchuriki that time, was giving birth to me. Only a few seconds after I was born, an Uchiha appeared inside the birthing room. This room, mind you, was miles away from Konoha, and was heavily guarded by Anbu. You see, when a female Jinchuriki gives birth, the seal that holds the tailed beast significantly weakens. And so that is why my mother had to be miles away from the village just in case the Kayubi breaks free. Back to the story, a few seconds after I was born, a masked Uchiha managed to infiltrate the heavily guarded room and slaughter the doctors and nurses. One of the nurses was the Sandame's wife. The Uchiha managed to snatch me from my parents and planted bombs all over my body. I was tossed upwards to die but my father caught me. While my father was removing the bombs from me and tucking me in a safe house, the Uchiha used the distraction to free the Kayubi Jinchuriki from my mother. The Uchiha, you see, was unlike the rest, for he had the Mangeku. He used his eyes and ordered the Kayubi to attack the village. Thousands have died before the Yandaimi was able to reseal the Kayubi inside a new host, me. During the sealing, the Uchiha tried to stop it by ordering the Kayubi to kill me. My parents got in the way and got impaled by the demon's claw. While they were dying, they managed to subdue the Kayubi and release it from the Uchiha's control. The Uchiha fled while I became the third Kayubi Jinchuriki. After that, the Sandame was forced to retake the mantle of current Hokage. Of course, he was also the one responsible letting an S-class secret spill. You see, Jinchuriki's identities were normally kept secret. My mother's status was kept secret. Mine, however, was spilled. The whole village knows about it. As the village recovered, they decided to take their hate on a boy, the one who reminded them about that dreadful night. The whole village decided that I was the Kayubi incarnate, while I'm only its container. You wondered why your mother never adopted me although she was my godmother, she had no choice but to avoid me, you see. The whole village found out about the Uchiha's capability to control a tailed beast using the Sharingan. The whole village, being the idiots, suspected your clan. Your father was clan head. If your parents adopted me, then the whole village will know. They will even more suspect that your clan was behind the attack eight years ago. The one responsible for this mess, was a rogue Uchiha. He or she never lived in Konoha. The village however, wouldn't believe this and insisted that your clan wanted to destroy the village. You know about your clan and the Senju's history, right? And you also know about Madara and Hashirama. Sasuke nodded dumbly as he processed this newfound information. Naruto refilled his cup and drank while he waited for Sasuke. After a few minutes, Naruto picked up another folder and handed it to the Uchiha. This one's from me, the information there are the ones I have about them so far, I'm still working on getting more. There were only four pages. Each page had a name of a person and a picture and a short description. Sasuke read, Here is Nseru Tobi, Danzo Shimura, Kaharu Yudatame, Homura Mitokado. These four old fossils are the reason why we're the last of our clans. 
said Naruto as he picked up the three remaining folders. What I'm about to give you is very confidential. These three folders contain the copies from Konoha's vault of SS ranked classified secrets and missions. Only those four old Urs know of this. I'm giving these copies to you as I already have mine. Make sure you hide it well when you're not reading it. I'd suggest using a blood scroll. Sasuke nodded and accepted the folders with shaking hands. He gulped as he opened them and made a quick scan of its contents. The first clan massacre. The Uzumaki clan. The second clan massacre. The Senju clan. The third clan massacre. The Uchiha clan. Sasuke's throat dried as he read aloud. What the hell? He gasped as he gaped at Naruto and then at the folders. Naruto remained silent and had an impassive look while he waited for the Uchiha to read the folders. The Uzumaki Clan Massacre Description Under attack by the kumo Iwakiri Alliance, the Uzukage sent an envoy to Konoha to ask for reinforcements. Kanahagakur was a long-standing ally of Uzushiogakur. The envoy sent by Whirlpool was assassinated by Konoha's root Anbu led by Danzo Shimura while the Anbu Black Ops were held back by Kaharu Yudatane and Homura Mitokado to prevent them from assisting Uzushiogakur. Ordered and signed by Danzo Shimura, Kaharu Yudatane, Homura Mitokado, and Hiruzen Serutobi. Mission executed by Anbu Black Ops by not going to Whirlpool to assist and root Anbu for killing the Uzumaki emissary. Mission reward. A young Kashina Uzumaki, Whirlpool Princess, seeking refuge in Konoha. The Leaf gained a Jinchuriki they can control as well as the Fallen Villages, Whirlpool's various treasures. The Senju Clan Massacre Description A few weeks after the Uzumaki Massacre, the Senju Clan displayed their dismay and disappointment to Konoha's higher-ups for not assisting their ally, Uzushiogakur. A few months later, the Senju Clan eventually found out why Konoha didn't assist Uzushio. The Leaf had the Whirlpool Princess under their control. The Senju clan planned to keep the Uzumaki Princess from being controlled but were massacred four months after the Uzumaki clan's demise. The Anbu Black Ops along with the Root Anbu were ordered to annihilate the Senju but kept Tsunade, the princess, alive. The official reason used by the higher-ups were, the Senju clan was planning to overthrow the leadership and lead the village into a civil war. Ordered and signed by Danzo Shimura Kaharu Yudatane, Homura Mitokado, and Hiruzen Serutobi. Mission executed by Anbu Black Ops and Root Anbu. Mission reward. Tsunade Senju, Senju Princess, and the Senju Clan's riches. The Uchiha Clan Massacre. Description. Eight years after being isolated from the whole village due to the Kayubi incident, the Uchiha Clan head, Fugaku, orated a coup d'etat. The planned revolt was revealed by Konoha's spy, Uchiha Itachi an Uchiha who hates his own clan and sees them as arrogant and violent people. In order to avoid Konoha's downfall, the Uchiha clan had to be crushed, with Sasuke being the only survivor. Ordered and signed by Hiruzen Serutobi, Danzo Shimura, Kaharu Yudatame, Homura Mitokado, and Itachi Uchiha, signed. Mission executed by Itachi Uchiha to join the organization Akatsuki after and pretend as an S-ranked criminal while working undercover. Mission reward. Village peace. Why? Sasuke asked, his voice cracking due to heavy emotion. Those four are corrupted, Sasuke. They've tasted power and do not wish to step down. They think that whatever they're doing is right for the sake of the village. They will destroy anything that crosses their paths. Said Naruto as he stood up. I'll be returning tomorrow. Sasuke didn't stand up and simply let Naruto open the door and leave. As the door closed, he finally broke down crying. Naruto's hotel, former apartment. Naruto sat on his customized leather couch. Due to him, inheriting the dead merchant's wealth, and many more victims, he now had the resources to refurbish the simple-looking apartment into a high-class hotel. The six top-most floors have been converted into a penthouse for him. The building had a total of 21 floors. So that left 15 floors to customers. He took a sip from his juice bottle as he contemplated the events earlier. His plan to make the last Uchiha loyal to him have finally been set in motion. With the documents he provided, Sasuke will eventually come to hate the village even more and finally halt his idea of becoming a Hokage. Naruto have added minor changes to the documents before he gave it to Sasuke. The approval of Hiruzen Serutobi for the massacre of the Uzumaki and Senju, 
for one, was fake. The truth was that the old monkey didn't know the truth about the massacre of the two clans. He didn't know that the three elders ordered for their annihilation until it was too late. But Sasuke doesn't have to know about that, thought Naruto. The Sandame Hokage was a spineless leader and would allow his former teammates step on him. He gave them free reign and allowed them to gain more power, instead of executing them for high treason, for acting without his consent, and for committing mass murder. At least for the Uchiha massacre his backbone regrew and he ordered for the clan's demise. The other addition Naruto made to the documents was Itachi's views towards his clan. Itachi didn't really hate his clan. He simply loved peace. Participating the Second Shinobi War made him a pacifist. Itachi didn't want the village fall because of the coup. It will still happen anyway. This goddamn village will fall. But then again, Sasuke doesn't have to know about that. Finishing his drink, he picked up a crystal that was lying on top of his huge table. It was an amethyst as big as a normal scroll. A soul gem, mused Naruto as he studied the crystal. It was a prototype that he just finished creating that morning before he went to the academy. Naruto had to ask the original in Uzushiogakure to learn about sealing souls. After the Uchiha massacre, he decided that he needed to learn to put dying people into stasis so that he could harvest them for later when he's needed on two places at once. Naruto didn't want to bother his mother like last time. Should a similar event occur, a clone of himself could use the soul gems to harvest souls while the original used Kagutsuchi. The clone or clones could just transfer the collected souls later to the weapon. Right now the soul gem can only contain the souls of civilians. Naruto was still working on making it possible for the crystals to hold souls of people with chakra. He will start with learning how to trap Genin's souls first before he went on going after cage level shinobi. Naruto stood up and pocketed the gem. It had been two weeks since the last time he committed murder. It was time for fun. Besides, he needed to test if the soul gem was working. Not bothering to use the stairs, he stepped into the shadows and traveled. Streets of Konoha, in a dark alley ten blocks away from the hotel, Naruto appeared and was visible for a moment before he melded with the shadows. Nighttime was when thugs and lowlifes lurk the streets and wait for hardworking people to rob. It only took less than a minute before Naruto heard someone's cries for help. He recognized the voice of a girl's. Still hidden in the shadows, he followed the source. Naruto's face morphed into confusion as he saw a girl about his age being manhandled by a man wearing a business suit. Your daddy won't be able to save you now, you little. You're in our territory. Don't worry though, I'll make your death quick. When I present your corpse to the boss head, I'll be recognized as a hero in the family. I will be promoted, said the gangster. Damn, I came here to find a volunteer for my soul gem project, not to save someone from these thugs. They could kill themselves for all I care. This sure as hell won't become a habit, thought Naruto in irritation as he sent a thick tendril of shadow and impaled the mobster in the. The girl shrieked in surprise and not in fear as blood splattered on her dress. She stepped backwards as her captor fell to the ground gurgling in blood. Naruto calmly walked towards the downed man and pulled out the soul gem from his pocket. He tossed the jewel against the gangster and formed a single hand seal. The thirteenth hand seal that the Shinigami used. Soul Trap. The alley became illuminated with purple light as the gem glowed and connected to the dying man. A thin line appeared as the mobster's soul moved towards the amethyst stone. The gem pulsed three times before the light finally died out. Soul Trap Success. Great work, Naru kun. Shinigami sama will be proud. Praised Kurama. I've got to work on getting rid of that light though. Have to be discreet when trapping people's souls especially when I need to do it in public, muttered Naruto, ignoring the girl who was gawking at him. The boy picked up the soul gem and noticed the color have turned into a darker shade of purple. Good, at least I would be able to tell an empty soul gem to a full one. A, A no, I, croaked the girl Naruto just saved, interrupting him from his thoughts. Th thank why you for saving my life. Oh, it's no trouble, really. You're strong, said the girl. You defeated him in one move. He's an assassin, did you know that? Him? Really? Yeah. I'm Yugido, by the way. Daddy told me not to talk with strangers and tell them my name. But you saved my life. So it's just right for me to tell you. I'm Yugito Karama. 
Kurama, are you somewhat related to the fox? The girl interpreted Naruto's question in a different manner and giggled. Oh yes, the fox is my daddy. He's the head of the Kurama family. Oh right, she's a civilian. She wouldn't know about the Kyubi, thought Naruto. Who are you? asked the girl. I'm Naruto, said the boy, offering his hand. Naruto what? I'm Yugito Kurama. Do you have a surname? I would like to know. Daddy will reward you for saving my life. Come with me. The girl rattled on, taking Naruto's hand. Not bothering about his last name anymore. The next day, Uchiha compound. So, what do you think? Asked Naruto as he accepted a glass of orange juice from Sasuke. I think that Itachi's a traitor. The village already knows that. Hell, the whole elemental nations knows. No, I mean, he's a traitor to his family. He chose Konoha over the Uchiha clan. He allowed himself to be used by the village as a spy. I would understand if he chose to become neutral. But no, he had to kill everyone. That little act he did to me before he left, it wasn't an act of mercy. It was just for show so I'd think he spared me when the truth was he had been ordered to keep me alive. So, what are you going to do? I owe you, Naruto. I owe you for telling me the truth. If you want, I'm offering you my help. You can train in the Uchiha training grounds with me. Nobody else can enter the compound without my permission. I'm guessing that my parents probably keyed you in so you can enter since they're officially your guardians. You can live here with me, since we're technically brothers due to my mother being your godmother, we will train hard. When the time comes, I will help hunt that rogue Uchiha after I kill Itachi. And before you think so, no, I do not hate you. I do not blame you for my clan being ostracized by the village. You and I are both victims. We are the last of our respective clans. What about the village? What are your views to it now? Still want to be Hokage? Not anymore. I hate this village and everyone in it. Konoha deserves to burn. Naruto smiled. Good. Then it's time for you to know who I really am, aside from being the son of the Yandaimi Hokage and the Whirlpool heiress. Daddy will reward you for saving my life. Come with me. The girl rattled on, taking Naruto's hand. Not bothering about his last name anymore. Naruto allowed himself to be dragged away from the alley. Only two blocks from the area where he saved Yugito, they were found by men wearing expensive suits. Each of them had a lapel pin of a blue fox on their suits, and were armed with katanas. Yugito-sama, there you are. One of them said, I'm alright, I was found by one of the nameless family's assassins, but Naruto here saved me. Naruto noticed that the men were looking at him with respect. Not for once they never looked at him with hatred or fear when they found them. We thank you for saving the heiress. The same man said as he bowed, the others doing the same. Naruto wasn't sure how to react so he just nodded. The leader of the group took out a radio and spoke to it in coded voices, after a while, he nodded at the others and at Naruto. The boss would like to see you. Please. The man said as he indicated at a carriage, at which Naruto just noticed. There were three. He and Yugito were helped into the middle one. The ride to the Kurama mansion took about 10 minutes. About 3 minutes in the ride, Naruto heard more the clops of horses and looked from the window and found 6 more carriages flanking them. 3 on the front, 3 on the back, and the other 2 earlier were at each side. Naruto, I think you just made a jackpot. Indeed, these people don't seem to know me as the village Jinchuriki. They didn't show any form of recognition when they saw me with the girl. I'm curious about them, a family name with the name of Kurama. And the sigil of a blue fox. So am I, let's see how this goes. I might gain a good ally with their family. Kurama Mansion, Yugito happily dragged Naruto inside the mansion as they went off the carriage. They were greeted by more people wearing the same suit as the ones who found them earlier. Naruto found himself staring in amazement as they entered the living room. The mansion was huge, but the inside seemed bigger. The tapestries in the walls showed different animals. Behind where Naruto assumed was Yugito's father, the drawings were of tailed beasts. His eyes remained on the Kyubis. The family head noticed him staring at the drawings and smiled. Beautiful, aren't they, especially the fox? Naruto focused his attention at the man and smiled. Yes, sir. You may call me Rikodo, ah. Naruto, sir, right. Naruto-san, you may call me Rikodo. 
It isn't my actual name, but Rado. They just call me that because of my beautiful daughter here. I am forever grateful to you for saving my only daughter's life. Rikodo's the name of the sage, stated Naruto, who was somewhat confused. Indeed, and my precious Yugido here. You two are deities, Naruto's eyes widened. Rikodo, Yugido, and some of the men in the room chuckled. No, Naruto-san, you see, my daughter here is special. Realization dawned on him. Naruto faced Yugido, you're like me. Everyone in the room went silent. What did you just say? Asked Rikodo. She's like me, a host, indeed. The man leaned forward, intrigued. Yes, sir, you didn't know, we didn't, but the whole village knows. Hmm, this is going to be interesting. We'll continue this conversation at the dining table. Please, follow me, I'm sure you're hungry. As they ate, Naruto informed them that he was the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails. He then found out Yugido was the Jinchuriki of the Two-Tailed Cat. You see, we just moved in here two weeks ago. We originally were from the Hidden Hot Springs. My daughter was kidnapped by Kumo Nin and made her Jinchuriki. We were able to take her back to the village after losing some of my men. After that I raised the security to ten and also hired ninja. For months, Kumo would send kidnappers about every ten days while my men killed them. Eventually it got annoying, so we moved to the hidden waterfall. We stayed there for two months. We moved out when we found out how the whole village treated their Jinchuriki. I see, you won't be staying here long then, Naruto said. At their confused expressions he began telling them about his life in Konoha. I'd love to see this village burn to the ground, watch as their clan members die painfully, scream at the top of their lungs and beg for mercy. Mercy that they didn't grant me and my clan. Why are you still here then? Naruto did not respond but only grinned evilly. The guards who were watching and listening into their conversation felt chills creep up their spine. I'm not sure if I'm going to tell you yet. I understand, Rikodo replied seriously. Perhaps I could earn some more of your trust if I told you now that I'd reward you anything you'd like for saving my daughter. Hmm, that sounds good. Are you sure though, anything? Yes, as long as what you ask is humanely possible. What do you want then? Oh, it's simple. I'd like to make a proposal with your family. Rikodo raised an eyebrow. I'm a powerful shinobi. While I'm still only an academy student, my skills are already on par with the chunin of this godforsaken village. I'm especially great with Fuinjutsu, and will become a sealing master in a few years. I'm secretly one of the rich people here. I own a five-star hotel and will be constructing another one soon. Your family can take headquarters there. If you wish to stay, my hotel's the safest place. You won't have to worry about your daughter getting kidnapped again. I will also be teaching her the shinobi arts. Who knows, I might also teach her more than that. After all, I'm the host of the strongest tailed beast. You have a good offer. What do you want in return? In return, I'd be able to command your men. If there's some business to I wish to be taken care of, I'd be able to count on them. Also, the one who's training Yugido will also teach me the way of the sword. And finally, I will have the allegiance of the Kurama family. The head was silent, so Naruto went on, I may be only eight, but I know how adults think. I also know what syndicate organizations do. I have my own share of dirty doings. I'll have no problems telling you about some of them. But of course, you're going to have to agree to my proposal first. Rikudo chuckled. You know, I honestly thought you'll ask for a marriage contract with my daughter. I have no interest with that kind of thing yet. Perhaps when I'm older, I might ask for your beautiful daughter's hand. Naruto smirked as Yugido blushed. Normally, a head of an organization will decline that kind of offer. But since I told you I'd do anything you'd ask as long as it was possible, I will have to honor my word. You offer a good bargain, and I know these kind of things don't present itself every day. Also, it would be very beneficial and would bring more power to our family's name with you as one of its figureheads, with being the host of the Kayubi, whose name also happened to be Kurama. I accept your proposal. Very well. Naruto nodded as he shook hands with Rikudo. We can formalize everything tomorrow afternoon. Here is the address of the hotel. I'll have the papers and rooms ready. We're already moving in. Asked Yugido. Of course. Now that we're allies, your safety is now our first priority. The sooner you move in the hotel, the better. 
We never know when your biju might act up and cause you to get discovered. You haven't bonded with it yet. My place has seals that prevents all strong chakra signatures from being felt. You talk as if you don't need protection. Yugito pouted. Naruto smiled at her. You've seen me murder that man earlier. Trust me, I am capable of defending myself. Should I face an opponent stronger than me, I have the means to escape. You'll know more about me tomorrow. I'll be taking my leave. Thank you for having me in your home. Naruto stood up and bowed. No, Naruto-san, it is you that we should thank. Rikudo said as he also stood and bowed. Naruto shook hands with the boss and his daughter before he was escorted outside into the same carriage he rode earlier. During the ride, he took out his now-filled soul gem and smiled. A good night. Well done, Naruto, said Kurama before she went to sleep. The next day, present time, Uchiha compound, I see dead people, said Naruto. Sasuke blinked. In your dreams? Nope. While you're awake? Yep. Sasuke was confused. Dead people, like, in graves? In coffins? Naruto nodded. How often do you see them? Every time I kill someone, Naruto replied, laughing evilly. Sasuke laughed weakly. He felt uncomfortable. But seriously, Sasuke. I see them. I see souls. I was blessed by death, by the Shinigami. How? It all happened during the resealing of the Kayubi. My father used the Shiki Fujin, and so Naruto told Sasuke how his mother became the next host for the Shinigami, how she saw Naruto's future, and what powers she blessed him. He didn't tell the Uchiha about his dojutsu, no that will be his secret. Naruto only told Sasuke that he could see souls and command them. That information was enough to frighten the boy. That knowledge shall also make him more loyal to the blonde. Sasuke will be extra wary of betraying Naruto. I believe you. I guess that explains now how you know and access things that are very guarded, said Sasuke, remembering the files the blonde gave him. Exactly, replied Naruto, smiling. So, uh, what do we do now? For now we train. But before we do that, we're going to exterminate a certain thief who's being held prisoner, before he roots his way out. Root, Danzo? Yes. Wait, you said exterminate? Yes. We're going to kill someone. Yes, we are. He committed great offense to both our clans. He tried to steal from yours. He needs to die. You shall be the one to kill him. Kill? We're only eight. We're already eight. Naruto corrected. And I made my first kill when I was seven. Naruto then left the compound without sparing a glance at the horrified boy. The next day Naruto's hotel it was now afternoon and the Kurama family have just settled down to the hotel. Rikudo, Yugito, and the rest of the Kurama family were now occupying the rooms below Naruto's penthouse. Naruto was currently reviewing documents and land titles. He just finished. Convincing. The owner of the apartment next to his hotel to sell it to him. The building's demolition was scheduled to begin immediately on the next day. The hotel that will be built next to it will be the official headquarters of the Kurama family once finished. Putting the folders away, he pulled a crate under his table and placed it on the desk. It was a small crossbow. Rikodo presented it to him earlier that morning. The weapon was new and was set to be sold on the market next month. The organized crime's connections with the black market allowed them to acquire thousands of it before its release. The crossbow was small enough to be concealed within the sleeves, since it was mainly built for stealth. Naruto was currently studying it and planned to make it semi-automatic. Instead of having to reload every shot, risking it to be discovered by non-users, he planned to attach a scroll with it that contains the bolts. At every shot, the seal in the scroll will activate and drop a bolt to the crossbow's body, thus allowing a faster reload time while maintaining hidden. After shooting some rounds to test the weapon, he put it back the crate and stood up. It was still early and so he decided to seal some souls. He have almost forgotten about those people he put in sealing scrolls. Those were the ones who tried to kill him when he moved into his apartment now hotel. They were still alive but were in comatose. It was time for them to die. When he kept those people, he was still weak and didn't have enough mastery of his dark element and wasn't able to seal souls to Kagutsuchi yet. Now with two years of proper training, he can now use the weapon and seal souls to it. He'd already done it last week during the Uchiha massacre. Time to seal those bodies. He could feel it, 
His grasp with his dark element was getting stronger. Soon, his Kuragan dark eye will enter the fourth stage, where he will be able to resurrect people from the dead. Later that night, Uchiha compound. Ready? asked Naruto. Sasuke nodded and steeled himself, although Naruto could sense his nervousness. Here, Naruto offered Kagutsuchi, in the form of a katana, to Sasuke. It's so cold, Sasuke mumbled as he grasped the sword's hilt. It is. The blonde nodded. This is Kagutsuchi. She's a sentient sword. Normally, anyone who handles her except me dies. Tonight, I'm allowing you to wield her. You'll be the one to deliver the killing blow to Danzo. All right. So what's the plan? Since he's only accused of thievery, Danzo's located at the prison's second level. He has his own cell separated from the other prisoners. Damn bastard has a VIP treatment, huh? Anyway, his trial is scheduled tomorrow. The ghosts tell me that his root agents plan to break him out at 10 this evening. We'll wait out with the ghosts acting as lookouts. As soon as the agents arrive, I want you to cause a distraction while I free Danzo from his cell. We'll leave the prison soon as the guards spot us with the bastard, we're wearing root uniform. Here. After changing into root outfit, Sasuke nodded to Naruto. Well then, grab my arm. We're traveling to the bastard's cell floor. Konohagakure prison second level the two were currently hidden in the shadows. Sasuke was near the stairs while Naruto was in front of the separate cell, watching Danzo who was pretending to be asleep. There here, Kasumi's head appeared out of a wall. Naruto sent a shadow tendril to tug at Sasuke, signaling to begin. The Uchiha stepped out of the shadows and spewed three fireballs in succession, startling the guards. The other prisoners cried out in panic calling the attention of more guards. Danzo immediately stopped feigning sleep and stood up. Agent stepped out of the wall opposite his cell and walked towards him, already holding a key. The cell door opened but Danzo found himself unable to move. He was confused for a few moments before he felt chains wrap his body. Since he was still blind, he had no idea what was happening. Valley of the End, Naruto, Sasuke, and Danzo reappeared on top of Madara Uchiha's head. The boys removed their root mask and stared at their eyeless captive. Danzo felt the prison's coldness creep away that was replaced by chilly winds. He tried to feel his surroundings and felt small droplets of water touch his body. Nearby, he could hear the strong sound of water falling down. He tried to concentrate and got himself a headache instead. He realized he was dangling upside down. Hello. Naruto greeted cheerfully. We'll make the introductions quick. I'm Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, Lord of Whirlpool. My friend here is Sasuke Uchiha, future clan head. You see, we're both last members of our clan that you ordered to be eliminated. You stole my cousin's eyes and tried to steal more from my clan. Said Sasuke, his guilty feeling of having to kill rapidly subsiding as his rage increased. Right. Now that introductions are over, I will begin tonight's show. Sasuke, Kasumi, Shisui, and everyone else, watch closely. Ghosts shimmered in existence, to Naruto, anyway, and surrounded the three living humans. Naruto took out a pliers from his vest. He walked closer and willed his chains to hold out Donzo's hands. Naruto placed Donzo's left thumb inside the pliers and snapped the nail. Danzo bit his due to the sudden pain, causing it to bleed. Naruto pulled the tool away and placed it to the old man's forefinger next. Danzo felt his fingernail get crushed and whimpered. Naruto proceeded with the third finger. Danzo finally cried out. How dare you? Do you know who I am? I'm Danzo Shimura. My root agents will hunt you down for this. Naruto ignored him and continued doing it to the rest of the man's fingernails. When he was done, Danzo was already panting from shouting. Torture won't work on me. I won't tell you a damn thing. Naruto laughed in delight as he stared at the man's bloody fingers. Sasuke watched in horrified fascination. Who said we were torturing you for information? This is just plain torture, Danzo Chan. Some may call it petty revenge on you for being responsible for the annihilation of our clans, but it's still payback. Naruto proceeded to snap Danzo's toenails next, causing him to cry out even more. Sasuke no longer felt sorry for the old man. Hum, Sasuke. Wanna try? Naruto asked as he sealed the pliers away and took out a hammer. What do I do? Asked the Uchiha as he came forward. 
Use the hammer to crush his fingers, hands, and toes. Take your time. Make it slow. We want him to suffer. Naruto replied as he handed the boy the hammer. Go on. Your parents are watching you. They're here, urged the blonde. Sasuke nodded and began hammering the old man's body parts. Each hit made crunching sounds as bones were fractured, crushed, and splintered. You're doing great. Your parents are smiling, said Naruto. Sasuke swelled in pride and continued to hammer with renewed vigor. When he finished, Donzo's voice was already hoarse due to the screaming. He couldn't access his chakra to heal himself since it was sealed, or so he thought. Little did he know, Naruto's unique chakra chains were absorbing his chakra and was preventing his system from releasing more. Combined with the blonde's sealing abilities, Danzo found it difficult to escape, as he was still weakened after battling those creatures as well as losing his Mokaton injected arm. The DNA of the Shodem gave him a healing boost. But those cells were gone. Hum, tired already. Naruto's voice awakened Danzo, who was now half asleep. Naruto untightened the chains and dropped him to the ground. He produced a sledgehammer from his scroll and swung it down. Wake up! Danzo cried out in pain as Naruto smashed his right knee. You bastard! You think you'll be able to activate your seals? No ing way! I'm suppressing them! I'm An Uzumaki. I'm a member of the clan you destroyed. Naruto screamed in rage as he shattered the other knee. Ah, roared Naruto as he smashed the old man's collarbone. He then resealed the tool and stepped back. Do it. He whispered to the Uchiha. Sasuke nodded, stepped forward and raised Kagatsuchi. This is for the Uchiha. He cried as he cleaved Danzo from head to toe. Afterwards, the weapon's red eyes began to glow. Sasuke had to drop it as it became very cold. Naruto took out a new scroll and sealed Danzo's corpse in it and then picked up Kagatsuchi. Sasuke watched in amazement as the katana morphed into a scythe. Naruto looked like a reaper. It is done. Whispered Sasuke. One down, three to go. Naruto replied and placed a hand on the boy's shoulder and shadow traveled. Naruto dropped off Sasuke to the Uchiha compound and proceeded to his family home. The following day Namikaze home Naruto was on his father's study room and had prepared a dozen brushes, bottles of ink, and hundreds of scrolls. He was at the center of the room and was wielding Kagatsuchi, who was in her original weapon form. A reinforced clone made from his dark chakra was standing in front of him. Naruto was holding the claymore with the blade tipped down. He raised the weapon and then stabbed the ground. The eyes inscribed on the blade glowed and moments later, Danzo's soul came pouring out. How may I serve you, Naruto-sama? asked the ghost. I want you to possess this clone and write on the scrolls everything about you. You will write everything you've experienced from childhood up until you died. You will write all your secrets, your plans, and everything about root organization. You will not miss a single detail. I want all information you know. I will do as you ask, Naruto-sama, Danzo said in a monotone. Naruto nodded as the ghost possessed the clone and began writing. A gate guard ghost phased out from the room's door and kneeled in front of Naruto. Naruto-sama, a group from Kurigakur have entered the village. One of them has cage level reserves. I see, I'd like to know why. At that moment, a Kiri Junin ghost appeared. The ghost began telling him of Kiri's bloodline purges and now current civil war. I see, so this made Terumi have come to ask Konoha for aid. Yes, Naruto grinned, the time has come for him and the original to become one again. Konoha was in an uproar. A known bloodline thief have escaped prison. The clan heads had been demanding the Hokage for a meeting. They were, of course, wary of being attacked by Donzo's organization and have their bloodlines stolen. Hiruzen was having more problems though. Due to the incident last night, they weren't able to read a message sent to them by Kiri stating of their arrival so he was surprised when his anbu alerted him of their arrival. Hokage's office, forgive me for not being able to receive you properly. The village has been in an uproar since last night and I'm still looking into things, bowed Hiruzen. I understand, Hokage-sama, nodded Mei. Now, let us get straight to things, if you don't mind. What business do you have with Konoha? I'm sure you've heard of the ongoing problem with Kiri. If not, then you would have heard about it sooner if I haven't told you. You seek Konoha's aid then. I assume you're the leader of the opposition. Would you require supplies, fighters, or both? I only require fighters, 
We have enough supplies. I see. When do you think the big confrontation will happen? In about eight months. If we get enough people fast, then it will be in six months. I see. That's enough answer then. May raised an eyebrow. You see, Kona has been having difficulties, aside from the recent Uchiha massacre. Quite a number of my nin have gone missing. It began almost two years ago. Last night, our main suspect of these disappearances have escaped prison. Hiruzen decided he'll put the blame on Danzo and didn't mind if it went public knowledge. It would be the best, actually. After all, it wouldn't do well if the other villages found out that Konoha's own Jinchuriki have been killing people from its own village. Besides, the Sandame was still feeling guilty towards the young orphan. So he really couldn't find himself to blame him. I see. So, could I expect reinforcements from the leaf? The answer is a maybe. If we'll be able to produce many new nin then it won't be a problem. I shall send you a message if we could spare some people over to help. If you don't hear from us in six months, then I ask for your pardon. I understand, Hokage-sama. Both of our village are facing difficult times. Indeed. Hiruzen nodded sadly. I shall be going then. We still have to look for more possible help. Mei said as she stood up. As Mei left the room, the Kiri Junin ghost also left to report about the meeting. Later, at Naruto's hotel. I see. That's good then. My soul gems should be able to absorb Junin ranked souls by that time, and also discreetly. I still have to work on the light the crystal produces whenever a soul is trapped. Would you like me to follow Mei and her group, Naruto sama? asked the ghost. That would be best. nodded Naruto. Mother, what should I do? You better ask Mito's ghost. She knows Kirigakure more than I do. Right, Kagutsuchi. To me, there was a ripple on the ground where a claymore rose. Naruto picked the sword up and channeled his dark chakra, concentrated on shadow traveling. He still needed three jumps before he was able to reach Whirlpool. His dark chakra pool still has to grow. Uzushiogakur ruins. Welcome back. The original is underground. The seals to block off chakra from being sensed outside have been prepared. Greeted the last Uzukage. Mito sama and the other Uzukages are also there. Later, when the merging was done, Naruto could be found at the office of the Uzukage. He was talking with all the past leaders of Whirlpool. Welcome back. How do you feel? Stronger. And after some short meditation, I can tell that my chakra increased by 30%. Karamas also increased by 10%. How is that possible? The Izukages only smiled, before Naruto smiled as well and nodded. Of course, Fuinjutsu. Now, young prince, you wish to ask about Kiri? Yes. Wait, prince? Yes. Replied Mito. You're the first Uzumaki survivor who returned and stayed here for more than three months despite the ruins. There are others who have forgotten about their homeland, while the remaining ones do not know about their heritage. But enough of that. We'll talk about that once you enact your plan on the Uzumaki. For now we discuss battle plans against Kiri. Naruto nodded and straightened himself on his seat. Right. You've taken lessons on the five strongest villages, and you know why Kiri has the smallest force of the five. But the academy didn't tell you. Here's why, their graduation is different from the other five. They pit all their academy graduates against each other to the death until one is left standing or until the given time is completed. That explains it, huh, it's kind of ironic, I was planning of killing everyone I can on both sides. Do tell. I need you first to analyze this seal, said Naruto as he took out a scroll. It's the one that gives full control over his root. It basically prevents them from spilling what they know. The old ghost told me the seals shall remain on their tongues for a whole year after his death, allowing them time to erase everything of his and his roots' existence. The Izukages leaned forward as they glanced at the seal. I must admit myself this is some good seal work. The array is intricate. Give us five days to study this. A whole week maximum. Leave a hundred clones for us to possess and experiment with this seal. What modifications would you like us to add? Right now, the seal simply prevents them from talking. I want the seal tweaked and linked only to me, making those who have the seal completely subservient to me. Very well. I assume you're applying these to Donzo's root? Correct. I'm sending them to fight Takiri for me. So once we're done binding root to me, I'll need your help with my soul gems. Right now they can only hold genin level souls and are also too flashy. 
Before I send Root to Kiri, I want the soul gems to be able to trap souls up to low cage level, and without any light or noise during the sealing process. That shouldn't be a problem. Good. I shall return in a week. Naruto then walked out of the office and went to an open clearing. After creating a hundred reinforced clones, he shadow traveled back to his hotel in Konoha. Konohagakure Namikaze home after dropping some things to his hotel, he went to his parents' home and kneeled on the shrine, praying to his mother. A few moments later the air grew cold, signifying the Shinigami's appearance. What is it, my son? Mother, I would like to ask for your permission to use the Edo Tensai. I shall be using it only once to Danzo. I'll be needing him for the Roots transfer of allegiance to me. Also, I would like to speak with Tobarama Senju's ghost, I'll need him to teach me the jutsu. Very well. Just one time. You will have to rely on your Kurigan after this. I understand, mother. Thank you. When his mother left, Naruto stood up and channeled his dark chakra. Speak to me, Tobarama Senju, Nidame Cage of Konoha. One week later Uzushiogakure ruins, it is done. You just need to key in your chakra to make the seal responsive only to you. Mito said as she handed over a scroll. Naruto nodded and focused on his three chakra for extra protection and pushed it to the seal. There. Now we can make copies and apply it to your servants. Thank you, Azukages. You're welcome, young one. The Azukages shall begin working on the soul gems next. I'll be helping you apply the seals to root. Naruto then bowed to the ghosts before taking out a scroll, releasing a Kiri Anbu corpse, and crouched. Edo Tensai, after changing form, the reanimated corpse blinked a few times before he focused on his surroundings. Seal, Danzo then kneeled in front of Naruto, his head bowed submissively. I want you to return to your root base. Recall all of them and apply this seal on their foreheads. After that, order them to merge with the Hokage's Anbu until I give them new orders. Understood. Is there anything else? Yes. Naruto replied and then slapped his now called loyalty seal to Danzo's forehead. It should be his backup just in case Danzo breaks from the initial control seal of the Edo Tensai. After all, only the dead were bound to obey him, not counting the living. Now go. One month later Konohagakure Hokage's office, it is official, Hokage-sama. Danzo-sama is dead. We now answer to you. That was his order to us should he die, said a lone root agent. I see. However, I must say I find it hard to believe you're completely answering to me now frowned Serutobi. After all, your organization was the one responsible for Donzo's escape. Explain before I had you and the rest of your group executed. There seems to be a misunderstanding Hokage-sama. The ones who escaped Danzo-sama from prison were not root members. Our group have come to the conclusion that they were framing us. The Hokage wasn't convinced. He glared at the kneeling figure before he puffed more smoke on his pipe. I'm curious then. How were you able to tell and are certain that Danzo is dead? For a moment, the Sandame and the hidden Anbu in the room stiffened as the root agent raised his head and put out his tongue for the Hokage to see. They relaxed when nothing happened. As you can see, the seal that binds us root members to him are now gone, Hokage-sama. Hirazen nodded and finally relaxed. He knew about the fail-safe Danzo made. His former teammate was very paranoid. Very well. I am now integrating Root into the Anbu Corps under a new division. You shall be the captain. Understood Hokage-sama. What would our first orders be? I want your division to prepare for war. I'm sure you've heard of the civil war in Kiri. You will be assisting Mei Terumi's side. You'll go there in four months. Understood. Is there anything else? Yes. Tell me, what is your name? My last mission name was Sai, Hokage-sama. Very well, Sai. Inform your division of your new orders. Hi. Later Naruto's hotel, good news Naruto-sama, said an Anbu ghost. What is it? Root has been integrated to Anbu under a new division. I've been expecting that. What's the good news? The Hokage is sending them to Kiri in four months. I see. So he doesn't trust them at all. Good for him. He's sending them to war. If they die, he won't have to worry about Root anymore. He also gets an alliance with Kiri shall Mei Terumi's side wins. A double win for him. Unfortunately for the Hokage, I have other plans. Four months later Konohagakure the Leaf have started to recover after the Uchiha massacre. There was a fresh batch of recruits ranging from Chunin to Anbu. 
The graduation was also due, giving the village more genins. Overall, there was about 300. Not bad at all. Thought Hiruzen. Uzushiogakure ruins. Is everyone here? Asked Naruto as he looked at the black dressed shinobi in front of him. Yes, Naruto sama. All 70 of us are present, replied Sai. Good. Here are your soul gems. Naruto said as he distributed scrolls. Each one of you has 50. So I'll expect 3,500 filled soul gems when you return. You are to trap every soul you can. If an allied Kiri Nin has taken a fatal hit, trap their souls quickly before they fade. Now, we all know you're only fodder to the Sandame. Which is why I'm protecting you with my dark chakra, so you wouldn't die easily. It will be able to withstand up to 20 fatal hits. So try not to die, or I shall punish you. I want those Kiri souls. You are too kind, Naruto sama. We shall do as you wish, replied the 70. Later, Konohagakure Academy Naruto silently opened the door and went inside. Aruka was so focused on his speech he didn't notice the late comer. A celebration for our increased military strength. Also, there will be a recognition program to all exemplary students on all levels. Not only are the graduating class celebrating, so inform your parents so they could come. As Naruto plopped to his usual seat at the back, he heard Sasuke hiss at him. Where were you? Business meeting. You're lucky he's just about to start the roll call. The Uchiha replied as Aruka called Abarame Shino. After the attendance taking, the class was interrupted when a newly hired instructor asked for Aruka's help as he was having trouble with his own class. As the two teachers left the room, low chattering from the students began. One boy held up his nose and boisterously proclaimed, I feel sorry. The whole class went silent as they listened. For those who cannot enjoy the celebration because they are now orphans, how sad their parents won't be able to join them on stage. All eyes were on the two people at the back. They looked at Sasuke in pity or in apprehension, waiting to see his reaction. Only two in the class were focused on Naruto. They were both Hyuga. Sasuke merely shrugged at his classmates and went on doodling his notebook. Naruto meanwhile was staring at the boy. What was his name again? Koto. Hum, how sad indeed. Naruto felt Hanada and Neji's eyes on him and so he decided to keep a neutral face. I wonder if these two would figure when I kill the little shit's parents. Kurama, who had been listening on his thoughts, howled in laughter. Or maybe I should leave it to the Kurama family. Hum, yes, the kid's parents are merely civilians, after all. The class was brought from their musing when Aruka re-entered the classroom and began with the lesson. Later, after classes Naruto's hotel, I want you to grant a child's wish, said Naruto. And that is? asked Guy, one of the captains of the family. Kid wants to become an orphan, said Naruto as he handed out two folders. Ah. I heard him one time brag he was beating his parents' employee, slave, he called him. The male Hyuga in our class doesn't like the kid much, I'm sure. While I'm merely concerned for the well being of the merchants' workers, I'm just being a good guy, you know? Indeed. Hum, merchants, eh? This may require people not from Konoha. Eh, I don't mind. It's only Monday. Dig up some dirt on their business. I want them dead by Thursday night. Their bodies will have to be found Friday early morning. Understood. Friday morning Koto residence Ron Koto was a happy kid. Today was recognition day. While he wasn't top of the class, he wasn't at the bottom either. So he was proud of himself. He happily ate breakfast that was served to him by his slave. He later realized he was eating alone, but he didn't mind. His parents were probably still at work. They'll be at home in an hour. They'll still have time to catch up since the ceremony will begin at 11. Ron went to school humming to himself. As he passed by the market, he didn't notice the sympathetic looks some of the merchants were giving him. There was a bit of a commotion where people huddled together surrounding a particular stand. But Ron ignored them probably a limited or for sale item, he thought. Academy the class were all listening to Aruka as he was giving the students instructions for the program. There was a knock and then an Anbu entered. The masked Nin looked at Ron Koto's direction. Is there a problem, sir? Ron asked. I believe it would be best if I spoke to you privately. All right. The two then left the room and went to the next one. Eno, one of the gossipers in the class, trained her ears and listened in. The class didn't have to wonder for long when they heard their classmates' cries. No, that can't be. 
I'm not going to the orphanage. Iruka widened his eyes when he realized what the news about was. Some of his students were a bit confused at first but understood when Ino began telling them that Mr. and Mrs. Koto's dead bodies had been found on the market. They say his parents have stolen from a gang from outside the village and tried to sell it here, said Ino. The class was horrified, feeling sorry for their classmate. At the back, Sasuke hissed at Naruto. You didn't have to do that, you know. I didn't do it for you. Only two other people were paying attention at the back. Hinata looked at Naruto and saw him smirking. She simply thought that Naruto was feeling vindictive because of what Ron said on Monday. Neji, however, saw Naruto smirk at him. He understood. He smirked back. Despite the recent two deaths, everything in the village ran smoothly. Thankfully, no deaths followed from academy students or their family members. The Hokage had been paid a visit by Ron just yesterday, and demanded justice for his parents' deaths. However, after some investigations, he found out that the boy's parents had dealings with gang members outside the village. So Hiruzen had the case dropped, and Ron was shipped off to the orphanage. Just then, an Anbu whose body was no older than a ten-year-old appeared. Damn that Danzo, recruiting children and having them kill at a very young age. Serutobi sighed as he regarded the Root's presence. The mission was successful, Hokage-sama. May Turumi's side have won. Sai appeared, kneeling. That's wonderful news. Continue. Indeed, Hokage-sama. She is now the god I'm Mizukage. She told me to tell you to expect her visit within the week to discuss the alliance between Mist and Leaf. Very well. What of your division? You shall receive your pay tomorrow. There are only twenty-one of us who survived. Most of us fell from the Yondaimi Mizukage. That's understandable, the Hokage nodded. After all, they fought against a Jinchuriki. You and your division may have three days off. Thank you, Hokage-sama. Hum, I should send them off to more dangerous and suicidal missions. I can't have Donzo's Anbu working for me. Hiruzen mused as he puffed more smoke from his pipe. It will be an act of mercy if I just had them killed. Later, Naruto's hotel. Naruto was pacing on his study, scheming when he was alerted of Sai's presence. Mission. Harvest Souls was successful, Naruto-sama. The lead root Anbu said as he handed the boy three huge scrolls that contained the soul gems. Naruto nodded, pleased with result. He now had about 5,000 souls. Only 4,000 more for him to resurrect the whole village of Uzushiogakur. Report. Hi. We were able to collect the requested number of souls from both enemies and allied Kiri rebels. 49 of us died on the battle. Very good. Instruct the 49 to begin with the infiltration and recruitment in Kiri. Fu and Torun will be supervising the task. It shall be easy since Mist is still recovering from war and are willing to recruit more ninjas for their village even if they aren't natives of water country. Understood. Naruto sama. Good. From now on, you are no longer called Root. You are now my shadows. You have four years to recruit and train 600 new shadows. 400 in Kiri and 200 here in Konoha. The Hokage will be sending you 21 into suicide missions soon. He's eager to have you killed after all. When you die from these missions, begin recruiting and training. Now go. Later that afternoon Hyuga compound, training grounds. Neji was alone, training his dojutsu's techniques that he was able to observe from the main branch. As he finished an attempt at the 64 palms technique, he heard clapping, causing him to stiffen. Impressive, Hyuga-san, you really are a genius to be able to do techniques exclusive for main branch members. I didn't notice you arrive, Uzumaki-san. Or should I say, Namikaze-san, Neji said, smirking. Ah, so you know, eh? I did some study on you after the first semester. I see, so what do you know about me? You are the son of Kashina Uzumaki and Minato Namikaze. If Uzushiogakur still existed, you would be the heir. Is that all? Naruto asked, smiling. Neji frowned, confused. That's all. What else should I've known? Naruto walked closer and took out a scroll. Here, it requires a bit of your blood to be locked from others. It shall be accessible only to you after. Others won't be able to read it. Still be careful though. If that falls into the hands of authorities, you're ed. Deeply ed. That's SSS rank secret. Got it from the heavily protected vault of the Hokage and produced copies. 
Naruto grinned. Neji's eyes widened at this, his cold demeanor gone for the moment. Then why? Just read it, yeah. And before you ask, my answer is no, I do not know. It could be the Hyuga, Inazuka, Yamanaka, Nara, Akamichi, or the Abarame clan that's next. I trust you'll keep everything that you'll learn to yourself. I know that you hate everyone in the village too. That makes the three of us. Who's the other one? Neji wasn't able to get his answer as Naruto have already vanished. He decided to end his training for the day and retire to his quarters to read the scroll. Uchiha compound, Sasuke's home, hello Sasuke. Naruto said as he stepped out of the shadows. Naruto. The Uchiha nodded. I've just come to inform you that Neji knows. You've told him then. I just gave him a copy of the documents I also gave to you. I'll be explaining things further next time I see him. Very well. So I should expect a visit from him then? Yes. And with that, Naruto walked back to the shadows and traveled to the Kurama family's hotel. Later, at the family's hotel, Naruto, Wave used to be a part of Uzushiogaku, right? Rado began as he served the boy a drink. Naruto took it gratefully and nodded. Yes. Why? There's a man, Gatu. He's a businessman wannabe gangster. He just left Kurigaku now that the war's over. He's earned a lot from the war, that man. Right now, my sources say he has his eyes set at Wave. He may move in a month or less. And I already smell trouble for the small town. The boy nodded and was silent for a while, sipping his drink. Thank you for giving me this information. However, I'll ask that you leave him and Wave alone. We'll just keep an eye on him. If he gives trouble, then it will be better. We'll be the ones to rescue the town. And we'll move in there. The Kurama head raised an eyebrow. Move in. And you said we, so does that mean the family operations will relocate as well? Naruto nodded, I have decided, in two years, I'm leaving the village. We'll allow Gedu to pull Wave to the ground. When they finally seek for help, that's when we move in. That will probably take four years, at most. The boss head raised an eyebrow but did not vocalize his question. He was sure that the Uzumaki heir had a plan, and he wasn't one to question the boy. He may be young but he was frighteningly smart and cunning. Naruto, meanwhile, kept an impassive face. He knew the man in front of him was wondering. But he didn't bother explaining. He wanted the people of Wave to suffer. He wanted them to be punished. After all, when Uzushiogaku fell, they didn't help the surviving Uzumaki. He knew because he's talked to the ghosts. And he knew that most people in Wave do not have backbones. So even if Gedu began to destroy Wave now, it would take four years before someone sought help from the outside. Enough time for Sasuke and Neji to graduate the academy. All would fall into plan. Right then. So four years, murmured Rado. Yes. Now, we'll talk about Yugito's training. I've found someone who can train her Jinshuriki powers. Naruto said as he did some hand seals and produced a shadow clone. While it is called the same, his shadow clone was actually created from his dark chakra thus making it a real shadow clone. He's also told the family about the Shinigami being his mother. He had no problems sharing the secret with them as they were non-shinobi and has no loyalties with Konoha. Add also the fact that Naruto is now considered a son of Reido, the fox, Kurama. As a shadow clone materialized, Naruto took out Kagutsuchi and stabbed the floor. Like usual, a circular void appeared at the pierced ground. The son of the Shinigami intoned, Yagura Karataki. Hear me and obey, I summon you. Unseen by everyone in the room except Naruto, the ghost of the Yandaimi Mizukage appeared and kneeled in front of him. Naruto then motioned at the ghost towards the shadow clone. As the spirit took possession, the clone's features began to change into the appearance of the one possessing it. Naruto then turned at Reido and Yugito. While I'm a Jinchuriki as well, I cannot teach Yugito since our tail numbers are far. I have the Kyubi but Yugura had the Sanbi. Since their tail numbers are closer, their training style won't be far from each other. Every Monday to Friday from now on, I will be transporting Yugito to Uzushiogaku so she could freely train with her Jinchuriki powers. Added Naruto. That's so awesome, I get to get trained by a cage. Gushed Yugito, causing Naruto and Reido to smile. Naruto then dismissed the ghost and ordered it to return the following morning. 
he spent the rest of the night discussing random things with his now adoptive family, before retiring to his own penthouse suite. The following day Uchiha Compound, Training Grounds. Sasuke was doing his morning exercises when he felt the compound seals warn him of a visitor. Knowing who it was, he went to the gates to welcome the guest in and escorted him to the training grounds. So, you know, huh? Sasuke began as he casually leaned against a tree. Yes. Do you trust Naruto? Sasuke asked inquisitively. I see no reason for me not to trust him. Neji shrugged. Good then. You understand his status. Neji raised an eyebrow. Which one? Him being the son of the Yandaimi and heir to Uzushiogakur or being a Jinchuriki? The latter. Neji frowned. Well, I was able to make little inquiries about a Jinchuriki. When I asked about the topic, everyone I asked scowled, making me think it's a bad thing. But I believe they're being biased about it. I'm still trying to figure it out though. Well, you're correct about the last part. Everyone who's 12 years old or above are biased or simply bigoted. Sasuke straightened up and motioned Neji to follow him. As he led the Hyuga towards his house, he explained to him what exactly happened eight years ago, up to the part where the Uchiha clan was massacred. Neji was silent for a while as he absorbed the information. After some silence, Sasuke asked him, So, what do you think of Naruto? What do you think of the village? Nothing's changed upon my views on Naruto. Only now he's earned a lot more of my respect. The village, I was correct to think that everyone in it are idiots. Even the higher ups are allowing these bad things to happen. My hatred for this village just grew. Naruto, who was melded with the shadows, grinned. He'd been at the Uchiha compound the moment Neji arrived. He was just listening into their conversation. That Uchiha boy is loyal to you, that's good. It seems you may have another loyal follower, Kurama said. After hearing the Hyuga's response, Naruto chose this time to finally make his presence known. Well said, Neji. The Hyuga, who was normally stoic, jumped in surprise, causing Sasuke to chuckle. You'll get used to it. Naruto. How long have you been there? Just in time to hear your response. I see. So what now? I'll be blunt. I want you to decline the academy's offered grade skip. What? But why? Shocked. Sasuke asked. I have plans. One of them requires the two of you. Tell us about the plan that includes us, Neji said. I want you two to remain on the same level with our current classmates. Upon graduation, you'll have to be placed on the same team. For that to happen, one of you must be dead last while the other is the best of the class. The both of you may remain at the top until the grade 5. The academy only bases the team placement on the grades for the 6th grade. I don't care which one of you will be the dead last. I'll leave the decision to you. Neji was silent while Sasuke pondered for a moment before asking. What's in it for us? At least this one can think. Naruto grinned. You agree to the plan, then starting tomorrow, an Anbu will be training you. Personally. One who will be teaching us both or one each for us. Inquired Neji. One each for you. Replied Naruto. It wouldn't be much of a problem. After all. He's found a temporary solution for his current inability to bring the dead back to life. While creating special shadow clones for spirits to possess required an eighth of his dark chakra, it solved his problem, even though the clones have to be recreated up to twice a day. Naruto estimated it would take two to three more years before he's able to awaken his Kuregan's fourth level. Neji and Sasuke nodded, the latter smirking. You drive a good bargain there, Naruto. Said Sasuke. Indeed. We only need to refuse the grade skip but we're still getting trained in advance. Added Neji, will you share us some of your plans? Or at least explain why we need to be on a team? Oh, sure. I intend to accept the grade skip. After that, I'll excel at fourth grade. And then I'll be offered another grade skip, so I'll be entering sixth grade. On the second term, I leave the village. It will be easier for me if I left as a civilian and not a registered genin. I can easily get rid of my records at the academy. The reason why I'm skipping grades is to get to know more academy students. Remember my introduction, I plan to say the same to them. Before I leave, I want academy students to realize or figure out my heritage. By the time I'm away, the knowledge of me being the Yandaimi's son will be known throughout Konoha. Serutobi won't be able to do anything. The village will be in an uproar. 
Also add the case where my father's enemies will go snooping in the village. More chaos, Naruto said, smirking at the last part. Devious, muttered Neji, grinning. I'm in, me too, said Sasuke. Who's going to be our team's third member then? Whoever's the top girl in the graduating class, but seeing things as it is now, I believe it would be the Haruno girl. Naruto replied, shrugging. Can't you arrange something so she couldn't be our teammate? No don't worry about her. She's a huge fangirl. She'll be the first to die once you go on missions. Naruto replied, now, there's another thing that you should know. Since you'll be the best team, I believe Kakashi Hitaki will be your Junin sensei. And trust me when I say, he's useless. He'll just keep you on doing D-rank missions. The thing I'd like you to do is to drag it on. Keep on doing D-ranks. There will be a time where a mission from Wave will arrive. Make sure you do not accept it. Have another team do it. Both Hayuga and Uchiha agreed to the odd request and didn't inquire further about it. After all, if they do what Naruto wanted, they'll be trained by an Anbu. Oh, and one last thing. I want you to act hostile towards each other when in public. That's all. You'll meet your teachers tomorrow. Naruto said before he walked towards a shadowed corner and traveled to his hotel. Back at Naruto's hotel, why include the Hayuga? Asked Kurama. Well, I need an inside man here. Sasuke will be leaving the village too someday. His target is outside. Neji on the other hand has less ambition. His target is Hinata, although I don't think he has the guts to murder her. Maim or cripple, yes. But Ao tried murder the heiress. No. He has hate but not enough to make him leave the village. Time skip. Two years and six months some local barbecue restaurant. Kin was a part-time worker at a barbecue restaurant. Like everyone, he has a secret. His secret is that he's actually a spy from Iowa. It was currently Tuesday afternoon and there were three academy students having a snack. As he got the children their orders, he discreetly listened into their conversation. What's gotten you so smug, Jin? You've been acting annoying since morning. One of the kids asked. Oh, I got super cool information. Replied Jin, grinning widely. Come on, spill it. Said the last kid. Huh, there's a price, Jin said. What, come on, man, we're your friends. Said the first. Well, this is very awesome information. And I'm not willing to divulge it easily, you know? Oh, well. How about we treat you for lunch for the whole week? offered the last kid. What, that's expensive, said the first, hum, that will do. After all, if I share you the information, we'll be famous at school. What? It's that awesome? Asked the first kid. Yeah, so we have a deal, then? Asked Jin. Fine, said both his friends, remember that Naruto? The one who skipped two grades. Exactly. Now, remember his introduction. He said he was the last of his clan from both his mom and dad's lines. He said his mom's clan had a lot of enemies while his father also got loads. Well, as I was walking to school earlier, I happened to glance at the Hokage Mountain. I was idly staring at their faces when Naruto's face popped in my head. That's when I realized, he looked a lot like the Yandaimi. What? Shrieked both his friends, suddenly standing. Come, look. Jin motioned to his friends and walked to a nearby window and pointed outside. See? He asked as his friends looked. Whoa, you're right, said the first kid. Damn. It's no wonder he's such a genius, he's the son of the Yandaimi, said the other. Yeah, I remember now, he said he was taking his mother's surname because he had to hide from his dad's enemies. But the thing is, the Uzumakis are also strong and had lots of enemies. Yeah. I remember one of our history lessons. It took the combined forces of Iwa, Kumo, and Kiri to destroy Uzushiogakur. They are that powerful. Damn. Damn indeed, Jin said. Now you know why I'm so smug. You're treating me to lunch for a week, okay. Sigh. Fine, fine. Now, we'll be famous tomorrow. We'll befriend Naruto. Once news spreads, we'll be known as the friends of the school genius, aka the Yandaimi's son. Quote exclamation mark. That's awesome man. And with that, the children went back to eating and plotting to befriend Naruto. Kin, who was eager to deliver his newfound information, told the restaurant manager he's having his afternoon break, and promptly went out of the establishment. 
Kakashi Hataki, who was given the task of keeping an eye at Kin, shakily walked out and hurried after the spy. But since he was too shocked from what he have heard, he lost his target. So he walked to another bar to get a drink. He needed to calm his nerves. As the two other occupants of the restaurant left, the children finished their meal. Jin told his friends to go on while he remained. When he was finally out of sight, he body flickered from the restaurant. At Naruto's hotel, Naruto was talking with Rado about weaponries when one of his newly trained shadows appeared. Ah, Jin, how did it go? The mission went on smoothly, Naruto-sama. Anbu Hataki has failed his mission of following his target. The spy kin is relaying the news to his Suchikage as of this moment. Might Guy, who was doing his rounds by hand walking, happened to pass by as I pointed out at the window and heard our exclamations. He will be shouting about Naruto-sama being the Yandaimi's son tomorrow morning as he trains. Naruto nodded as the shadow left. He smirked at Rado before going into a full-blown laughter. His heritage will be revealed sooner than he expected. Well then, I'm heading to the academy. I better erase my records as soon as possible. Yash, today is a youthful day. The Anbu that were stationed at the area inwardly groaned as Might Guy began his morning shouting. He will be shouting for a good five minutes about youth before he begins training. Yandaimi Sama is smiling upon me. I shall dedicate this training to his son WHO is being most youthful at the academy by being the top student. This caused every Anbu in the area to listen to him. Guy was either unaware of this or he didn't just care if people were listening. He was, after all, shouting at the top of his lungs. Naruto-san's flames of youth shines so brightly, and for that, I shall begin with 500 push UPS. Genma and Rado, who served as bodyguards to the Yandaimi, happened to walk by as they did their patrol. Upon hearing Guy's proclamations, they nodded to each other and made hand signs to the hidden Anbu nearby, informing them that they will be investigating about this Naruto person. Academy, Uruka Yumino hummed to himself as he walked past a group of students. They were huddled together and appeared to be in deep conversation. He just smiled as he thought the students were talking about homework. He nodded at Mizuki, a fellow teacher who also noticed the conversing students. Uruka continued walking to his classroom. He had five minutes before the bell signaling the start of the first class rang. As he walked the corridors, he noticed two more groups of students deep in conversation. He ignored them as he finally entered his classroom. His first class for the morning were sixth graders. The students stopped their chattering and went to their seats as Aruka entered the classroom. However, three of the students appeared not to have noticed his arrival. Jin and his friends were still huddled together and were whispering animatedly, and appeared to be agitated. Uruka cleared his throat and was able to gain their attention. Before moving back to their seats, the three altogether glanced worriedly at a vacant seat. Uruka followed his students' gazes and recognized whose empty seat it was. It was Uzumaki Naruto's. Odd, Naruto has never arrived late before. Uruka thought as he began checking the attendance. Time moved on as the morning break would end in 10 minutes. Uruka walked to his third class for the day. He will be attending fourth graders this time. Sasuke Uchiha and Neji Hayuga's class. I still don't understand why they chose not to skip grades, unlike Naruto. Speaking of Naruto, where is he? What happened to that boy? He missed a 30-point quiz today. My hearing is perfectly fine, I assure you. It's not just our sense of smell that is heightened, you know. Uruka was distracted from his thoughts as he heard Kiba's indignant yell. He allowed the students continue their conversation as it was still five minutes before the third classes began. So Uruka sat and listened to Kiba who was talking with Shino, Choji, and Shikamaru. It's what I heard from the sixth graders when I walked past them this morning. Kiba, we believe you. But I think it will be more logical if we investigated first why they were talking about the Yandaimi. Said Shino. Maybe grade 6 students needed to restudy the Hokages. Choji suggested. What do you think, Shikamaru? I may have an idea why. The Nara drawled. But I'm with Shino. We should investigate some more first. Let's just listen to the rumors. If it is anything interesting, then the whole academy will know. You know how news travel fast here. Students like to talk loudly, even if they're sixth graders. We'll talk about this again on Friday. The bell rang and Aruka stood up to take attendance. 
he, too, will be listening to the talk about the Yandaimi or whatever it is related to him. The day after the next, Friday, not only the Anbu were making their personal investigations, but some of the Junins as well. Those who had more free time were able to discover from the teachers that there was indeed a kid named Naruto Uzumaki who was quite famous for his remarkable grades at the academy. However, since they had no official reason to investigate about the boy, they could not ask for his files. Only school staff, teachers, and student guardians were allowed access to them. And so, nobody still knows that the files and records for one Uzumaki Naruto were missing. Due to Might Guy's incessant shouting about youth, and this time about Naruto as well, some of the civilians got curious as well. Since they only knew him, it, whom they called, the demon brat, the civilians did not know that it was the same Naruto Uzumaki who they accepted or believed that was the Yandaimi's son. Some of these civilians had children at the academy, who, naturally, wanted information about him. Academy. As Aruka walked for his first class, he noticed more groups of students huddled together, whispering excitedly. He caught the words, son, Naruto Uzumaki, and, Yandaimi Hokage, from the conversations he passed by. Once again, he regarded Mizuki, who was walking the opposite way to him. He noticed the other teacher frown at the whispering students. Mizuki looked more worried than yesterday. Uruka put the thought aside as he reached his classroom. This time, however, the students didn't notice him, as all of them were conversing. I think it's true, said one student. Of course, it is. His introduction of himself says it all, said another. Indeed, and you can clearly see the resemblance said another, who pointed at the Hokage mountain that was visible from the classroom window. The students murmured in agreement. Do you think that's why he's absent? Because the school now knows about his true heritage? Asked one. It's possible. Or maybe he's really just coincidentally sick at the moment. Aruka decided to halt the conversation and started the class. Time moved fast and Aruka found himself walking to his third class. He was 10 minutes early to arrive as he was interested to hear Shikamaru Nara's input regarding the school gossip. So, how did it go? Choji asked as Shino's bugs returned to him. My bugs tell me that most students are talking about the same topic. With Naruto Uzumaki being the Yandaimi's son. Ha, see, I told you, said Kiba, tisk. So, the whole school knows, or will know soon. I knew it, I was right all along, muttered Shikamaru. What are you talking about? demanded Kiba, confused. Shikamaru rolled his eyes. That Naruto Uzumaki is the son of the Yandaimi Hokage and the deceased princess of Uzushiogakur. Wait, what? Choji almost shouted. This is so troublesome, but, come on. Look. Shikamaru stood up and walked towards a nearby window and pointed at the Hokage mountain. See the resemblance. Kiba and Choji gaped, while Shino was stoic as usual. Now, if you remember his introduction two years ago, he said that he was taking his mother's surname because his father had many enemies. He didn't attend grade one for the same reason. From there we'd easily know that his mother was an Uzumaki. There were only two Uzumakis recorded to have married someone from Konoha, one was Lady Mito and the other, Lady Kashina. The former was wife to the Shadaim while the latter was married to the Yandaimi. At first, I didn't consider this because Naruto could only have been a survivor from Uzushiogakur and wasn't born here. But now that he's grown up and looks like one of the Hokages, from there we could easily deduct who Naruto's parents are. Unknown to Aruka and the students, there were others listening to the conversation. Genma and Reido nodded to each other before silently leaving. Pakum, who had been tasked by Kakashi to gather information at the academy, sniffed the air before vanishing in a puff of smoke. Neji and Sasuke carefully glanced at each other. Hanada hid her face from everyone. Mizuki, who had been looking for Uruka, heard the conversation from outside the classroom. He didn't walk inside but hurriedly ran towards the academy's student registry instead. Uzushiogakur. While this was all happening, Naruto was idly watching Yugito's training. He was interrupted when a ghost appeared before him. Naruto have spent a lot of time in Whirlpool enough for him to know each and every past Uzumaki. So he was confused at the new ghost of a woman who was looking at him with pleading eyes. You're an Uzumaki. I've never met you before, however. Who are you? Naruto frowned. I'm Katarina. I'm one of the survivors. 
The ghost replied, bowing. I see. So why am I only seeing you now? I only died recently. That explains it, Naruto murmured. Please, Naruto-sama, you're the only one I could run to. I need your help. My daughter needs your help. I cannot resurrect souls yet. No, it's not that. My daughter's still alive. She's all alone now that I'm dead. Tell me everything I need to know. Ordered Naruto. Me and my daughter have been living peacefully at a small town. One day, it was attacked by bandits and was burned to the ground. We had nowhere to go before a junin from Kusagakar found us. In exchange for shelter, I had to work for them as a healer. That time I didn't know they were at war. I only found out when I had to work overtime. They recognized me as an Uzumaki and used my healing abilities. But they abused it. I was forced to heal people non-stop. I lasted five days before my body gave out from chakra exhaustion. I've been dead for an hour now. I immediately sought after you once I talked to some ghosts. Please, Naruto-sama, I beg you. Rescue my daughter. I fear that Kusagakar will abuse her next. Naruto nodded in understanding and stood up. Led me to her. Outskirts of Kusagakar. The ghost thanked him profusely as they traveled through the shadow realm. They reappeared at the edge of the forest near the small shack Karen was in. Naruto kept blended in the shadows as he sensed another living presence aside Katarina's daughter. That's Zosui, shrieked the ghost. He's come for my Karen. Naruto stared at the man coldly as he approached the shack. No doubt to collect Karen. Naruto once again entered the shadow realm and reappeared inside the tiny house, but kept hidden. He saw the girl reading a book and glancing at the door every now and then. Naruto figured she must have sensed the Junin outside. Katarina informed him that her daughter had sensory abilities. Upon realizing that it wasn't her mother's chakra she sensed, Karen scuttled towards a corner and hid. Naruto, who was angry for the treatment Katarina received, decided to give it back to the one responsible. Creatures of the Grim, hear me and obey. Ursa Major, come forth and bring your children. Protect Karen Uzumaki and destroy the man named Zosui. Intoned Naruto. Karen sensed movements from the shadows that resembled bears. She whimpered in fear when she saw the creature's red eyes. There were six of them. One of the bear-like creatures stood as tall as the shack's ceiling. When the door opened to reveal the Kusa Junin, the creatures immediately sprung into action. The largest pounced at the man sending him crashing outside. The other five quickly followed out as the largest pinned Zosui down, its large jaws clamped on the man's torso. When they reached him, the creatures proceeded to repeatedly bite the man at various parts of his body. Despite her fears, Karen curiously peered outside and gasped in horror as she watched the Kusajunin get mauled by the shadow bear creatures. His screams unheard by anyone except her. Naruto decided to make his presence known. Fitting, isn't it? Karen jumped in fright as a boy her age appeared out of the shadows. Intrigued, she asked the mysterious boy why the current situation was fitting. Naruto chuckled before answering, that man was responsible for the death of your mother. She died from chakra exhaustion. You already know that your mom can heal others by allowing them to bite on her. That's what happened to her. They abused her abilities. He finished explaining as the Kusa Junin stopped screaming. He was still alive, but could only whimper now and gasp as his body received more and more bites. His blood flowing out from every open wound. W.H. What? Mothers. Karen choked, horrified, yes, I'll tell you more later. For now, we need to leave. But who are you? I'm Naruto. Naruto who? Where are you from? Naruto smiled as he gently took the girl's arm and dragged her to the shadows. Uzushiogakur. Naruto halted Yugito's training and asked her assistance to console Karen while he explained things to her. He told Karen who he was, his powers, and his plan to revive Uzushiogakur by sacrificing souls. Karen didn't grieve long after she found out that her mother will be brought back to life once Naruto mastered his Kuregan. Right then, you will be staying in Konoha for the meantime. You're free to do whatever you like as long as you stay inside the hotel. If you need me, just call my name. There are ghosts stationed at the hotel. They will inform me if you're calling. Karen nodded. Thank you, Naruto, for saving me. You're an Uzumaki. Your family. I did what I have to do. Naruto smiled. The girl blushed and thanked him again. What? What's going to happen to Kusagakar now? 
They don't have a healer anymore. Naruto viciously smiled, scaring her. For what they did to your mother, they will die. All of them. Time skip. One week. Kanahagakur. News about the carnage in Kusagakur spread to all hidden villages. After all, whoever attacked the small village didn't leave a single body intact. The walls and trees of the former village were painted with blood. Leftover body parts and gore littered the floor. It was considered worse than the Uchiha clan massacre, as there were no survivors. Gossip says it was done by demons. They didn't know it, but it was true. For Naruto, the son of the Shinigami, raised hell upon the village. Demons of different kinds feasted and tore upon grass villagers' flesh. While their souls were trapped in crystals, later to be used as currency for a resurrected soul. However, this didn't trouble Konoha, for they had more pressing matters to attend to. One such matter was the discovery of the Yandaimi Hokage's son. It was inevitable. Before the week ended news have already spread to the village. There had been minor riots from both villagers and shinobi, especially those who came from clans. Hiruzen Serutobi had to admit that the Yandaimi indeed had a son and that boy was under the name of Naruto Uzumaki. However, only the academy students knew of him and some Anbu who actually tried to protect him when he was younger. The people wanted to know about him. While others weren't privy to the academy registry, only the teachers and staff were. However, they later found out that the person of interest's file was missing. It was the only file the Hokage allowed the public to see. But it was missing. Serutobi could not release the file that contained information about him being the Nine Tails Jinchuriki. What the village only knew about Naruto was that his parents were Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki. The newer files the Hokage had about the boy have also gone missing. After some investigations, it was found out that a teacher named Mizuki had been last spotted leaving the academy registry room. It was later revealed by the Anbu that Mizuki was under suspicions of being a spy from another village. His allegiance however, was unknown. It had been almost three years since the Hokage last saw Naruto personally. When he finally decided to pay him a visit, Hiruzen was horrified, to say the least, to find out that Naruto wasn't at the apartment now hotel. There were investigations held. Mizuki had been considered suspect for kidnapping one Uzumaki Naruto. However, after more investigations, Anbu could not find any trace or sign of abduction. Despite the suspicions, Mizuki was released a week later as he came out clear. The higher-ups were still convinced that the Chunin was a spy from an unknown village, but cannot prove it yet. There were two conclusions. The first was that Naruto was indeed kidnapped by someone using some kind of an unknown jutsu. The other was that the son of the Yandaimi left the village. They couldn't call him a deserter, as Naruto had only records in the village as a civilian. Hokage's Office the Hokage could be found in his office using his scrying orb, obviously searching for Naruto. He was interrupted when a messenger barged into his office. Hokage-sama, urgent news. Our spies from Iwa report movement. All Chunin and above have been subjected to retraining by the Suchikage. The order was approved three days ago. Our market watchers have also concluded that Iwa has been amassing weapons and have more in pending order. It appears that news have traveled to them then. The Hokage muttered to himself. However, the messenger countered him. Hokage-sama, it would seem that Iwa already knew about the existence of the Yandaimi's son long before news came out. They have been suspecting, but the latest news confirmed it. Hiruzen's eyes widened. Get me the heads of all departments here at once, as well as the heads of the shinobi clans. And recall Jiraiya. Jiraiya has just arrived, said Rado as he took a seat. Obviously, he went to the hot springs first. You can never count on that pervert. He's been recalled due to a possible war, but what does he do? Do some perverted shit. Right you are. Naruto nodded. Say, Naruto, isn't he your godfather? Asked Yugito. He's supposed to, but he's never stepped into that duty. He left me to this hateful village. I no longer care, though. With him abandoning me, I got to do whatever I wanted. Replied the boy, moving on. I'd like to invest on ships. The land of snow is rather advanced in machineries. In less three years, I want a fleet ready. How big is this fleet, exactly? Rado asked as he made mental calculations. About a hundred and fifty ships. Six or a dozen aircraft carriers, 
20 or more airships, 50 battleships, and 50 support ships. That's huge. Could they produce that in three years? The boss exclaimed. They can. As of now, Land of Snow can produce one ship a week. The ghosts from Snow tell me that the country is building six more shipyards. The building process could be hastened if they have more manpower. That's where I come in. Of course, he can make thousands of clones. Nodded Rado. I see. What about the money? How are you paying for that? When I destroyed Kusagakar, I found out that it is very rich in minerals. Funny thing is that, even the inhabitants knew nothing of it. As of now, the place is in lockdown, secured by demons. Demons that specialize in earth are mining it day and night. People will be too scared to snoop in anyway, so six months is enough for me to run the land dry. If I may, what do you need this fleet for? Four out of five major countries are connected by land. Unless of course, you intend to invade the land of water. Naruto nodded, and then he added, Whirlpool, while it had strong defenses, was nearby enemy territory and was easily surrounded. I plan to invade the east. I intend to rebuild the new Uzushiogakur in the land of Moon. That country is far, isolated, rich, and has a great geographical structure. Kurigakur will serve as a buffer zone, or technically a war zone, if you like to call it. I want the world to believe that in the land of water they would find the rebuilt Uzushiogakur, while it is actually located in the land of moon. Also, the land of swamps and demons isn't that governed. Only a priestess and some followers guard the land from demons, and not shinobi. Why other nations have never tried to occupy it, I will never know because I do not care. I, on the other hand, want those lands. Time skip. Two years. Time have passed and Konoha still have no leads on Naruto's whereabouts. While this was the case, it didn't stop Iwagakur from having a cold war with the leaf. Only the Hokage's immediate response upon learning of the Tsuchikage's actions prevented a full-blown war. Without Danzo to undermine his leadership, Hiruzen was able to rally all abled shinobi in his village, including the ones who were once part of Root. The defenses and the amount of patrols and personnel stationed in the Land of Fire were doubled, while said members of Danzo's former organization were usually sent near the borders. Due to the way they were trained, Root had no qualms torturing and killing Iwa spies and scouts. Because of this, the Hokage was able to regain the respect he lost when the Yandaimi sacrificed himself eleven years ago. Onoki took a step back but would send small attack forces every now and then. Even in the brink of war, Konoha have gotten more clients and contracts, giving them more income. However, even Shikaku Nara, the Leafs war analyst, didn't foresee that they will upset another village, namely Sunagakur. Academy, and Team 7 will be Hayuga Neji, Higurashi Tenten, and Uchiha Sasuke. Your Junin Sensei will be Hitaki Kakashi. Sasuke glanced at Neji who gave a discreet nod as Aruka announced their team composition. Team 8 will be Hayuga Hanada, Fujino Natsuki, and Haruno Sakura. Your Junin Sensei is Yuhi Kuranai. Supposedly, Hanada was going to be top female in their batch, but due to the disappearance of her crush Naruto, she fell behind a bit and became second after Tenten. Natsuki was ranked somewhere in the middle while Sakura, a loyal fangirl of Sasuke, followed the boys pranking in lazy ways and was second to the last overall. Team 9 will consist of Yamanaka Ino, Nara Shikamaru, and Akamichi Choji. Sensei Serutobi Asuma, no surprise there. They were this generation's Ino Shika Cho trio. Lastly, Team 10 will be Lee Rock, Inazuka Kiba, and Aburame Shino. Your sensei will be Might Guy. This team was all male opposite of Team 8. Time skip. Six months. Hokage Tower. Hokage Sama. I believe my team is now ready for a C rank mission. Proclaimed Kakashi as his genins approached the mission desk. Hum, are they? Very well. Send in Tazuna San. The Hokage shouted to the secretary outside. A drunk old man stepped inside and bowed a little. Tazuna san, Team 7 will be escorting you back to Wave. What? A Cyclops, a lesbian, a trans woman, and a duck butt will be my escorts. While Kakashi was busy trying to keep Tenten from murdering their client, Team 8 entered the room. Mission accomplished, Hokage sama. Natsuki ignored the current team inside and headed towards the desk followed closely behind by Hinata, Sakura, and Kurenai. Neji, seeing his hated cousin, 
suddenly remembered Naruto's advice to them nearly five years ago and stepped forward to speak. Excuse me, Hokage-sama, but I believe my team isn't ready yet for a C-rank mission, especially an escorting type. Kakashi-sensei hasn't taught us anything except teamwork, which we haven't achieved yet. I would like to point out that Uchiha here was dead last. The duck butt may drag us down and led us into failing the mission. Sasuke immediately picked up and acted insulted. Unbeknownst to them, another person had been forewarned of this situation and knew what to do. Excuse me, Hokage-sama. If Team 7 isn't ready for this C-rank mission you are talking about, then I believe Team 8 is more suited for this. Everyone stared at Natsuki with various expressions. The rest of Team 8 were shocked. Neji and Sasuke looked impassive, while Kakashi and Tenten were frowning. The Hokage looked amused. Sakura was the first to recover as she realized Sasuke was staring at her, or at least that's what she thought. Intent on impressing her love, Sakura voiced her agreement with Natsuki. Hanada, who still hasn't given up on Naruto, thought that it was her chance to look for him, agreed as well. Hum, what do you think, Kurenai? asked the Hokage. H. Hi, I believe my team is ready for a C rank mission, Hokage sama. The Junin straightened herself. Well, Kakashi, it looks like you won't be taking C rank missions yet. You will have to drill your genins into teamwork for now, the Hokage said with an eye smile, which caused the Junin to snort in mild annoyance. Very well, Hokage sama, I would like to request for two more D rank missions for today. Team 8 got acquainted with their client while Team 7 were given two scrolls by the Hokage. Prepare for a five day trip. We'll meet at the gates in two hours. Kurenai told her team. Land of Waves. While things were going on normally at Konoha, it was different in the Land of Waves. The usually calm waters were disturbed by a dozen approaching old looking ships, surrounding nearly thirds of the small island's shores. Gedu, who had a strong foothold at the place, ordered his army of mercenaries to give the would be invaders a warm welcome. Meanwhile, the locals who have seen the warships were given hope. For at the ship's masts was a flag that was supposedly long forgotten. After some thirty years, the swirl within a circle was once again flying in the air. The townspeople were speculating if they went into hiding for a long time and then went back, or if these people were survivors who recruited or joined with other small clans. Either way, the whirlpools were once again at Wave's borders. Gedu, who had very limited knowledge about Shinobi, had no clue that this day would be his last and so he wasn't afraid to be at the battlefield. After all, he had known a rank missing nins under his employ such as Momochi Zabuza, whom he had to recall. The demon brothers should be enough to kill that blasted Tazuna. Unfortunately for him, he's got the faintest of information that these new invaders had to be destroyed by not just one but three great nations combined due to their power. As the ships gave loud blasts, Gedu ordered his army to prepare arrows and other throwables at the enemy. A lone figure jumped off the larger ships and headed towards them. The invader was wearing an old-fashioned battle suit which gave the defenders a morale boost. It only took a few seconds before the lone figure covered the distance between the shores and the front lines. Gatu began laughing boisterously when he realized that the person was only a young boy, and so did most of his mercenaries. Kill him, he ordered. Naruto whose hair now reached past his shoulders, merely grinned wickedly as projectiles were thrown towards him. There were also jutsus that made to ensnare and kill him. He immediately recognized that the mercenary army mostly consisted of Iwa rogue nin, while the rest came from other shinobi villages, mercenaries, bandits, and the rare rogue samurai. Naruto was aware that the Iwa rogue nin were in fact, not missing nin at all. They were sent there by the Tsuchikage to get closer the land of fire with Konoha being none the wiser. Poised to attack the leaf should orders were given. Time to screw with their heads. Naruto thought as he reached to his weapon's pocket and retrieved a tri-prong kanai and hurled it at the enemy direction. Kanai cage bunshin no jutsu. Gatu's army found it easy to deflect the projectiles, never noticing the kunai's unique look. Their only cue that something was wrong was the boy's grim smile. They broke formation when the boy loudly shouted his next move. Horishin no Jutsu. One by one the army fell as flashes of blood red appeared randomly at the defenders' lines. The slaughter went on for a full minute before it stopped. Those who survived the initial onslaught found themselves unable to move. 
When they tried to learn why, they noticed that they were being held by seals. They were so focused on the boy they have forgotten he came with a dozen ships. The locals who barricaded themselves in their homes checked through the window slits when the sounds of battle died down. They saw Gatu and his army being unable to move and surrounded by red-haired people. The Uzumaki were indeed back. Line. Naruto stared in contentment as the once oppressed townspeople took out their anger and frustrations towards Gatu and his surviving thugs. They had no qualms torturing the vile men. When Naruto finished tormenting one random thug he picked, the people of Wave followed suit. One boy in particular turned out to be creative when he began punishing Gatu. Naruto was surprised that Inari would do such things especially when the ghosts have told him the boy was a sniveling brat only a few hours ago. He was glad that the battle didn't last long. While he had an extra vessel of chakra due to the Kyubi, it still took a toll on him as he had to keep the illusion he cast on the warships making them look like old wooden vessels. Apart from that, he had to create special clones for the ghosts to possess to make the Uzumaki clan's invasion of Wave more realistic. As soon as the people finished celebrating, renovation of the town would begin at once. Supposedly, he intended to remain incognito until the Chunin exams but he had a spur of the moment when he saw the Iwanin among Gatu's men. It would cause more stir among the five great nations if he made himself seen anyway. So it was a good thing. He was just about to address the townspeople when a raven flew landed on his shoulder and cod. Oh, Naruto mumbled as he took out a tiny scroll from the pouch on its feet. We got the mission, heading to wave now. Naruto smiled to himself as he burned the scroll. The crow flew away cawing, startled. He started back to the center of the town. He had orders to give. One day later, Iwagakur borders. The guards assigned on morning patrol were on their feet as they saw a lone figure approaching the gates. As the person neared, the guards took a offensive stances as they recognized the person as a missing nin. They were seconds from springing into action when a senior junin stopped them. The so-called missing nin fell on one knee as he made it to the gates, gasping. Son of Yandaimi, Horaishin, Uzumaki clan, dozen warships, need to pull out. The man said before collapsing. The guards only then noticed the newcomer's wounds and bloodied clothing. Sir, one of the Chunin guards asked. What do we do? He's clearly delusional. No, he's not, replied the Junin. Suchikage-sama sent them to wave on a mission. Bring him to the hospital. I'll report this to him. Kanahagakur. Hokage's office. Urgent news, Hokage-sama. A Hayuga Junin entered the room, interrupting the Hokage and Kakashi's conversation. Hiruzen nodded to the man as he approached the desk. Our scouts have detected a medium-scale battle at Wave. There are residues of earth jutsu and numerous fuinjutsu. Seals, you say, the Hokage murmured, deep in thought. Sir, you may want to see this. We've scoured the place and found this. The Junin said and laid down a small bundle at the desk, causing the Sandame and Kakashi to gasp in shock. That's, oh shit, I can't believe I actually forgot to retrieve it. Naruto cursed himself, I've been overconfident. Right you are, mistakes like this could be vital and could lead you to situations you won't like. Said Kurama. Right, I'll make sure it won't happen again. It's a good thing I had the foresight to apply seals on the townspeople's minds. Even the greatest Yamanaka won't be able to break through the mind barriers. Kanahagakur. Hokage's office. Kakashi could not believe his eyes. Lying innocently on the Sandame's desk was a tri-prong kunai, a famed weapon of his late sensei. The Junin and the Hokage have been staring for quite some time now and had to be interrupted by the messenger. Sir. The Sandame shook his head and sighed. Thank you for this. Dismissed. As the Junin exited the room, the Hokage faced Kakashi. I'm sending you and four other Anbu squads to wave. Investigate. Ask the people there if necessary, but do not force them to answer if they do not wish to. Excuse me sir, but I just remembered, Kurinai and her Genin team are headed to wave. If wave's been attacked, there's a chance that the attackers are still nearby, waiting for their targets. We still have no idea if Wave was the prime target or had the unfortunate luck of becoming a war zone of two opposing factions. Shall we pull them back? If so, what of the client? Kakashi, I have the feeling that Tazuna san wasn't being truthful enough. I just realized he's probably held back some information. I passed him off simply as a drunk, nothing more. 
But now, I have a bad feeling about him. Hum, I think this is a great opportunity for Team 7, 9, and 10 to conduct a joint mission. Prevent Team 8 from reaching Wave and bring back Tazuna for interrogating. The Junin stared at him. Air, I meant questioning. Try to be gentle, he's only a civilian after all. The Sandane paused. On second thought, use force if he does not comply. He would have caused us the lives of our shinobi if my hunch is proven correct after all. Asuma can take charge of your genins on the way back. You lead the Anbu squads to wave after this. Understood, Hokage-sama. I shall inform Asuma and Gai so they could be briefed about the situation. Kakashi nodded and left the room. Iwagakur. Hospital. How is he? Onoki inquired the doctor. The patient is stable now. His wounds have been taken care of and should have no problems healing. However, he is still suffering from stamina and chakra exhaustion. Also, he's in shock. Whatever he saw must have scared him out of his wits. I see. The doctor nodded and excused herself. Sir, what are we going to do now? The Junin that reported him of the situation asked. You say he said something about the son of Yondaimi and Horishin. The Suchikage clarified. Indeed, Suchikage-sama. There's also. Onoki cut him off. We'll worry about the Uzumaki and their fleet of ships later. We can gather intel about them from others. The old man floated back and forth the room, as if he was pacing the floor. Thinking of an immediate response. Comparing himself with his ally, Onoki realized that he wasn't like the rakage who was reckless. He had to make a sensible decision. And so he did. We're going to have to call off our forces. Contact the batch that was supposed to act as robes that was sent off this morning. After that meet me at my office. I have a mission for you. Somewhere in the forests of Fire Country. Kurinai was walking behind the client while her genins took a triangular formation in front. She was silently assessing them when something off caught her eye as they passed by. She was sure that it had not rained for the last couple of days but there it was, a puddle of water. Pathetic. To use this kind of genjutsu against my team, and worse, to use it on a sunny weather. Kurinai thought to herself. Time to test these three. She observed Natsuki and Hinata, who have noticed that something was amiss. She had to suppress a sigh as she saw that her third student was as just clueless as ever. Kurinai simply used a substitution technique as the idiots who hid by the puddle launched their, surprise, attack. She decided to rest back and watch how would her students take care of the situation. Surprisingly, Sakura moved to protect their client despite her initial fear and shock at seeing her sensei, die. Natsuki and Hinata on the other hand easily took down their respective opponents. Kurinai came out of her hiding spot and congratulated her students and moved to tie up their downed attackers. Just then, the area was flooded by mist until it became so thick she could not see clearly nor hear properly. She only felt two loud thumps on the ground and heard a cry of outrage from Natsuki. And then there was silence. About a minute later the mist began to dissipate and Kurinai was able to make out two forms on the ground. As the mist completely dissolved, a chill ran up to her spine. There was Sakura's upper body lying a few feet from her lower part. Their client Tazuna had a sanban sticking out from his neck and was unconscious. Natsuki and Hinata were nowhere to be found. For what felt like hours, Kurinai was standing there in disbelief until she felt signatures coming from the same direction they came from. She immediately recognized the silver-haired person who was leading a rather big group. Fire. Wave border. Naruto waited as he saw four distinct life forces. Over time, his ability to detect living beings increased range. He immediately began forming hand seals as soon as Zabuza and his companion came into view. Activating the immobilizing and chakra-eating seals he said earlier, the two missing nin had no choice but to remain still as their bodies failed to respond. During his battle against Gatu's army, Naruto was able to finally awaken the fourth level of his Kuregan. However, as he was still getting his grips on it, the revived dead had a limit of only 30 minutes. Naruto had to time the Demon Brothers' confrontation with Kurinai's team well. As soon as Team 8 caught sight of the two Chunin's genjutsu, Naruto went on with the ritual of resurrecting Zabuza and Haku. Haku was given the order of hitting Tazuna with a paralyzing Sanban and retrieving Natsuki, all while making it look like he was only after the bridge builder and not the girl. 
Zabuza on the other hand was given the task of kidnapping Hinata and killing one of the two remaining Team 8 members, also under the guise of being after Tazuna, who only saw the Hyuga heiress at that time. Naruto wasted no time collecting Natsuki and Hinata from the two missing nins. Handing the girls to his clones, Naruto took out two identical seals and slapped each on Zabuza and Haku's foreheads. After that, he summoned Kagutsuchi and willed the weapon to her scythe form and hacked off the immobilized nuke nins. He then picked up the former Kiri swordsman's great cleaver and sealed it into a scroll. Unleashing his third chakra, he willed for the area to become surrounded by darkness. Naruto then used this to shadow travel to Uzushiogaku ruins. A few minutes later, Kakashi, eight dogs, and four Anbu squads dropped down to inspect the earlier darkened area. The Anbu formed a perimeter while the Ninkan sniffed around. Kakashi was quick to notice of the dog's discomfort. Pakum, what seems to be the problem? Darkness, Kakashi, it reeks of darkness, it's unsettling, the dog replied. Darkness, Kakashi wondered to himself, I'll think about this later. Any trails of whoever killed these two? He asked. They're everywhere, Kakashi, confused, he asked. What do you mean? The trail is scattered everywhere. Pakun repeated, how is that possible, how many were here anyway? We cannot determine, there could have been only one or a hundred. Whatever jutsu they used to escape has fooled even our noses. Try sniffing out other scents, maybe they're hidden behind the darkness. Kakashi patiently waited as the Ninkan concentrated on their task. A little while later they began wagging their tails excitedly. What did you find? There are too many scents, but there's three of them I recognized. Whose is it? The Junin demanded. The missing son of the Yandaimi, Naruto's. Na Naruto. Yes. The other two are Kurinai's missing genins. Damn it. Kakashi looked around in annoyance, feeling helpless once again as he got something about Naruto but his hope was crushed as he had no trails. He then addressed the Anbu. You done sealing the bodies? Yes, sir. But we cannot locate Momochi's sword. One of the Anbu informed him. Never mind that. Whoever killed him must have taken it. We need to move. Wave. The small town was being swarmed by shinobi. However, the residents didn't appear to be concerned at the least. The shinobi looked around and would ask the locals. They all got the same simple answer. That they were once oppressed by a criminal organization and has been freed by some shinobi. When asked about these mysterious shinobi, they would not tell. Reconstruction of the town went on. When more shinobi came, this time from Konoha, they were given the same answers. Eventually the shinobi from various villages went their own ways. Iwagakur. Heya, old man, your lightning pal and his entourage has been spotted approaching the gate. Onoki was interrupted from his plotting by his granddaughter. My lightning pal, who the hell are you talking about? Kuritsuchi rolled her eyes. Why, the rakage, of course. What, how come I wasn't warned of his arrival? The girl chuckled. You're really old, you should give me the hat already. I gave you a scroll the other day, have you forgotten that already? Onoki blinked, he did remember about a scroll. He also remembered not opening it. He thought it was just another prank item from his granddaughter. Kuritsuchi smirked, seeing her grandfather's expression. Ha, huh, you didn't read it, did you? The Suchikage was cursing as he floated out of the tower and made a beeline to the gates. The rakage greeted him with a laugh. Ah, judging by your sour look, you must have forgotten about my arrival. You're really old. Onoki's eyes twitched. Yes, yes, I must have forgotten about it. Let's talk about it in my office. No need for that, I came here to let you know that we're looking for the Nibi. My men will be around your country scouring for it. So that's that, we're going. The Suchikage raised his eyebrow. Let me know. Bah, the audacity. He didn't even ask for my permission. Hold it, I, I haven't even given you my permission. Do I really need that? We're allies anyway, I just came personally to let you know so you wouldn't think I'm invading you. Ha ha ha. What gave you the idea that the Nibi is here anyway? Nothing. Like I've said, we're just looking. After Stone Country, I'll try looking at Water Country. I cannot permit this, Onoki replied roughly. My village is currently neck to neck against Konoha. I'm faced with problems. Why don't you bother Kurigakur instead? And besides, I have my own Jinchuriki, they would have informed me if one stumbled upon this country anyway. 
I, uncharacteristic of him, remained calm. He narrowed his eyes for a moment before giving a stiff reply. Very well. Kumo will not bother you. The Suchikage nodded once and floated back to his tower, not even waiting for his guests to leave first. The Rakage grunted and ordered his men to move out. When they were out of Iwa Nin's earshot, one of them, Darui, asked. Sir, what now? I growled. That old fart is hiding something. For now, we head back to the village. We're not even going to Kiri. We'll wait. Wait for what? The Rakage didn't answer. Kanahagakur. Interrogation room. Tazuna was sitting on a cold steel chair. He wasn't chained, though. He would have tried to guilt trip the leaf nin earlier but stopped when he remembered the girl who died trying to protect him. It was only at that moment he realized he made a big mistake. And so he was cooperative when he was brought back to the village to be interrogated. As soon as he saw the Hokage's cold look, Tazuna wilted. Inoichi and Ibiki didn't have to utter threats to make him spill out everything. However, Inoichi had to delve into his mind as he had trouble explaining what happened earlier. Inoichi easily found the memory he was looking for. He watched silently as Hinata and Natsuki fought off the demon brothers, as Inoichi quickly recognized, while Sakura moved to bodily protect their client. Unlike Kurenai, he immediately noticed that the mist had already appeared as soon as the genins delivered their final blows on the new cannon. The mist converged and thickened first around Kurenai, leaving the genins and Tazuna together. With Kurenai unable to see or hear clearly, one of the ambushers leapt out of hiding and landed in front Sakura. Inoichi easily recognized the man. His weapon was a huge giveaway. Frowning, the Yamanaka watched as the new cannon wasted no time cutting the poor genin down. Natsuki was the one who shouted in shock while Hinata could only gasp in horror. Zabuza turned around to see the remaining escorts of his target. Ah, oh, what do we have here? A Hyuga, today's a lucky day for me. Look at you, clean forehead, definitely the heiress. The rakage would pay me a huge sum when I sell you to him. Zabuza then turned at the bushes. Haku, we're taking the Hyuga as well. Upon cue, two Sanbans came flying at speeds. One hit Hinata on the neck, while the other hit the bridge builder. Zabuza caught the girl as she fell down unconscious and leapt away. Another figure came from the bushes and went to retrieve the paralyzed but still conscious Tazuna. Natsuki awakened from her shock and created a lightning clone. The clone went to substitute itself with Tazuna while she went for her captured teammate. Her efforts, sadly, were in vain as Zabuza's companion easily knocked her out. Hmm, this girl is good. Drop the old drunk. We're taking this girl instead. But Zabuza Sama, the companion replied, hearing the voice Inoichi recognized him as a young boy. What about Tazuna? Our mission is to kill the old man, yes. We leave him here, he will die anyway. The leaf will come after him for causing the other girl to die. Inoichi closed his eyes as he left the old man's mind. At that moment a Yamanaka from a different division entered the room. Excuse me, Hokage Sama, but I bring immediate news. We were successful breaking into the corpse's minds but we were unable to find anything. Their minds have been wiped clean. Upon further inspection, we found no genjutsus nor ninjutsu used against them, giving us the conclusion that fuinjutsu have been used. Hiruzen narrowed his eyes. Fuinjutsu. Jirai is the only person I know who could use a seal that wipes away people's memories, but only pieces. He cannot entirely wipe it out entirely. This brings me back to the reports with regards to the battle. Multiple residues of Fuinjutsu were found. Could these have been caused by Uzumakis? If there has been a medium-scale battle, there must have been more than 30 of them fighting. If so, then there are many of them who survived. But why hide even from Konoha? Uzushiogakur ruins, Uzukage Tower. Natsuki groaned as she regained consciousness. Looking around, she immediately recognized where she was. Beside her was her teammate, Hanada, who looked like she was about to wake. Quickly, she moved her hands into seals and gently tapped the girl's forehead, using a sleeping jutsu to keep her there. She stood up as she heard footsteps. Natsuki kneeled as the door slid open, revealing Naruto. You did well. Here are the documents for your next task. Natsuki. The girl groaned as she felt herself being shook awake. Natsuki. She heard someone hiss in a frantic tone. Damn it, wake up. 
She frowned and finally rose into a sitting position and looked around, still dizzy, and spotted her teammate. Hanada, what? No time. They went downstairs to talk. We need to get out of here. Looking as she remembered their current situation, she stood up. Wait, perhaps we could investigate around for a bit. These walls aren't sealed, right? I mean, can you see through with your Byakugan? Hanada hesitated for a moment before she nodded and used her visual prowess. It would seem we're in a tower, and we're at the fifth floor. There's four people at what looks like the basement but they they're distorted. I can't see through properly. Only four, asked Natsuki. Hanada frowned and looked around. Only four, she confirmed. What about their chakra signatures? How strong are they? Almost nothing. I don't think they're shinobi. They must be samurai. Or whatever makes your vision distorted hides their chakra. Hanada bit her. It's possible. Come on, then. Let's check out some rooms. We might find something about them before we make our escape to the village. Natsuki did not wait and stepped out. She checked the three other rooms in the floor before descending. Hanada meanwhile kept her Byakugan activated while checking out for traps before Natsuki would enter a room. As they made it to the third floor, Natsuki sighed in relief. Finally, there's something. It looks like an office, said Hanada as she gave the clear and stepped through the single room on that floor. That's, Natsuki gasped as she got a complete view of the room. It greatly resembled the Hokage's office. The only difference were the broken glass windows, a battered desk, a chair, and a tattered flag above it. Embroidered on it was a red swirl inside a circle. Kami-sama, Hanada gasped as she got a clear view outside. Earlier she thought that they were on a tower of an abandoned mine. Now that she had her Byakugan deactivated, she was able to see the colors of her surroundings and realized they were at a ruin of a small village. We're in Uzushiogakur, Natsuki exclaimed before Hanada could. Hanada could only nod, they were taught history and knew about the extinct clans and destroyed villages. She had seen illustrations of the beautiful village hidden by whirling tides. She felt miserable seeing it in ruins with her own eyes. As she bowed her head to give a short prayer for the dead villagers, she saw a folder that she failed to notice earlier. Before she could pick it up, Natsuki beat her to it. It has the Hokage's seal on it, murmured her teammate. Oh, let me see. Hanada said as she inspected the folder. Hey, it's unsealed. What the? SSS class secret. How did this end up here then? Must be a copy. Look at the dates. Natsuki pointed out. You check that folder's contents. I'll see if there are other things worth of importance in this room. Natsuki made to inspect around while keeping a discreet eye on Hanada. It didn't take long before she had to hide the smirk that formed on her s as she watched the Hayuga's look of curiosity change into horror. Hanada was about to voice her reactions when a voice not from her teammates interrupted her. You're not supposed to be here. The speaker was still behind the doorframe, its shadows hiding his face. Hanada glanced at her teammate who also looked startled. Natsuki jumped back to Hanada's side and the both of them went into defensive stances. Peace. If I wanted to kill you I would have done so already. You should be thankful instead since I saved you from those rogue Kiri Nin. The person entered the room and Hanada was quick to notice that he was wearing an old-fashioned armor, the same kind Shinobi wore before the Second Ninja War. She didn't have to wonder who the person was as he was obviously an Uzushio Nin. Hanada kept her stance as she held up the folder towards the Uzushio Nin and demanded. How did you get this? Are the contents even real? Who? Naruto. Natsuki glanced at her teammate questioningly and then at the boy. You look like the Yandaimi Sama. You're his son. Oh. Naruto raised an eyebrow. You know about my parentage. He stated. Of course. Everyone knows. It was Hanada who answered. The village has been looking for you. Where have you been all these years? HN. They were only looking for the son of the Yandaimi Hokage, not Uzumaki Naruto who the villagers treated with scorn and hate. If they knew I was the Kayubi, they will never see me as the Yandaimi's son. But you're not the Kayubi, you're just the container, Natsuki said, confusing Hinata. Judging by your expressions, your teammate knows about my Jinchuriki status. Have her explain it to you, Hinata, Naruto said as he made to leave the room. Naruto, wait, Hinata ran and grabbed his arm. Don't leave, please, come back to the village with us. Why should I? 
They were partly responsible for the annihilation of my clan. Naruto pointed at the folder the girl was still clutching. Hanada let go of Naruto as she stared at the folder. Lunch will be served at the main hall in one hour, and then you can return to your village. He added before leaving the office. One week later, Kanahagakur, Hokage's office. Inside the room were the Hokage, Jiraiya, and Shikaku Nara. The office was sealed shut as they were talking about important matters. According to our investigations in Wave, Gato's mercenary army primarily consisted of rogue nin from Iowa. However, from a shinobi's point of view, it would seem suspicious, as we have definitely found. Said Jiraiya. It couldn't have been a coincidence that Gato knowingly or unknowingly employed a lot of rogue nin from Iowa. Added Shikaku. If he were to hire nuke nin, there should have been a lot more coming from Karigakur, as it was nearer. From that we could deduct that they were deployed to wave under the guise of being missing nins. To cement our proof, here is the last month's edition of Iwagakur's bingo book. Starting from the last eight months, four different persons were added weekly, by looking at the dates they supposedly defected. Jiraiya said as he pulled out a book and opened at a marked page. Shikaku spoke again. The Tsuchikage made an oversight with his deployment plan. Looking at their bingo book, a squad is sent out weekly. However, the details from the supposed nuke nins were limited and they have no bounties on them. Hiruzen finally spoke. Given our current situation with Iowa, they were there for only one purpose. An invasion, Shikaku said. The Hokage nodded. Yes, they were sneaking troops that are near our borders. The Tsuchikage would have just given the order and we would be taken by surprise despite our increase in patrols. Whoever freed Gato unknowingly saved us from an invasion. We wouldn't have known about their plan in the first place if this wave issue did not come up. I sent out a special team that same day to have the corpses inspected. Compared to how big Gato's army were according to the wave citizens, the numbers that the special team counted were far too small. With the help of the Abarame's Kikaichu, the majority of the missing corpses left out a trail all leading to the direction of Iwagakur. I'll ask my spies about funeral ceremonies there. While we are sure of Iwa's foiled invasion, it wouldn't hurt to have more information for documentation later. Said Jiraiya. Now, regarding that invasion issue, the Tsuchikage has pulled back his troops that managed to get near fire country. It is safe to say that Onoki has backed down. Iwagakur believes that Konoha is hiding Minato's son and was sent to kill Iwa Nin using the Horishin. The Hokage and Shikaku perked up at this. Then perhaps, we should take credit for that. The Nara asked uncertainly. The Hokage looked contemplative. It's not a bad idea. Jiraiya nodded. Let's think about this some more before hastily deciding. Shikaku suggested. Plan out how we're going to take credit. Uzushiogakur. One week ago. Naruto and the two Kunoichi from Konoha were just finishing their lunch. Kasumi and other ghosts were also present, but of course only Naruto could see them. Naruto, Hanada faltered for a moment as she put down her eating utensils. Naruto and Natsuki looked at her in question. I don't want to go back to Konoha. Let me join you. Her teammate did not react and waited for Naruto too. Why? He only asked. Natsuki told me about Jinchuriki, the Kayubi and what happened nearly 12 years ago. I've also read that folder's contents, Hanada faltered again. She took a breath before continuing. When we were still at the academy, I, I used to tell you. Oh, amused, he asked. Naruto of course knew about this. Hanada's cheeks went red and as she stared at her plate. Yes, I used to wonder why the villagers looked at you hatefully, sometimes fearfully. Now I know. That still doesn't answer my question you know. I. Let me ask you another question, do you wish to help me? Hanada looked up and was silent for a moment. She then looked Naruto in the eye before nodding. Yes. Then it would be best if you went back to Konoha, don't you think? That way, you can help by sending me important information from time to time. Naruto straightened himself up, and besides, it would raise questions if your teammate returned alone, or not. Naruto casually took out a kanai. Hanada's eyes widened while Natsuki raised her hands in surrender. Whoa, whoa, hold up. There's no need for that. I will not tell about you, Uzushio, or that file. I owe you for saving us from those rogue Kiri Nin. I'm repaying that by not selling you out. She looked at her teammate and added. 
nor will I tell them about Hinata's desire to stay here. Is that so? asked Naruto. Very well then, he said as he put away the weapon. Still, certain seals should be placed on you to keep some secrets. He added, you will tell them who saved you, but only that. Natsuki bobbed her head fast, still looking frightened. Hanada understood. After all, Naruto did save them from those rogue nin. If he was able to take them out, then she and her teammate did not stand a chance against him. I suppose you could stay here for a week, but after that you will have to return. Thank you, Hanada and Natsuki replied. Present time. Hanada and Natsuki safely reached Konoha's outer boundaries. They're probably at the gates by now given their walking pace. Sai appeared in front of his leader in a kneel. Good, Naruto said, inform the shadows at Kiri. It is time. Understood. How should we proceed? In three months, you will be wearing Konoha Anbu uniform. Your objective is to capture Mei Turumi and everyone on Karigakar's council. They will be holding a meeting regarding the upcoming Chunin exams. The remainder of the village shall remain ignorant of what's going to happen. There shall be no deaths. Just knock out those who will be guarding their conference room. Once done, I shall take care of everything. The guards will forget they were knocked out, but those inside will be placed under controlling seals. They will be doing things outside of their own volition, unable to control their actions, but remembering everything. They will hate Konoha, thinking they are being forced to appoint people from the leaf to replace them from their positions. Eventually they will be able to break out from the seals, inform their villagers discreetly, swear vengeance, and flee. The land of water shall be fully ours. This is very crucial to Uzushiogaku's rebirth. I want no mistakes. Plan accordingly. It shall be done, Naruto-sama. Jiraiya wasted no time running off to the hot springs while Shikaku lazily walked out of the office. The Hokage, having just taken down the extra privacy seals, was about to smoke some extra while there were no new papers to look at. He was just about to light his pipe when a messenger burst in. Hokage-sama, Hiruzen winced at the man's tone, no doubt bringing bad news. He pinched the bridge of his nose before exhaling. Yes, what is it? There are two people claiming to be Hayuga Hanada and Fujino Natsuki. They are at the interrogation cells. Interrogation cells, the Hokage exploded. Who the hell decided to chuck them there? Hiruzen was already outside the building as he finished screaming. The messenger was rooted to the spot, too shocked by the old man's outburst. Civilians and shinobi alike gave way as an irate Hokage stomped his way angrily towards the T&I building, all while muttering, if they find out, this will cause a great political scandal. The fools, who on earth thought it would be a great idea to place the heiress there? Even if she was an imposter. Scene break, Uzushiogaku ruins. As soon as the Hokage's meeting with Jiraiya and Shikaku ended, the ghost that was spying immediately headed to report to Naruto, who was training Karen at the moment. What are you going to do about it, then? Karen asked after Naruto told her of the news. Hey, shrugged Naruto. They can take credit all they like. I'll just tell the citizens of Wave not to deny or agree with Konoha's claims. But won't it make the leaf look too strong? Exactly. Naruto replied, grinning. I don't understand. Their rival villages, especially Iwa and Kumo, will try to match the strength they are trying to display. Once they acquire the power to attack Konoha, it will be an overkill. Karen nodded in understanding and decided to resume her training. After some concentration, several chakra chains burst from her body and speared several rocks. Meanwhile, Naruto looked contemplative. He wanted to participate in the coming Chunin exams to tempt Iwa into joining the event, despite its recent losses. His only problem was the lack of a third member, and an acting sensei. Yugito was not an option, as she was the key to creating a rift between Kumo and Iwa. Secondly, it would only cause the wreckage and all of Kumo's resources to go after them. He could not pull someone from his shadows in Kiri and Konoha either, as it would be simply too foolish. Suddenly, numerous dark chains erupted from his body, impaling a huge rock nearby Karen's practice targets, startling the girl. Karen looked at him in awe as the huge rock broke down into smaller pieces. The chains then caught the debris and crushed it into powder. Now that you got the speed down, began Naruto as he pointed at the girl's rocks which had numerous holes. I want you to work on its strength. 
After a month I'm going to make you spar against Yugido in her tailed beast form. Yugido, who was also training not too far away, of course heard him with her enhanced senses. She appeared beside Karen in a burst of blue flames. You called for me. Naruto smirked. I told Karen to work on her chain's strength. You will be fighting against her in your tailed beast form a month after. But, but, stammered the younger girl. Naruto interrupted. Karen, you will be in charge of capturing Shukaku. If you can at least hold your ground against Matabi, then you will have no problems with the Tanuki. The container's off his rocker by the way, so you should be prepared. Do you really think I could do it? Mumbled Karen, her head bowed. The boy lifted the girl's chin gently so he could look into her eyes. You're an Uzumaki, aren't you? You can do it. Naruto gave her a kind smile, something he rarely gave these days. Why yes, yes, of course. Face flushed, Karen stuttered out. Naruto ignored the heated look Yugito sent towards Karen. Good, I'm heading out. Where are you going? Looking for more Uzumakis. Karen and I can't just join the Chunin exams without a third and fourth member. Why don't you just include me on your team? Huffed the Nibi Jinchuriki. Naruto sighed. Yugito, I already discussed this with you. You have a different task to do in Earth Country. Yugito pouted before averting her gaze and chose to glare at Karen instead. Naruto rolled his eyes before walking towards a shadow and reappeared somewhere else. I just know an incoming fight when I sense one. The Kayubi informed Naruto as he extended his senses and tried to feel for an Uzumaki chakra. Yugito's so protective of you like a mama cat. Karen's just too shy to admit her obvious feelings but is fierce. Once she gets around, they will be amusing to watch. Kurama, I'm too young to be worrying about girls anyway. Naruto replied before shadow traveling and appearing nearby a cliff. The beast scoffed. You're literally resurrecting the Uzumaki clan, but eventually, you two will have to start your own family. Naruto sighed in exasperation before once again extending his senses. Oh, that was fast. What? Confused, the fox asked. I found one, a female. Her life force is rather small but fluctuating. Either she's old or she's got a unique ability. Naruto replied aloud as he surveyed the mountain opposite the cliff he was standing on. At the bottom was a small town. There were about 40 buildings. Naruto. Kurama shouted urgently, there's someone else not too far who contains my chakra. I want it back. Oh, interesting. How is that even possible? Look up there. I can sense it. Kill its container. I want it back. The Kayubi raged. Naruto's gaze returned to the mountain and higher, until he saw a building and realized it was a temple. The last time the great fox that was sealed inside him became enraged was almost seven years ago, back when the Lollies tried to kill Naruto. The boy sighed as he began his hike. The other Uzumaki would have to wait. He would deal with this Kayubi Jinchuriki pretender first. Scene break. Back at Konoha, the Hokage ordered the immediate release of one Hayuga Hanada once he arrived at the building. He saw the truth of the girl's claims by simply asking her to activate her by Akugan. Natsuki, on the other hand, was given to Inoichi to get her mind scanned. How did it go? The Hokage asked as the Yamanaka opened his eyes and released his hold on the girl. She's who she says she is. During the ambush, I found out that Natsuki here substituted herself. She wasn't the original target but the bridge builder. Perhaps I could blackmail Tazuna and make him agree to tell everyone in wave that it was Konoha who saved them. Thought Hiruzen. What else? Their attackers were indeed Zabuza Momochi and an unknown accomplice. After that she woke up and found herself in a cabin. The Hyuga heiress was with her, and they were not bound. Upon exiting the cabin, they found themselves to be on a warship. A warship, indeed, Hokage-sama. The warship looked old, like the ones used before the Second Shinobi War. It was manned by only a few people. A person who calls himself Naruto Uzumaki informed the girls that it was him who saved them from the nuke nin. The Hokage took a sharp intake of breath. Was it really him? He had yellow-orange hair that reached his shoulders. Had blue eyes and whisker marks. His other facial features were a combination of Yandaimi-sama and Kashina Uzumaki. About his hair getting a darker shade to orange, I suppose it could be his Uzumaki genes becoming more active as he ages. I do believe it really was him, Naruto Uzumaki, or Naruto Namikaze. 
Serutobi was silent as he mulled things to himself. After a while, he asked another question. The ship, the boy couldn't have manned it by himself alone. He's got to have companions. Did you recognize them? Ah, that, from what I could count from the girl's memories, there were four other people. They all wore old-fashioned battle armors. Hanada was always with her and they did not explore the ship, so there could have been more. Another thing worth mentioning is that they all had red hair. I have an idea who they could be but I'm not so sure, I mean, they're dead. It's them. There were survivors. And they found Naruto, the Hokage said more to himself. My assumptions could be wrong. Who do you think these people were? I'm going to have to talk to Jiraiya and Shikaku again regarding this. Here is inside before answering. The Uzumaki. Scene break. Naruto waited until nightfall before he made his move. He spent his afternoon observing the boy, Sora, who always had his arms covered. But Kurama sensed its chakra was sealed in the boy's right arm. Naruto found it odd that as was sealed there when commonly it was contained in a person's stomach. He decided to give the boy a chance. If he cooperated and allowed Naruto to extract the Kyubi chakra from his arm, then he would be spared. While he was a fake Jinchuriki as he only contained a portion of the fox's chakra, Naruto still felt pity on him, if only a bit. He saw how the monks would glare and keep their distance from him. It was like him back in Konoha. Funnily enough, Naruto later found that he was at the fire temple. Naruto slowly crept near as the moon gave light to the night. It was a good thing that Sora trained by himself. It was time, he would give the boy only one chance. He had no connection with him after all. Naruto only held the Uzumaki deer, as well as the people who were kind to him when he was younger. He was about to make his presence known to the boy when a monk, probably the head, Naruto surmised, appeared in front of him. It's about time you showed yourself. The monk began, I've been waiting for you. It was your dark aura that allowed me to sense you, but for some reason I could not pinpoint your exact whereabouts. Those who are able to hide like that are no doubt powerful. Step aside, monk, I have no business with you. Growled Naruto. He was frustrated for having been detected. I am Shiraku, head of the fire temple. Yeah, I know, you have something of mine. I came here to take it back. Step aside, now, I still have business to do after. Naruto ordered, he was getting riled up. Shiraku glanced at Sora, who still haven't noticed them, before taking a fighting stance. I'm afraid I cannot allow you. Tis, if you really have a death wish then I shall grant it. Naruto stepped back into the shadows and vanished. The moonlight became dim, the shadows all over the area elongated. Darkness slowly took over, a hundred shadow tendrils from multiple directions shot towards the monk, who looked unfazed. Chiriku radiated golden light, an avatar with many hands appeared and easily batted Naruto's attacks off. It was very foolish of you to come here. We monks are blessed with the light. You, of the dark, shall be conquered. Naruto ignored the taunt and remained in the shadows. The commotion did not escape Sora and was now aware of Chiriku's presence and the unknown enemy. Naruto, you're no match against him at the moment. You were able to defeat Junin level shinobi back then because you had the element of surprise. In this case, you do not have it. You cannot go into tailed beast mode either, for I fear some unexpected effects, what with another container of the same demonic chakra present. Just grab the boy and get out of here. The Kyubi advised. Damn it. Naruto cursed before this time, sending out several chakra chains from his body. His move momentarily shocked the monk, clearly recognizing it as one of the Uzumaki bloodlines. Chiraku's surprise gave Naruto the opportunity to shadow travel and reappear behind Sora, who he promptly grabbed. They reappeared in a cave not too far from the mountain. Naruto dropped the struggling boy, hard. What the hell is going on? Who the hell are you? Where did you bring me? Demanded Sora. You know, Naruto, had your mother didn't become the Shinigami's next host and I wasn't close to her, you would have grown up to be like him. A loud and an idiot. You'd probably be screaming you'll become Hokage or something. Kurama commented as Naruto restrained the fake Jinchuriki. Then it's a great thing that was the case. I could not imagine myself becoming a leader of a village who hates my very existence. All right, you shut up and listen. I have a very nice proposition for you. Sora glared at him but went silent. Good, 
you're listening. I'm not sure if you know, but you have a demon essence sealed in your right arm. Naruto pointed at said arm. You give me permission to extract it from you and I will return you to the temple shortly after. The other monks hate you, don't they? Once I remove that you will be welcomed by all. How's that sound? The monk in training immediately shouted his answer. No, how do I know I could trust you anyway? You fought with Chiraku-sama and abducted me. Naruto snorted. News flash, Sora. Yes, Sora, was it? Anyway, you really have no choice here. I could and I would extract it from you. I was just giving you the formality because I felt some pity for you. He actually planned to spare the boy, but his encounter with the head monk made him angry. Naruto did not wait for Sora's response and summoned his bound weapon, Kagutsuchi, who took the form of a dagger. Naruto aimed for the boy's heart and drove his weapon there. He formed some hand seals and slightly opened the seal on his stomach, and began absorbing the malevolent chakra on Sora's arm. Naruto watched distastefully as Sora's lifeless body fell. He picked it up and Shadow traveled back to the mountain and reappeared at the temple's entrance. He threw the body against the iron gates, giving enough commotion to alert the monks inside. He gave the corpse a blank look. I did say I'm returning you to the temple. But I never said you were coming back alive. With that parting note, he melded with the shadows and reappeared in the small town below. I'll leave these monks in peace as long as they do not pursue me and keep today's events to themselves. The case with Sora was unexpected. He had no intentions of killing the monks. Their deaths will only draw attention towards him, and he could not afford that. Not when his plans were only starting to unfurl. Scene break. I apologize for your sudden deaths. Oh, who am I kidding? I'm not sorry at all. Fuka stared at her companion's corpses, and then at their killer. One moment they were peacefully having their dinner and the next thing she knew, Farido, Fuin, and Fudo were lying in their own pools of blood. She glared hatefully at the man, no, boy, in front of him and took up his looks. He had dark orange hair that touched his shoulders, wore an old-fashioned gray armor, and carried a bloody scythe. The most prominent feature were the whisker-like marks on his cheeks. She took a deep breath and forced her into a sweet smile. They are quite strong, you know. For you to dispose of them easily you must be very powerful. How about I reward you with a... If you were younger, I might have considered your offer. Replied the boy. Fuka smirked. Oh, so, do you like girls your age? You can have me you know, I have already developed assets. I commend you for even trying but your attempts at seduction will never work on me. You're old enough to be my grandmother. Fuka's flirtatious smile vanished then and was replaced with a blank look. I know who you really are. I also know the true reason why you joined these now dead people. Then why did you kill them? How am I supposed to carry out my vengeance towards Konoha now? She screamed. The boy remained calm before giving her a smile that didn't reach his eyes. My name is Naruto. I am the heir of the Uzumaki clan. I, too, desire the destruction of Konoha and avenging the clan. My plans however, are grander compared to yours, as it includes not just Konoha, but the four other greater hidden villages as well. I want you, Fuka Uzumaki, to become a part of that plan. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.